the prologue of The Freelands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Simon Evers. The Freelands by John Galsworthy. Prologue. One early April afternoon, in a Worcestershire field, the only field in that immediate landscape which was not down in grass, a man moved slowly athwart the furrows, sewing. A big man of heavy build, swinging his hairy brown arm with the grace of strength. He wore no coat or hat. A waistcoat, open over a blue-checked cotton shirt, flapped against belted corduroys that were somewhat the colour of his square, pale brown face and dusty hair. His eyes were sad, with the swimming yet fixed stare of epileptics, his mouth heavy-lipped, so that but for the yearning eyes the face would have been almost brutal. He looked as if he suffered from silence. The elm-trees bordering the field, though only just in leaf, showed dark against a white sky. A light wind blew, carrying already a scent from the earth and growth pushing up, for the year was early. The green Malvern hills rose in the west, and not far away, shrouded by trees, a long country house of weathered brick faced to the south. Save for the man sowing, and some rooks crossing from elm to elm, no life was visible in all the green land. And it was quiet, with a strange, a brooding tranquillity. The fields and hills seemed to mock the scars of road and ditch and furrow scraped on them, to mock at barriers of hedge and wall, between the green land and white sky was a conspiracy to disregard those small activities. So lonely was it, so plunged in a ground base of silence, so much too big and permanent for any figure of man. Across and across the brown loam the labourer doggedly finished out his task, scattered the few last seeds into a corner, and stood still. Thrushes and blackbirds were just beginning that evensong whose blitheness, as nothing else on earth, seems to, to promise youth forever to the land. He picked up his coat, slung it on, and, heaving a straw bag over his shoulder, walked out onto the grass-bordered road between the elms. Trist! Bob Trist! At the gate of a creepered cottage amongst fruit trees high above the road, a youth with black hair and pale brown face stood beside a girl with frizzy brown hair and cheeks like poppies. "'Have you had that notice?' the labourer answered slowly. "'Yes, Mr. Derry. If she don't go, I've got to.' "'What a damn shame!' The labourer moved his head as though he would have spoken, but no words came. "'Don't do anything, Bob. We'll see about that.' "'Evening, Mr. Derry. Evening, Miss Sheeler. And the labourer moved on. The two at the wicket-gate also turned away. A black-haired woman dressed in blue came to the wicket-gate in their place. There seemed to no purpose in her standing there. It was perhaps an evening custom, some ceremony such as Mullins observe at the Muetzin call. And anyone who saw her would have wondered what on earth she might be seeing, gazing out with her dark glowing eyes above the white grass-bordered roads, stretching empty this way and that between the elm-trees and green fields, while the blackbirds and thrushes shouted out their hearts, calling all to witness how hopeful and young was life in this English countryside. End of the Prologue Chapter 1 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 1 May Day afternoon in Oxford Street, and Felix Freeland a little late on his way from Hampstead to his brother John's house in Porchester Gardens. Felix Freeland, author, wearing the very first grey top hat of the season. A compromise that, like many other things in his life and works, between individuality and the accepted view of things, aestheticism and fashion, the true critical sense and authority. After the meeting at John's to discuss the doings of the family of his brother Morton Friedland, better known as Todd, he would perhaps look in on the caricatures at the English gallery and visit one duchess in Mayfair concerning the George Richard Memorial. And so, not the soft felt hat which really suited authorship, nor the black top hat which obliterated personality to the point of pain, but this grey thing with narrowish black band, very suitable in truth to a face of a pale buff colour, 
to a moustache of a deep buff colour streaked with a few grey hairs, to a black braided coat cut away from a buff coloured waistcoat, to his neat boots, not patent leather, faintly buffed with May Day dust. Even his eyes, Freeland grey, were a little buffed over by sedentary habit and the number of things that he was conscious of. For instance, that the people passing him were distressingly plain, both men and women, plain with the particular plainness of those quite unaware of it. It struck him forcibly, while he went along, how very queer it was that with so many plain people in the country the population managed to keep up even as well as it did. To his wonderfully keen sense of defect it seemed little short of marvellous. A shambling, shoddy crew, this crowd of shoppers and labour demonstrators, a conglomeration of hopelessly mediocre of visages. What was to be done about it? Ah, what indeed, since they were evidently not aware of their own dismal mediocrity. Hardly a beautiful or a vivid face, hardly a wicked one, never anything transfigured, passionate, terrible, or grand. Nothing Greek, early Italian, Elizabethan, not even beefy, beery, broad old Georgian. Something clutched in and squashed out about it all. On that collective face, something of the look of a man almost comfortably and warmly wrapped round by a snake at the very beginning of its squeeze. He gave Felix Freeland a sort of faint excitement and pleasure to notice this for it was his business to notice things and embalm them afterwards in ink. And he believed that not many people noticed it, so that it contributed in his mind to his own distinction, which was precious to him. Precious, and encouraged to be so by the press, which, as he well knew, must print his name several thousand times a year. And yet, as a man of culture and of principle, how he despised that kind of fame— and theoretically believed that a man's real distinction lay in his oblivion of the world's opinion, particularly as expressed by that flighty creature, the fourth estate. But here again, as in the matter of the grey top hat, he had instinctively compromised, taking in press cuttings which described himself and his works, when he never failed to describe those descriptions, good, bad, and indifferent, as that stuff, and the writers as those fellows. Not that it was new to him to feel that the country was in a bad way, On the contrary, it was his established belief, and one for which he was prepared to furnish due and proper reasons. In the first place, he traced it to the horrible hold industrialism had in the last hundred years laid on the nation, draining the peasantry from the land, and in the second place to the influence of a narrow and insidious officialism, sapping the independence of the people. This was why, in going to a conclave with his brother John, high in government employ, and his brother Stanley, a captain of industry, possessor of the Morton plough-works, he was conscious of a certain superiority, in that he, at all events, had no hand in this paralysis which was creeping on the country. And getting more buff-coloured every minute, he threaded his way on, till past the marble arch he secured the elbow-room of Hyde Park. Here, groups of young men, with chivalrous idealism, were jeering at and chivying the broken remnants of a suffrage meeting. Felix debated whether he should oppose his body to their bodies, his tongue to theirs, or whether he should avert his consciousness and hurry on. But that instinct which moved him to wear the grey top hat prevailing, he did neither, and stood instead looking at them in silent anger, which quickly provoked endearments, such as, "'Take it off!' or "'Keep it on!' or "'What cheer, Toppy!' but nothing more acute. And he meditated. "'Culture!' Could culture ever make headway among the blind partisanships, the hand-to-mouth mentality, the cheap excitements of this town life? The faces of these youths, the tone of their voices, the very look of their bowler hats, said, No, you could not culturalise the impermeable texture of their vulgarity. And they were the coming manhood of the nation, this inexpressibly distasteful lot of youths. The country had indeed got too far away from the land." and this essential towny commonness was not confined to the classes from which these youths were drawn. He had even remarked it among his own son's school and college friends, an impatience of discipline, an insensibility to everything but excitement and having a good time, a permanent mental indigestion due to a permanent diet of titbits. What aspiration they possessed seemed devoted to securing for themselves the plums of official or industrial life. His boy, Alan, even, was infected, in spite of home influences and the atmosphere of art in which he had been so sedulously soaked. 
He wished to enter his uncle Stanley's plough-works, seeing it as a soft thing. But the last of the woman-baiters had passed by now, and conscious that he was really behind time, Felix hurried on. In his study, a pleasant room, if rather tidy, John Freeland was standing before the fire, smoking a pipe and looking thoughtfully at nothing. He was, in fact, thinking, with that continuity characteristic of a man who, at fifty, had won for himself a place of permanent importance in the Home Office. Starting life in the Royal Engineers, he still preserved something of a military look about his figure and grey visage with steady eyes and drooping moustache, both a shade greyer than those of Felix, and a forehead bald from justness and knowing where to lay his hand on papers. His face was thinner, his head narrower than his brother's, and he had acquired a way of making those he looked at doubt themselves and feel the sudden instability of all their facts. He was, as has been said, thinking. His brother Stanley had wired to him that morning. "'I'm motoring up today on business. Can you get Felix to come at six o'clock and talk over the position at Todd's?' "'What position at Todd's?' He had indeed heard something vague of those youngsters of Todd's, and some fuss they were making about the labourers down there. He had not liked it. Too much of a piece with the general unrest, and these new democratic ideas that were playing old Harry with the country. For, in his opinion, the country was in a bad way, partly owing to industrialism, with its rotting effect upon physique, partly to the modern analytic intellectualism, with its destructive and anarchic influence on morals. It was difficult to overestimate the mischiefs of those two factors, and in the approaching conference with his brothers, one of whom was the head of an industrial undertaking and the other a writer, whose books, extremely modern, he never read, he was perhaps vaguely conscious of his own cleaner hands. Hearing a car come to a halt outside, he went to the window and looked out. Yes, it was Stanley. Stanley Freeland, who had motored up from Beckett, his country place close to his plough-works in Worcestershire, stood a moment on the pavement, stretching his long legs and giving directions to his chauffeur. He had been stopped twice on the road for not exceeding the limit, as he believed, and was still a little ruffled. Was it not his invariable principle to be moderate in speed, as in all other things? And his feeling at the moment was stronger even than usual, that the country was in a bad way, eaten up by officialism, with its absurd limitations of speed and the liberty of the subject, and the advanced ideas of these new writers and intellectuals, always talking about the rights and sufferings of the poor. There was no progress along either of those roads. He had it in his heart, as he stood there on the pavement, to say something pretty definite to John about interference with the liberty of the subject, and he wouldn't mind giving old Felix a rap about his precious destructive doctrines and continual girding at the upper classes, vested interests, and all the rest of it. If he had something to put in their place, that would be another matter. Capital and those who controlled it were the backbone of the country, what there was left of the country, apart from these damned officials and ascetic fellows. And with a contraction of his straight eyebrows above his straight grey eyes, straight blunt nose, blunter moustaches and blunt chin, he kept a tight rein on his blunt tongue, not choosing to give away even to his own anger. Then, perceiving Felix coming, in a white topper by Jove, he crossed the pavement to the door, and tall, square, personable, rang the bell. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 2 Well, what's the matter at Todd's? And Felix moved a little forward in his chair, his eyes fixed with interest on Stanley, who was about to speak. It's that wife of his, of course. It was all very well so long as she confined herself to writing and talk and that land society, or whatever it was she founded the one that snuffed out the other day. But now she's getting herself and those two youngsters mixed up in our local broils, and really I think Todd's got to be spoken to. It's impossible for a husband to interfere with his wife's principles, said Felix. Principles? The word came from John. Certainly. Kirsty is a woman of great character, revolutionary by temperament. Why would you expect her to act as you would act yourselves? When Felix had said that, there was a silence. Then Stanley muttered, "'Poor old Todd!' Felix sighed, lost for a moment in his last vision of his youngest brother. It was four years ago now, a summer evening, Todd standing between his youngsters Derrick and Sheila in a doorway of his white, black-timbered, creepered cottage, 
his sunburnt face and blue eyes the serenest things one could see in a day's march. "'Why, Paul,' he said, "'Todd's much happier than we are. You've only to look at him.' "'Ah!' said Stanley suddenly. "'Do you remember him at Father's funeral, without his hat and his head in the clouds? Fine-looking chap, old Todd. Pity he's such a child of nature.' Felix said quietly, "'If you'd offered him a partnership, Stanley, it would have been the making of him. "'Todd in the plough-works, my hat!' Felix smiled. At sight of that smile, Stanley grew red, and John refilled his pipe. "'It is always the devil to have a brother more sarcastic than oneself.' "'How old are those two? John said abruptly. "'Sheila's twenty, Derrick's nineteen. "'I thought the boy was at an agricultural college. "'Ah, well, finished. "'What's he like?' "'Black-haired, fiery fellow, not a bit like Todd.' "'John muttered. "'That's her Celtic blood. "'Her father, old Colonel Moray, was just that sort. "'By George, he was a regular black Highlander. "'What's the trouble, exactly?' "'It was Stanley who answered. "'That sort of agitation business is all very well "'until it begins to affect your neighbours. "'Then it's time it's stopped. "'You know the Mallorings, who own all the land round Todd's? Well, they've fallen foul of the Mallorings over what they call injustice to some labourers. Questions of morality involved. I don't know all the details. A man's got notice to quit over his deceased wife's sister, and some girl or other in another cottage has kicked over just ordinary country incidents. What I want is that Todd should be made to see that his family mustn't quarrel with his nearest neighbours in this way. We know the Mallorings well. They're only seven miles from us at Beckett. It doesn't do... Sooner or later it plays the devil all round. And the air's full of agitation about the labourers and the land, and all the rest of it. And he wants a spark to make real trouble. And having finished his oration, Stanley thrust his hand deep into his pockets and jingled the money that was there. John said abruptly, Felix, you better go down. Felix was sitting back, his eyes for once withdrawn from his brother's faces. Odd, he said, really odd that with a perfectly unique person like Todd for a brother, we only see him once in a blue moon? It's because he is so damned unique. Felix got up and gravely extended his hand to Stanley. By Jove, he said, you've spoken truth. And to John he added, Well, I will go and let you know the upshot. When he departed, the two elder brothers remained for some moments silent. Then Stanley said, Old Felix is a bit trying. With this fuss they made of him in the papers, his head swelled. John did not answer. One could not, in so many words, resent one's own brother being made a fuss of. And if it had been for something real, such as discovering the source of the Black River, conquering Bechuana land, curing Blue Mange, or being made a bishop, he would have been the first and most loyal in his appreciation. But for the sort of things Felix made up, fiction and critical, acid, destructive sort of stuff, pretending to show John Freeland things that he hadn't seen before, as if Felix could. Not at all the jolly old romance which one could read well enough and enjoy till it sent you to sleep after a good day's work. No, that Felix should be made a fuss of for such work as that really almost hurt him. It was not quite decent, violating deep down one's sense of form, one's sense of health, one's traditions. Though he would not have admitted it, he secretly felt, too, that this fuss was dangerous to his own point of view, which was, of course, to him the only real one. And he merely said, Will you stay to dinner, Stan? End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 3 If John had those sensations about Felix, so, when he was away from John, had Felix about himself. He had never quite grown out of the feeling that to make himself conspicuous in any way was bad form. In common with his three brothers, he'd been through the mills of gentility, those unique grinding machines of education only found in his native land. Todd, to be sure, had been publicly sacked at the end of his third term for climbing on to the headmaster's roof and filling up two of his chimneys with football pants, from which he had omitted to remove his name. Felix still remembered the august scene, the horrid thrill of it, the ominous sound of that Friedland Minimus, the ominous sight of poor little Todd emerging from his obscurity near the roof of the speech room and descending all those steps. How very small and rosy he had looked 
his bright hair standing on end, and his little blue eyes staring up very hard from under a troubled frown. And the august hand holding up those sooty pants, and the august voice, "'These appear to be yours, Friedland Minimus. Were you so good as to put them down my chimneys?' And the little piping, "'Yes, sir.' "'May I ask why, Friedland Minimus?' "'I don't know, sir.' "'You must have had some reason, Friedland Minimus.' "'It was the end of term, sir.' "'Nah, you must not come back here, Friedland Minimus. "'You are too dangerous to yourself and others. "'Go to your place.' "'And poor little Todd, ascending again all those steps, "'cheeks more terribly rosy than ever, "'eyes bluer, from under a still more troubled frown, "'little mouth hard-set, "'and breathing so that you could hear him six forms off. "'True, the new head had been goaded by other outrages.' the authors of which had not admitted to remove their names. But the want of humour, the amazing want of humour! As if it had not been a sign of first-rate stuff in Todd! And to this day Felix remembered with delight the little bubbling hiss that he himself had started, squelched at once, but rippling out again along the rows like tiny scattered lines of fire when a conflagration is suppressed. Expulsion had been the salvation of Todd. Or his damnation? Which... God would know, but Felix was not certain. Having himself been fifteen years acquiring mill philosophy, and another fifteen years getting rid of it, he had now begun to think that, after all, there might be something in it. A philosophy that took everything, including itself, at face value, and questioned nothing, was sedative to nerves too highly strung by the continual examination of the insides of oneself and others, with a view to their alteration. Todd, of course, having been sent to Germany after his expulsion, as one naturally would be, and then put to farming, had never properly acquired Mill Manor, and never sloughed it off, and yet he was as sedative a man as you could meet. Emerging from the tube station at Hampstead, he moved towards home under a sky stranger than one might see in a whole year of evenings. Between the pine trees on the ridge it was opaque and coloured like pinkish stone, and all around violent purple, with flames of the young green and white spring blossom lit against it. Spring had been dull and unimaginative so far, but this evening it was all fire and gathered torrents. Felix wondered at the waiting passion of the sky. He reached home just as those torrents began to fall. The old house, beyond the Spaniard's road, save for mice and a faint underlying savour of wood rot in two rooms, well satisfied the aesthetic sense. Felix often stood in his hall, study, bedroom, and other apartments, admiring the rich and simple glow of them, admiring the rarity and look of studied negligence about the stuffs, the flowers, the books, the furniture, the china. And then quite suddenly the feeling would sweep over him. By George, do I really own all this, when my ideal is bread and water, on a feast day's a little bit of cheese? True, he was not to blame for the niceness of his things. Flora did it. But still... There they were, a little hard to swallow for an Epicurean. It might, of course, have been worse, for if Flora had a passion for collecting, it was a very chaste one, and though what she collected cost no little money, it always looked as if it had been inherited, and, as everyone knows, what has been inherited must be put up with, whether it be a coronet or a cruet stand. To collect old things and write poetry. It was a career. One would not have had one's wife otherwise. She might, for instance, have been like Stanley's wife, Clara, whose career was wealth and station, or John's wife, Anne, whose career had been cut short, or even Todd's wife, Kirstein, whose career was revolution. No, a wife who had two, and only two, children, and treated them with affectionate surprise, who was never out of temper, never in a hurry, knew the points of a book or play, could cut your hair at a pinch, whose hand was dry, figure still good, verse tolerable, and above all, who wished for no better fate than fate had given her, was a wife not to be sneezed at. And Felix never had. He depicted so many sneezing wives and husbands in his books, and knew the value of a happy marriage better perhaps than anyone in England. He had laid marriage low a dozen times, wrecked it on all sorts of rocks, and had the greater veneration for his own, which had begun early, manifested every symptom of ending late, and in the meantime walked down the years holding hands fast, and by no means forgetting to touch lips. Hanging up the grey top hat, he went in search of her. 
he found her in his dressing-room, surrounded by a number of little bottles, which he was examining vaguely, and putting one by one into an inherited waste-paper basket. Having watched her for a little while with a certain pleasure, he said, "'Yes, my dear?' Noticing his presence and continuing to put bottles into the basket, she answered, "'I thought I must. They're what dear mother's given us.' There they lay, little bottles filled with white and brown fluids, white and blue and brown powders, green and brown and yellow ointments, black lozenges, buff plasters, blue and pink and purple pills, all beautifully labelled and corked. And he said, in a rather faltering voice, "'Bless her! How does she give her things away? Haven't we used any?' "'Not one, and they have to be cleared away before they're stale, for fear we might take one by mistake.' "'Poor mother. "'My dear, she's found something new than them all by now.' "'Felix sighed. "'The nomadic spirit. I have it too.' "'And a sudden vision came to him of his mother's carved ivory face, "'kept free of wrinkles by sheer will-power, "'its firm chin, slightly aquiline nose, and measured brows, "'its eyes that saw everything so quickly, so fastidiously, "'its compressed mouth that smiled sweetly "'with a resolute but pathetic acceptation.' of the piece of fine lace, sometimes black, sometimes white, over her grey hair, of her hands, so thin now, always moving a little, as if all the composure and care not to offend any eye by allowing time to ravage her face were avenging themselves in that constant movement, of her figure, that was short but did not seem so, still quick-moving, still alert, and always dressed in black or grey. A vision of that exact, fastidious, wandering spirit called Francis Fleming Freeland. That spirit strangely compounded domination and humility, of acceptation and criticism, precise and actual to the point of desert dryness, generous to a point that caused her family to despair, and always, beyond all things, brave. Flora dropped the last little bottle, and sitting on the edge of the bath, let her eyebrows rise. How pleasant was that impersonal humour which made her superior to other wives. You, nomadic, how? Mother travels unceasingly from place to place, person to person, thing to thing. I travel unceasingly from motive to motive, mind to mind. My native air is also desert air, hence the sterility of my work. Flora rose, but her eyebrows descended. Your work, she said, is not sterile. "'That, my dear,' said Felix, "'is prejudice.' And perceiving that she was going to kiss him, he waited, without annoyance. For a woman of forty-two, with two children and three books of poems, and not knowing which had taken least out of her, with hazel-grey eyes, wavy eyebrows darker than they should have been, a glint of red in her hair, wavy figure and lips, quaint, half-humorous indolence, quaint, half-humorous warmth, was she not as satisfactory a woman as a man could possibly have married? "'I've got to go down and see Todd,' he said. "'I like that wife of his, but she has no sense of humour. "'How much better principles are in theory than in practice.' "'Flora repeated softly, as if to herself, "'I'm glad I have none.' "'She was at the window, leaning out, and Felix took his place beside her. "'The air was full of scent from wet leaves, "'alive with the song of birds thanking the sky.' Suddenly he felt her arm round his ribs. Either it or they, which he could not at the moment tell, seemed extraordinarily soft. Between Felix and his young daughter, Nedda, there existed the only kind of love, except a mother's, which has much permanence, love based on mutual admiration. Though why Nedda, with her starry innocence, should admire him, Felix could never understand, not realising that she read his books, and even analysed them for herself in the diary which she kept religiously, writing it when she ought to have been asleep. He had, therefore, no knowledge of the way his written thoughts stimulated the ceaseless questioning that was always going on within her, the thirst to know why this was and that was not, why, for instance, her heart ached or so some days and felt light and eager other days, why, when people wrote and talked of God, they seemed to know what he was, and she never did, why people had to suffer and the world be black to so many millions, why one could not love more than one man at a time. Why, a thousand things. Felix's books supplied no answers to these questions, but they were comforting, for her real need as yet was not for answers, 
but ever for more questions, as a young bird's need is for opening its beak without quite knowing what is coming out or going in. When she and her father walked, or sat, or went to concerts together, their talk was neither particularly intimate or particularly voluble. They made to each other no great confidences. Yet each was certain that the other was not bored, a great thing, and they squeezed each other's little fingers a good deal, very warming. Now with his son Alan, Felix had a continual sensation of having to keep up to a mark and never succeeding, a feeling, as in his favourite nightmare, of trying to pass an examination for which he had neglected to prepare, of having to preserve, in fact, form proper to the father of Alan Freeland. With Nedda he had a sense of refreshment, the delight one has on a spring day, watching a clear stream, a bank of flowers, birds flying. And Nedda with her father, what feeling had she? To be with him was like a long stroking with a touch of tickle in it. To read his books, a long tickle with a nice touch of stroking now and then, when one was not expecting it. That night, after dinner, when Alan had gone out and Flora into a dream, she snuggled up alongside her father, got hold of his little finger, and whispered, "'Come into the garden, Dad. I'll put on goloshes. It's an awfully nice moon.' The moon, indeed, was palest gold behind the pines, so that its radiance was a mere shower of pollen, just a brushing of white moth down over the reeds of their little dark pond and the black blur of the flowering currant bushes. And the young lime trees, not yet in full leaf, quivered ecstatically in that moon witchery, still letting fall raindrops of the past spring torrent with soft hissing sounds. A real sense in the garden of God holding his breath in the presence of his own youth, swelling, growing, trembling towards perfection. Somewhere a bird, a thrush, they thought, mixed in its little mind as to night and day, was queerly tree-ripping. And Felix and his daughter went along the dark, wet paths, holding each other's arms, not talking much. For in him, very responsive to the moods of nature, there was a flattered feeling, with that young arm in his, of spring having chosen to confide in him this whispering, rustling hour. And in Nedda was so much of that night's unutterable youth. No wonder she was silent. Then, somehow, neither responsible, they stood motionless. How quiet it was, but for a distant dog or two, and the steady shivering down of the water-drops, and the far vibration of the million-voiced city. How quiet and soft and fresh. Then Nedda spoke. "'Dad, I do so want to know everything.' Not rousing even a smile, with its sublime immodesty, that aspiration seemed to Felix infinitely touching. What less could youth want in the very heart of spring? And watching her face put up to the night, her parted lips, and the moon gleam fingering her white throat, he answered, "'It'll all come soon enough, my pretty.' To think that she must come to an end like the rest, having found out almost nothing, having discovered just herself and the particle of God that was within her. But he could not, of course, say this. "'I want to feel. Can't I begin?' How many millions of young creatures all the world over were sending up that white prayer to climb and twine towards the stars and fall to earth again? And nothing to be answered but time enough, Nedda. "'But, Dad, there are such heaps of things, such heaps of people and reason and, and life.' and I know nothing. Dreams are the only times, it seems to me, that one finds out anything. As for that, my child, I am exactly in your case. What's to be done for us? She slid her hand through his arm again. Don't laugh at me. Heaven forbid, I mean it. You're finding out much quicker than I. It's all folk music to you still. To me, Strauss and the rest of the tired stuff. The variations my mind spins— wouldn't I just swap them for the tunes your mind is making? I don't see making tunes at all. I don't seem to have anything to make them of. Take me down to see the Todds, Dad. Why not? And yet, just as in this spring night Felix felt so much, so very much, lying out there behind the still and moony dark, such marvellous holding of breath and waiting sentiency, so behind this innocent petition he could not help the feeling of a lurking fatefulness. That was absurd. And he said, If you wish it, by all means. You're like your Uncle Todd. As to the others, I can't say, but your aunt is an experience, and experiences are what you want, it seems. Fervently, 
without speech, Nedda squeezed his arm. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 4 Stanley Friedland's country house, Beckett, was almost a show-place. It stood in its park and pastures two miles from the little town of Tranchum and the Morton Ploughworks, close to the ancestral home of the Mortons, his mother's family, that home burned down by the Roundheads in the Civil War. The site, certain vagaries in the ground, Mrs. Stanley had caused to be walled round and consecrated, so to speak, with a stone medallion on which were engraved the aged Morton arms, arrows and crescent moons in proper juxtaposition. Peacocks, too, that bird pardoned from the old Morton crest, were encouraged to dwell there and utter their cries, as of passionate souls lost in too comfortable surroundings. But one of those freaks of which nature is so prodigal, Stanley, owner of this native Morton soil, least of all four Freeland brothers, had the Morton cast of mind and body. That was why he made so much more money than the other three put together, and had been able, with the aid of Clara's undoubted genius for rank and station, to restore a strain of Morton blood to its rightful position among the county families of Worcestershire. Bluff and without sentiment, he himself set little store by that, smiling up his sleeve, for he was both kindly and prudent, at his wife who had been a Thompson. It was not in Stanley to appreciate the peculiar flavour of the Mortons, that something which in spite of their naivety and narrowness had really been rather fine. To him such Mortons as were left were dry enough sticks, clean out of it. They were of a breed that was already gone, the simplest of all country gentlemen, dating back to the conquest, without one solitary conspicuous ancestor, save the one who had been a physician to a king and perished without issue, marrying from generation to generation exactly their own equals, living simple, pious, parochial lives, never in trade, never making money, having a tradition and a practice of gentility more punctilious than the so-called aristocracy, constitutionally paternal and maternal to their dependents, constitutionally so convinced that those dependents, and all indeed who were not gentry, were of different clay, that they were entirely simple and entirely without arrogance, carrying with them even now a sort of early atmosphere of archery and home-made cordials, lavender and love of clergy, together with frequent use of the word nice, a peculiar regularity of feature, and a complexion that was rather parchmenty. High church people and Tories, naturally, to a man and woman, by sheer inbred absence of ideas, and sheer inbred conviction that nothing else was nice, but with all very considerate of others, really plucky in bearing their own ills, not greedy, and not wasteful. Of Beckett, as it now was, they would not have approved at all. By what chance Edmund Morton, Stanley's mother's grandfather, in the middle of the eighteenth century, had suddenly diverged from family feeling and ideals, and taken that not-quite-nice resolution to make ploughs and money, would never now be known. The fact remained, together with the plough-works. A man apparently of curious energy and character, considering his origin, he dropped the E from his name, and though he continued the family tradition so far as to marry a Fleming of Worcestershire, to be paternal to his workmen, to be known as squire, and to bring his children up in the older Morton niceness, he had yet managed to make his ploughs quite celebrated, to found a little town, and die still handsome and clean-shaved at the age of sixty-six. Of his four sons, only two could be found sufficiently without the E to go on making ploughs. Stanley's grandfather, Stuart Morton, indeed, had tried hard, but in the end had reverted to the congenital instinct for being just of Morton. An extremely amiable man, he took to wandering with his family, and died in France, leaving one daughter, Frances, Stanley's mother, and three sons, one of whom, absorbed in horses, wandered to Australia, and was killed by falling from them, one of whom, a soldier, wandered to India, and the embraces of a snake, and one of whom wandered into the embraces of the Holy Roman Church. The Morton ploughworks were dry and dwindling when Stanley's father, seeking an opening for his son, put him and money into them. From that moment they had never looked back, and now brought Stanley, the sole proprietor, an income of full fifteen thousand pounds a year. He wanted it, for Clara, his wife, had that energy of aspiration which before now had raised women to positions of importance in the counties which are not their own, and caused, incidentally, many acres to go out of cultivation. 
Not one plough was used on the whole of Becket, not even a Morton plough. These, indeed, were unsuitable to English soil, and were all sent abroad. It was the cornerstone of his success that Stanley had completely seen through the talked-of revival of English agriculture, and sedulously cultivated the foreign market. This was why the Becket dining-room could contain, without straining itself, large quantities of local magnates and celebrities from London, all deploring the condition of the land, and discussing without end the regrettable position of the agricultural labourer. Except for literary men and painters, present in small quantities to leaven the lump, Beckett was, in fact, a rallying point for the advanced spirits of land reform. One of those places where they were sure of being well done at weekends, and of congenial and even stimulating talk about the undoubted need for doing something, and the designs which were being entertained upon the land by either party. This very heart of English country that the old Mortons in their paternal way had so religiously farmed, making out of its lush grass and waving corn a simple and by no means selfish or ungenerous subsistence, was now entirely lawns, park, coverts and private golf course, together with enough grass to support the kine which yielded that continual stream of milk necessary to Clara's entertainments and children, all female, save little Francis, and still of tender years. Of gardeners, keepers, cowmen, chauffeurs, footmen, stablemen, full twenty were supported on those fifteen hundred acres that formed the little Becket demean. Of agricultural labourers proper, that vexed individual so much in the air, so reluctant to stay on the land, and so difficult to house when he was there, there were fortunately none, so that it was possible for Stanley, whose wife meant to put up for the division, and his guests, who were frequently in Parliament, to hold entirely unbiased and impersonal views about the whole question, so long as they were at Becket. It was beautiful there, too, with the bright open fields hedged with great elms, and that ever-rich serenity of its grass and trees. The white house, timbered with dark beams in true Worcestershire fashion, and added to from time to time, had preserved, thanks to a fine architect, an old-fashioned air of spacious presidency above its lawns and gardens. On the long artificial lake, with innumerable rushy nooks and water-lilies, and coverture of leaves floating flat and bright in the sun, the half-tame wild duck and shy water-hens had remote little worlds, and flew and splashed when all Becket was abed, quite as if the human spirit, with its monkey tricks and its little divine flame, had not yet been born. Under the shade of a copper beech, just where the drive cut through into its circle before the house, an old lady was sitting that afternoon on a camp-stool. She was dressed in grey alpaca, light and cool, and had on her iron-grey hair a piece of black lace. A number of hearth and home, and a little pair of scissors, suspended by an inexpensive chain from her waist, rested on her knee, for she had been meaning to cut out for dear Felix a certain recipe for keeping the head cool. But as a fact, she sat without doing so, very still, save that now and then she compressed her pale, fine lips, and continually moved her pale, fine hands. She was evidently waiting for something that promised excitement, even pleasure, for a little rose-leaf flush had quavered up into a face that was coloured like parchment and her grey eyes under regular and still dark brows, very far apart, between which there was no semblance of a wrinkle, seemed noting little definite things about her almost unwillingly, as an Arab's or Red Indian's eyes will continue to note things in the present, however their minds may be set on the future. So sat Francis Fleming Freeland, nay Morton, waiting for the arrival of her son Felix and her grandchildren Alan and Nedda. She marked presently an old man limping slowly on a stick toward where the drive debouched, and thought at once, "'He oughtn't to be coming this way. I expect he doesn't know the way round to the back. Poor man, he's very lame. He looks respectable, too.' She got up and went towards him, remarking that his face with nice grey moustaches was wonderfully regular, almost like a gentleman's, and that he touched his dusty hat with quite old-fashioned courtesy. And, smiling, her smile was sweet but critical, she said, "'You'll find the best way is to go back to that little path and past the greenhouses. Have you hurt your leg?' "'My leg's been like that, ma'am, fifteen years, come back us. "'How did it happen?' "'Plowing. The bone was injured, and now they say the muscles dried up in a manner of speaking.' "'What do you do for it? The very best thing is this.' From the recesses of a deep pocket, place where no one else wore such a thing, she brought out a little pot. 
"'You must let me give it to you. "'Put it on when you go to bed and rub it well in. "'You'll find it acts splendidly.' "'The old man took the little pot with dubious reverence. "'Yes, m'm,' he said. "'Thank you, m'm.' "'What is your name?' "'Gaunt.' "'And where do you live?' "'Over to Joyfield, m'm.' "'Joyfield's. Another of my sons lives there. "'Mr. Morton Freeland. But it's seven miles.' "'I got a lift halfway. "'And have you business at the house?' The old man was silent. The downcast, rather cynical look of his lined face deepened. "'He's overtired. They must give him some tea and an egg. What can he want coming all this way? He's evidently not a beggar.' The old man, who was not a beggar, spoke suddenly. "'I know them, Sir Freelands, at Joyfield's. He's a good gentleman, too.' "'Yes, he is. I wonder I don't know you.' "'I'm not much about, owing to me leg. It's me granddaughter in service here I come to see.' "'Oh, yes. What is her name?' Gaunt, her name is. I shouldn't know her by her surname. Alice. Ah, in the kitchen, a nice pretty girl. I hope you're not in trouble. Again the old man was silent, and again spoke suddenly. That's as you look at it, m'm, he said. I've got a matter of a few words to have with her about the family. Her father, he couldn't come, so I come instead. And how are you going to get back? I have to walk, I expect, with that I can pick up with a cart. Frances Freeland compressed her lips. "'With that leg you should have come by train.' The old man smiled. "'I haven't the fare like,' he said. "'I only get five shillings a week from the council, and two of that I pays over to me son.' And as she did so, she noticed that the old man's left boot was flapping open, and that there were two buttons off his coat. Her mind was swiftly calculating. "'It is more than seven weeks to court a day. Of course I can't afford it, but I must just give him a sovereign.' She withdrew her hand from the recesses of her pocket and looked at the old man's nose. It was finely chiselled and the same yellow as his face. It looks nice and quite sober, she thought. In her hand was her purse and a bootlace. She took out a sovereign. Now, if I give you this, she said, you must promise me not to spend any of it in the public house. And this is for your boot, and you must go back by train, and get those buttons sewn in your coat, and tell cook from me, please, to give you some tea and an egg. And noticing that he took the sovereign and the bootlace very respectfully, and seemed altogether very respectful, and not at all coarse or beery-looking, she said, "'Good-bye. Don't forget to rub what I gave you into your leg every night and every morning,' and went back to her camp-stool. Sitting down on it with the scissors in her hand, she still did not cut out that recipe, but remained as before, taking in small, definite things, and feeling with an inner trembling that dear Felix and Alan and Nedda would soon be here and the little flush rose again in her cheeks, and again her lips and hands moved, expressing and compressing what was in her heart. And close behind her, a peacock, straying from the foundations of the old Morton house, uttered a cry, and moved slowly, spreading its tail under the low-hanging boughs of the copper beeches, as though it knew those dark burnished leaves were the proper setting for its pardoned magnificence. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 5 The day after the little conference at John's, Felix had indeed received the following note. Dear Felix, when you go down to see old Todd, why not put up with us at Beckett? Any time will suit, and the car can take you over to Joyfields when you like. Give the pen a rest. Clara joins in hoping you'll come, and Mother is still here. No use, I suppose, to ask Flora. Yours ever, Stanley. During the twenty years of his brother's sojourn there, Felix had been down to Beckett perhaps once a year, and latterly alone, for Flora, having accompanied him the first few times, had taken a firm stand. "'My dear,' she said, "'I feel all body there.' Felix had rejoined, "'No bad thing, once in a way.' But Flora had remained firm. Life was too short. She did not get on well with Clara. Neither did Felix feel too happy in his sister-in-law's presence. But the grey top-hat instinct had kept him going down there, for one ought to keep in touch with one's brothers. He replied to Stanley, "'Dear Stanley, delighted, if I may bring my two youngsters. We'll arrive tomorrow at 4.50. Yours affectionately, Felix.' Travelling with Nedda was always jolly, 
One could watch her eyes, noting, inquiring, and when occasion served, have one little finger hooked in and squeezed. Travelling with Adam was convenient, the young man having a way with railways which Felix himself had long despaired of acquiring. Neither of the children had ever been at Beckett, and though Alan was seldom curious, and Netta too curious about everything to be specially so about this, yet Felix experienced in their company the sensations of a new adventure. Arriving at Trancham, that little town upon a hill which the Morton ploughworks had created, they were soon in Stanley's car, whirling into the sleepy peace of a Worcestershire afternoon. Would this young word nestling up against him echo Flora's verdict, I feel all body there? Or would she take to its fatted luxury as a duck to water? And he said, By the way, your aunt Bigwigs set in on Saturday. Are you for staying and seeing the lion's feed, or do we cut back? From Alan he got the answer he expected. If there's golf or something, I suppose we can make out all right? From Nedda, What sort of bigwigs are they, Dad? Sort you've never seen, my dear. Then I should like to stay. Only about dresses? What war paint have you? Only two white evenings, and Mum's gave me to her Mechlin. Twill serve. To Felix, Nedda in white evenings was starry and all that man could desire. Only, Dad, do tell me about them beforehand. My dear, I will, and God be with you. This is where Beckett begins. The car had swerved into a long drive between trees not yet full-grown, but decorously trying to look more than their twenty years. To the right, about a group of older elms, brooks were in commotion, for Stanley's three keepers' wives had just baked their annual brook pies, and the birds were not yet happy again. Those elms had stood there when the old Mortons walked past them through cornfields to church of a Sunday. Away on the left, above the lake, the little walled mound had come in view. Something in Felix always stirred at sight of it, and squeezing Nedda's arm, he said, "'See that silly wall? Behind there Granny's ancients lived. Gone now. New house, new lake, new trees, new everything.' But he saw from his little daughter's calm eyes that the sentiment in him was not in her. "'I like the lake,' she said. "'There's Granny. Oh, and a peacock!' His mother's embrace, with its frail energy and the pressure of her soft, dry lips, filled Felix always with remorse. Why could he not give the simple and direct expression to his feeling that she gave to hers? He watched those lips transferred to Nedda, heard her say, "'Oh, my darling, how lovely to see you. Do you know this for midge bites?' A hand, diving deep into a pocket, returned with a little silver-coated stick having a bluish end. Felix saw it rise and hover above Nedda's forehead, and descend with two little swift dabs. "'It takes them away at once!' "'Oh, but, Granny, they're not midge bikes. They're only from my hat.' "'It doesn't matter, darling. It takes away anything like that.' And he thought, "'Mother is really wonderful.' At the house the car had already disgorged their luggage. Only one man, but he absolutely the butler, awaited them, and they entered, at once conscious of Clara's special potpourri. Its fragrance steamed from blue china in every nook and crevice, a sort of baptism into luxury.' Clara herself, in the outer morning-room, smelled a little of it. Quick and dark of eye, capable, comely, perfectly buttoned, one of those women who know exactly how not to be superior to the general taste of the period. In addition to that great quality, she was endowed with a fine nose, an instinct for coordination not to be excelled, and a genuine love of making people comfortable. So that it was no wonder that she had risen in the ranks of hostesses, till her house was celebrated for its ease, even among those who at their weekends like to feel all body. In regard to that characteristic of Beckett, not even Felix in his ironies had ever stood up to Clara. The matter was too delicate. Francis Freeland, indeed, not because she had any philosophic preconceptions on the matter, but because it was not nice, dear, to be wasteful, even if it were only of rose-leaves, or to have too much decoration, such as Japanese prints in places where they hum, sometimes told her daughter-in-law frankly what was wrong, without, however, making the faintest impression upon Clara, for she was not sensitive, and she said to Stanley it was only mother. When they had drunk that special Chinese tea, all the rage, but which no one really liked, in the inner morning or afternoon room, for the drawing-rooms were too large to be comfortable except at weekends, they went to see the children, a special blend of Stanley and Clara, save the little Francis, who did not seem to be entirely body. Then Clara took them to their rooms. 
She lingered kindly in Nedda's, feeling that the girl could not yet feel quite at home, and, looking in the soap-dish, lest she might not have the right verbena, and about the dressing-table to see that she had pins and scent and plenty of potpourri, and thinking, "'The child is pretty, a nice girl, not like her mother.' Explaining carefully how, because of the approaching weekend, she had been obliged to put her in a very simple room, where she would be compelled to cross the corridor to her bath, she asked her if she had a quilted dressing-gown, and finding that she had not, left her saying she would send one, and could she do her frocks up, or should Sirrit come? Abandoned, the girl stood in the middle of the room, so far more simple than she had ever slept in, with its warm fragrance of rose-leaves and verbena, its aubusin cartip, white silk quilted bed, sofa, cushioned window-seat, dainty curtains, and little nickel-box of biscuits on a little spindly table. There she stood and sniffed, stretched herself, and thought, "'It's jolly, only it smells too much.' And he went up to the pictures one by one. They seemed to go splendidly with the room, and suddenly she felt homesick. Ridiculous, of course, yet if she had known where her father's room was, she would have run out to it. But her memory was too tangled up with stairs and corridors. To find her way down to the hall again was all she could have done. A maid came in now with a blue silk gown, very thick and soft. Could she do anything for Miss Freeland? No thanks, she could not. Only, did she know where Mr. Freeland's room was? Which Mr. Freeland, miss? The young or the old? Oh, the old! Having said which, Nedda felt unhappy. Her dad was not old. No, miss, but I'll find out. It'll be in the walnut ring. But with a little flutter at the thought of thus setting people to run about wings, Nedda murmured, Oh, thanks, no, no, it doesn't matter. She settled down now on the cushion of the window-seat, to look out and take it all in, right away to that line of hills gone blue in the haze of the warm evening. That would be Malvern, and there, farther to the south, the Todds lived. Joyfields, a pretty name, and it was lovely country all round, green and peaceful with its white timbered houses and cottages. People must be very happy living here, happy and quiet like the stars and the birds, not like the crowds in London thronging streets and shops and Hampstead Heath, not like the people in all those disgruntled suburbs that led out for miles where London ought to have stopped but had not, not like the thousands and thousands of those poor creatures in Bethnal Green where her slum work lay. The natives here must surely be happy. Only were there any natives? She had not seen any. Away to the right below her window were the first trees of the fruit garden. For many of them spring was over, but the apple-trees had just come into blossom, and the low sun, shining through a gap in some far elms, was slanting on their creamy pink, christening them, Nedda thought, with drops of light. And lovely the blackbird singing sounded in the perfect hush. How wonderful to be a bird, going where you would, and from high up in the air seeing everything, flying down a sunbeam, drinking a rain-brop, sitting on the very top of a tall tree, running in grass so high that you were hidden laying little perfect blue-green eggs, or pure grey speckly ones, never changing your dress, yet always beautiful. Surely the spirit of the world was in the birds and the clouds, roaming, floating, and in the flowers and trees that never smelled anything but sweet, never looked anything but lovely, and were never restless. Why was one restless, wanting things that did not come, wanting to feel and know, wanting to love and be loved? And at that thought which had come to her so unexpectedly, a thought never before shaped so definitely. Nedda planted her arms on the window-sill, with sleeves falling down, and let her hands meet cup-shaped beneath her chin. Love! To have somebody with whom she could share everything, someone to whom and for whom she could give up, someone she could protect and comfort, someone who would bring her peace. Peace. Rest. From what? Ah, that she could not make clear, even to herself. Love! What would love be like? Her father loved her, and she loved him. She loved her mother, and Anna, on the whole, was jolly to her. It was not that. What was it? Where was it? When would it come and wake her, and kiss her to sleep, all in one? Come and fill her as with the warmth and colour, the freshness, light, and shadow of this beautiful May evening. Flutter as with the singing of those birds, and the warm light sunning the apple blossoms. And she sighed. Then, as with all young things, whose attention, after all, is but as the hovering of a butterfly, her speculation was attracted to a thin, high-shouldered figure, limping on a stick, 
away from the house, down one of the paths among the apple-trees. He wavered, not knowing, it seemed, his way. And Edda thought, "'Poor old man, how lame he is!' He saw him stoop, screened, as he evidently thought from sight, and take something very small from his pocket. He gazed, rubbed it, put it back. What it was she could not see. Then, pressing his hand down, he smoothed and stretched his leg. His eyes seemed closed. So a stone man might have stood. Till very slowly he limped on, passing out of sight. And, turning from the window, Nedda began hurrying into her evening things. When she was ready, she took a long time to decide whether to wear her mother's lace or keep it for the bigwigs. But it was so nice and creamy that she simply could not take it off, and stood turning and turning before the glass. To stand before a glass was silly and old-fashioned, but Nedda could never help it, wanting so badly to be nicer to look at than she was, because of that something that some day was coming. She was, in fact, pretty, but not merely pretty. There was in her face something live and sweet, something clear and swift. She had still that way of a child raising its eyes very quickly and looking straight at you with an eager innocence that hides everything by its very wonder. And when those eyes looked down they seemed closed, their dark lashes were so long. Her eyebrows were wide apart, arching with a slight angle, and slanting a little down towards her nose. Her forehead under its burnt brown hair was candid, her firm little chin just dimpled. Altogether a face difficult to take one's eyes off. But Nedda was far from vain, and her face seemed to her too short and broad, her eyes too dark and indeterminate, neither grey nor brown. The straightness of her nose was certainly comforting, but it too was short. Being creamy in the throat and browning easily, she would have liked to be marble white, with blue dreamy eyes and fair hair, or else like a Madonna. And was she tall enough? Only five foot five. And her arms were too thin. The only thing that gave her perfect satisfaction were her legs, which of course she could not at the moment see. They really were rather jolly. Then in a panic, fearing to be late, she turned and ran out, fluttering into the maze of stairs and corridors. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 6 Clara, Mrs. Stanley Freeland, was not a narrow woman either in mind or body, and, years ago, soon indeed after she married Stanley, she had declared her intention of taking up her sister-in-law, Kirstine, in spite of what she had heard were the woman's extraordinary notions. Those were the days of carriages, pairs, coachmen, grooms, and with her usual promptitude, ordering out the lot, she had set forth. It is safe to say she had never forgotten that experience. Imagine an old, white, timbered cottage with a thatched roof and no single line about it quite straight. A cottage crazy with age, buried up to the thatch in sweetbriar, creepers, honeysuckle, and perched high above crossroads. A cottage almost unapproachable for beehives and their bees, an insect for which Clara had an aversion. Imagine, on the rough, pebbled approach to the door of this cottage, and Clara had on thin shoes, a peculiar cradle with a dark-eyed baby that was staring placidly at two bees sleeping on a coverlet made of a rough linen such as Clara had never before seen. Imagine an absolutely naked little girl of three sitting in a tub of sunlight in the very doorway. Clara had turned swiftly and closed the wicket gate between the pebbled path and the mossed steps that led down to where the coachman and her footman were sitting very still, as was the habit of those people. She perceived at once that she was making no common call. Then, with real courage, she had advanced, and looking down at the little girl with a fearful smile, had tickled the door with the handle of her green parasol. A woman, younger than herself, a girl indeed, appeared in a low doorway. She had often told Stanley since that she would never forget her first sight, she had not yet had another, of Todd's wife. A brown face and black hair, fiery grey eyes, eyes all light under black lashes, and such a strange smile. Bare, brown, shapely arms and neck in a shirt of the same rough, creamy linen, and from under a bright blue skirt, bare, brown, shapely ankles and feet. A voice so soft and deadly that, as Clara said, what with her eyes, it really gave me the shivers. And, my dear, she pursued, 
whitewashed walls, bare brick floors, not a pitcher, not a curtain, not even a fire-iron. Clean. Oh, horribly. They must be the most awful cranks. The only thing I must say that was nice was the smell. Sweetbriar and honey, coffee and baked apples. Really delicious. I must try what I can do with it. But that woman, the girl, I suppose she is, stumped me. I'm sure she'd have cut my head off if I'd attempted to open my mouth on ordinary topics. The children were rather ducks, but imagine leaving them about like that among the bees. Kirsty! She looked it. Never again. And Todd, I didn't see at all. I suppose he was mooning about among his creatures. It was the memory of this visit, now seventeen years ago, that had made her smile so indulgently when Stanley came back from the conference. She had said at once that they must have Felix to stay, and for her part she would be only too glad to do anything she could for those poor children of Todd's, even to asking them to Beckett and trying to civilise them a little. But as for that woman, there'd been nothing to be done with her, I can assure you, and I expect Todd is completely under her thumb. To Felix, who took her in to dinner, she spoke feelingly and in a low voice. She liked Felix, in spite of his wife, and respected him. He had a name. Lady Mallering, she told him, the Mallerings owned, of course, everything round Joyfield's, had been telling her that of late Todd's wife had really become quite rabid over the land question. The Todds were hand in love with all the cottagers. She, Clara, had nothing to say against anyone who sympathised with the condition of the agricultural labourer, quite the contrary. Beckett was almost, as Felix knew, though perhaps it wasn't for her to say so, the centre of that movement. But there were ways of doing things, and one did so deprecate women like this Kirstein. What an impossible Celtic name! putting her finger into any pie that really was of natural importance. Nothing could come of anything done that sort of way. If Felix had any influence with Todd, it would be a mercy to use it in getting these poor young creatures away from home, to mix a little with people who took a sane view of things. She would like very much to get them over to Beckett, but with their notions it was doubtful whether they had evening clothes. She had, of course, never forgotten that naked mite of the tub of sunlight, nor the poor baby with its bees and its rough linen. Felix replied deferentially. He was invariably polite, and only just ironic enough in the houses of others, that he had the very greatest respect for Todd, and that there could be nothing very wrong with the woman to whom Todd was so devoted. As for the children, his own young people would get at them and learn all about what was going on in a way that no fogey like himself could. In regard to the land question, there were, of course, many sides to that, and he, for one, would not be at all sorry to observe yet another. After all, the Todds were in real contact with the labourers, and that was the great thing. It would be very interesting. Yes, Clara quite saw all that, but... And here she sank her voice so that there was hardly any left. As Felix was going over there, she really must put him au courant with the heart of this matter. Lady Mallering had told her the whole story. It appeared there were two cases, a family called Gaunt, an old man and his son, who had two daughters. One of them, Alice, quite a nice girl, was kitchen-maid here at Beckett. But the other sister, Wilmot, well, she was one of those girls that, as Felix must know, were always to be found in every village. She was leading the young men astray, and Lady Mallering had put her foot down, telling her bailiff to tell the farmer for whom Gaunt worked that he and his family must go unless they sent the girl away somewhere. That was one case, and the other was of a labourer called Trist, who wanted to marry his deceased wife's sister. Of course, whether Mildred Mellering was not rather too churchy and puritanical, now that a deceased wife's sister was legal, Clara did not want to say, but she was undoubtedly within her rights if she thought it for the good of the village. This man, Trist, was a good workman, and his farmer had objected to losing him, but Lady Mallering had, of course, not given way, and if he persisted he would get put out. All the cottages about there were Sir Gerald Mallering's, so that in both cases it would mean leaving the neighbourhood. In regard to village morality, as Felix knew, the line must be drawn somewhere. Felix interrupted quietly. I draw it at Lady Mallering. Well, I won't argue that with you, but it really is a scandal that Todd's wife should incite her young people to stir up the villagers. Goodness knows where that mayn't lead. Todd's cottages and land, you see, are freehold, the only freehold are thereabouts, and his being a brother of Stanley's makes it particularly awkward for the Mallerings. Quite so murmured Felix. Yes, but my dear Felix, when it comes to infecting those simple people with inflated ideas of their rights, it's serious, especially in the country. 
I've told there's really quite a violent feeling. I hear from Alice Gaunt that the young Todds have been going about saying that dogs are better off than people treated in this fashion, which, of course, is all nonsense, and making far too much of a small matter. Don't you think so?' But Felix only smiled his peculiar, sweetest smile, and answered, "'I'm glad to have come down just now.' Clara, who did not know that when Felix smiled like that he was angry, agreed. "'Yes,' she said, "'you're an observer. You will see the thing in right perspective.' Mm, "'I shall endeavour to. What does Todd say?' "'Oh, Todd never seems to say anything. At least I never hear of it.' Felix murmured, "'Todd is a well in the desert.' to which deep saying Clara made no reply, nor indeed understanding in the least what it might signify. That evening, when Alan, having had his fill of billiards, had left the smoking-room and gone to bed, Felix remarked to Stanley, "'I say, what sort of people are these Mallorings?' Stanley, who was setting himself for the twenty minutes of whisky, potash, and a review with which he commonly composed his mind before retiring, answered negligently, "'The Mallorings?' "'Oh, about the best type of landowner we've got.' "'What exactly do you mean by that?' Stanley took his time to answer, for below his bluff good nature he had the tenacious, if somewhat slow, precision of an English man of business, mingled with a certain mistrust of old Felix. "'Well,' he said at last, "'they build good cottages, yellow brick, damned ugly, I must say. Look after the character of their tenants, we give them rebate of rent if there's a bad harvest.' Courage, stock breeding, and machinery. Got some of my ploughs, but the people don't like them. As a matter of fact, they're right. They're not made for these small fields. Set an example going to church. Patronise the rifle range. Buy up the pubs when they can, and run them themselves. Send out jelly, and let people over their place on bank holidays. Dash it all. I don't know what they don't do. Why? Are they liked? Liked? No, I should hardly think they were liked. Respected, and all that. Mallorings a steady fellow, key man on housing, and anti gentleman, but he's a bit too much perhaps on the pious side. They got one of the finest Georgian houses in the country. Altogether they're what you call model. But not human. Stanley slightly lowered the review, and looked across it at his brother. It was evident to him that old Felix was in one of his free thinking moods. They're domestic, he said, and fond of their children and pleasant neighbours. I don't deny that they've got a tremendous sense of duty. "'But we want that in these days.' "'Duty to what?' Stanley raised his level eyebrows. It was a stumper. Without great care he felt that he would be getting over the border into the uncharted land of speculation and philosophy, wandering on paths that led him nowhere. "'If you lived in the country, old man,' he said, "'you wouldn't ask that sort of question.' "'You don't imagine,' said Felix, "'that you or the Mannerings live in the country. "'Why, you landlords are every bit as much town-dwellers as I am.' Thought, habit, dress, faith, souls, all town stuff. There's no country in England now for us of the upper classes. It's gone. I repeat, duty to what? And, rising, he went over to the window, looking out at the moonlit lawn, overcome by a sudden aversion for more talk. Of what use were words from a mind tuned in one key to a mind tuned in another? And yet, so ingrained was his habit of discussion that he promptly went on. The Mannerings, I've not the slightest doubt, believe it their duty to look after the morals of those who live on their property. There are three things to be said about that. One, you can't make people moral by adopting the attitude of the schoolmaster. Two, it implies that they consider themselves more moral than their neighbours. Three, it's a theory so convenient to their security that they would be exceptionally good people if they did not adopt it. But from your account, they are not so much exceptionally as just typically good people. What you call their sense of duty, Stanley, is really their sense of self-preservation, coupled with their sense of superiority. Hm, said Stanley. I don't know that I quite follow you. I always hate an odour of sanctity. I prefer them to say, frankly, this is my property, and you'll jolly well do what I tell you on it. But, my dear chap, after all, they really are superior. That, said Felix, I emphatically question. Put your mallorings to earn their living on fifteen to eighteen shillings a week— and where would they be? The Mannerings have certain virtues, no doubt, natural to their fortunate environment, but of the primitive virtues of patience, hardihood, perpetual, almost unconscious self-sacrifice, and cheerfulness in the face of a hard fate, they are no more the equals of the people they pretend to be superior to than I am your equal as a man of business. 
Hang it, was Tandy's answer. What a damned old heretic you are. Felix frowned. Am I? Be honest. Take the life of a mallering and take it at its best. See how it stands comparison in the ordinary virtues with those of an averagely good specimen or of a farm labourer. Your mallering is called with a cup of tea at, say, seven o'clock, out of a nice, clean, warm bed. He gets into a bath that has been got ready for him, into clothes and boots that have been brushed for him, and goes down to a room where there's a fire burning already if it's a cold day, writes a few letters, perhaps, before eating a breakfast of exactly what he likes, nicely prepared for him, and reading the newspaper that best comforts his soul. When he's eaten and read, he lights his cigar or his pipe, and attends to his digestion in the most sanitary and comfortable fashion. Then, in his study, he sits down to steady direction of other people, either by interview or by writing letters, or what not. In this way, between directing people and eating what he likes, he passes the whole day, except that for two or three hours, sometimes indeed seven or eight hours, he attends to his physique, by riding, motoring, playing a game, or indulging in a sport that he has chosen for himself. And at the end of all that, he probably has another bath that has been made ready for him, puts on clean clothes that have been put out for him, goes down to a good dinner that has been cooked for him, smokes, reads, learns, and inwardly digests, or else plays cards, billiards, and acts host silly and sleepy, and so to bed in a clean, warm bed in a clean, fresh room. Is that exaggerated? No, but when you talk of his directing other people, you forget that he is doing what they couldn't. He may be doing what they couldn't, but ordinary directive ability is not born in a man. It is acquired by habit and training. Suppose fortune had reversed them at birth, the gaunt or tryst would by now have it, and the mallory would not. The accident that they were not reversed at birth has given the mallory a thousandfold advantage. It is no joke directing things, mutters Stanley. No work is any joke, but I just put it to you. Simply as work, without taking in the question of reward, would you dream for a minute of swapping your work with the work of one of your workmen? No. Well, neither would a mannering with one of his gaunts. So that, my boy, for work which is intrinsically more interesting and pleasurable, the mannering gets a hundred to a thousand times more money. But all this is rank socialism, my dear fellow. No, rank truth. Now, to take the life of a gaunt, he gets up summer and winter much earlier out of a bed that he cannot afford time or money to keep too clean or warm, in a small room that probably has not a large enough window, into clothes stiff with work and boots stiff with clay. Makes something hot for himself, very likely brings some of it to his wife and children. Goes out, attending to his digestion crudely and without comfort. Works with his hands and feet from half-past six or seven in the morning till half-past five at night, except that twice he stops for an hour or so and eats simple things that he would not altogether have chosen to eat if he could have had his will. He goes home to a tea that has been got ready for him, and has a clean-up without assistance, smokes a pipe of shag, reads a newspaper perhaps two days old, and goes out again to work for his own good in his vegetable patch, or to sit on a wooden bench in an atmosphere of beer and baccy. And so, dead tired, but not from directing other people, he drowses himself to early lying again in his doubtful bed. Is that exaggerated? I suppose not, but he has his compensations. Clean conscience, freedom from worry, fresh air, all the rest of it. I know. Clean conscience granted, but so has your mannering, it would seem. Freedom from worry, yes, except when a pair of boots is wanted, or one of the children is ill. Then he has to make up for lost time with a vengeance. Fresh air, and wet clothes, with a good chance of premature rheumatism. Candidly, which of those two lives demands more of the virtues on which human life is founded? Courage and patience, hardihood and self-sacrifice. And which of two men who have lived those two lives well has most right to the word superior? Stanley dropped the review, and for fully a minute paced the room without reply. Then he said, Felix, you're talking flat revolution. Felix, who, faintly smiling, had watched him up and down, up and down the turkey carpet, answered, Not so. I am by no means a revolutionary person, because with all the goodwill in the world I have been unable to see how upheavals from the bottom, or violence of any sort, is going to equalise these lives or do any good. But I detest humbug, and I believe that so long as you and your mallerings go on blindly dosing yourself with humbug about duty and superiority, so long will you see things as they are not. And until you see things as they are, purge of all that sickening cant, 
ye will none of you really move to make the conditions of life more and ever more just? For mark you, Stanley, I, who do not believe in revolution from the bottom, the more believe that it is up to us in honour to revolutionise things from the top. Ugh, said Stanley, it's all very well, but the more you give, the more they want, till there's no end to it. Felix stared round that room, where indeed one was all body. By George, he said, I've yet to see a beginning. But anyway, if you give in a grudging spirit, or the spirit of a schoolmaster, what can you expect? If you offer out of real good will, so it is taken. And suddenly conscious that he had uttered a constructive phrase, Felix cast down his eyes and added, I'm going to my clean, warm bed. Good night, old man. When his brother had taken up his candlestick and gone, Stanley, uttering a dubious sound, sat down on the lounge, drank deep out of his tumbler, and once more took up his review. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Seven. The next day, Stanley's car, fraught with Felix and a note from Clara, moved swiftly along the grass-bordered roads towards Joyfields. Lying back on the cushioned seat, the warm air flying at his face, Felix contemplated with delight his favourite countryside. Certainly this garden of England was very lovely, its greenness, trees, and large, pied, lazy cattle, its very emptiness of human beings, even, was pleasing. Nearing Joyfields he noted the Mallorings Park and their long Georgian house, carefully fronting south. There, too, was the pond of what village there was, with the usual ducks on it, and three well-remembered cottages in a row, neat and trim, of the old thatched sort, but evidently restored. Out of the door of one of them two young people had just emerged, going in the same direction as the car. Felix passed them and turned to look. Yes, it was they. He stopped the car. They were walking, with eyes straight before them, frowning, and Felix thought, nothing of Todd in either of them, regular Celts. The girl's vivid, open face, crisp, brown, untidy hair, cheeks brimful of colour, thick lips, eyes that looked up and out as a Sky Terrier's eyes looked out of its shagginess. Indeed, her whole figure struck Felix as almost frighteningly vital, and she walked as if she despised the ground she covered. The boy was even more arresting. What a strange, pale, dark face, with its black, uncovered hair, its straight black brows! What a proud, swan's-eyed, thin-lipped, straight-nosed young devil, marching like a very Highlander, though still rather run up from sheer youthfulness! They had come abreast of the car by now, and leaning out he said, "'You don't remember me, I'm afraid.' The boy shook his head. Wonderful eyes he had. But the girl put out her hand. "'Of course. Derrick, it's Uncle Felix.' They both smiled now, the girl friendly, the boy rather drawn back into himself. And feeling strangely small and ill at ease, Felix murmured, "'I'm going to see your father. Can I give you a lift home?' The answer came as he expected. "'No, thanks.' Then, as if to turn it down, the girl added, "'We've got something to do first. You'll find him in the orchard.' She had a ringing voice, full of warmth. Lifting his hat, Felix passed on. They were a couple. Strange, attractive, almost frightening. Kirsty had brought his brother a formidable little brood. Arriving at the cottage, he went up its mossy stones and through the wicket gate. There was little change, indeed, since the days of Clara's visit, save that the beehives had been moved farther out nor did any one answer his knock, and mindful of the girl's words, you'll find him in the orchard, he made his way out among the trees. The grass was long and starred with petals. Felix wandered over it among bees, busy with the apple blossom. At the very end he came on his brother, cutting down a pear tree. Todd was in shirt-sleeves, his brown arms bare almost to the shoulders. How tremendous the fellow was! What resounding and terrific blows he was dealing! Down came the tree, and Todd drew his arm across his brow. This great, burnt, curly-headed fellow was more splendid to look upon than even Felix had remembered, and so well built that not a movement of his limbs was heavy. His cheekbones were very broad and high, his brows thick and rather darker than his bright hair, so that his deep-set, very blue eyes seemed to look out of a thicket. His level white teeth gleamed from under his tawny moustache, 
and his brown, unshaven cheeks and jaw seemed covered with gold powder. Catching sight of Felix, he came forward. Fancy, he said, old Gladstone spending his leisure cutting down trees, of all melancholy jobs. Felix did not quite know how what to answer, so he put his arm within his brother's. Todd drew him towards the tree. "'Sit down,' he said. Then, looking sorrowfully at the pear-tree, he murmured, Seventy years, and down in seven minutes. Now we shall burn it. Well, it had to go. This is the third year. It's had no blossom.' His speech was slow, like that of a man accustomed to think aloud. Felix admired him askance. "'I might live next door,' he thought, for all the notice he's taken of my turning up. "'I came over in Stanley's car,' he said. "'Met your two coming along. Fine couple they are.' "'Ah,' said Todd. And there was something in the way he said it that was more than a mere declaration of pride or of affection. Then he looked at Felix. "'What have you come for, old man?' Felix smiled. Quaint way to put it. "'For a talk.' "'Ah,' said Todd, and he whistled. A largish, well-made dog with a sleek black coat, white underneath, and a black tail, white-tipped, came running up, and stood before Todd with its head rather to one side and its yellow-brown eyes, saying, "'I simply must get at what you're thinking, you know.' "'Go and tell your mistress to come, mistress.' The dog moved his tail, lowered it, and went off. "'A gypsy gave him to me,' said Todd. "'Best dog that ever lived.' "'Everyone thinks that of his own dog, old man.' "'Yes,' said Todd. "'But this is.' "'He looks intelligent.' "'He's got a soul,' said Todd. "'The gypsy said he didn't steal him, but he did.' "'Do you always know when people aren't speaking the truth, then?' "'Yes.' At such a monstrous remark from any other man, Felix would have smiled. But seeing it was Todd, he only asked, "'How?' "'People who aren't speaking the truth look you in the face and never move their eyes.' Some people do that when they're speaking the truth. Yes, but when they aren't, you can see them struggling to keep their eyes straight. A dog avoids your eye when he's something to conceal. A man stares at you. Listen. Felix listened and heard nothing. A wren. And screwing up his lips, Todd emitted a sound. Look. Felix saw on the branch of an apple tree a tiny brown bird with a little beak sticking out and a little tail sticking up. And he thought... Todd's hopeless. That fellow, said Todd softly, has got his nest there just behind us. Again he emitted the sound. Felix saw the little bird move its head with a sort of infinite curiosity and hop twice on the branch. I can't get the hen to do that, Todd murmured. Felix put his hand on his brother's arm. What an arm. Yes, he said, but look here, old man, I really wanted to talk to you. Todd shook his head. "'Wait for her,' he said. Felix waited. Tom was getting awfully eccentric, living this queer, out-of-the-way life with a cranky woman year after year, never reading anything, never seeing anyone but tramps and animals and villagers. And yet, sitting there beside his eccentric brother on that fallen tree, he had an extraordinary sense of rest. It was, perhaps, but the beauty and sweetness of the day, with its dappling sunlight brightening the apple-blossoms, the wind-flowers, the wood-sorrel, and in the blue sky above the fields those clouds so unimaginably white. All the tiny noises of the orchard, too, struck on his ear with a peculiar meaning, a strange fullness, as if he had never heard such sounds before. Todd, who was looking at the sky, said suddenly, "'Are you hungry?' And Felix remembered that they never had any proper meals, but when hungry went to the kitchen, where a wood-fire was always burning, and either heated up coffee and porridge that was already made with boiled eggs, baked potatoes and apples, or devoured bread, cheese, jam, honey, cream, tomatoes, butter, nuts and fruit that were always set out there on a wooden table under a muslin awning. He remembered, too, that they washed up their own bowls and spoons and plates, and having finished, went outside and drew themselves a draught of water. Queer life, and deuced uncomfortable, almost Chinese in its reversal of everything that everyone else was doing. No, he said, I'm not. I am. Here she is. Felix felt his heart beating. Clara was not alone in being frightened of this woman. She was coming through the orchard with the dog, a remarkable-looking woman. Oh, certainly remarkable. She greeted him without surprise, and sitting down close to Todd, said, I'm glad to see you. 
Why did this family somehow make him feel inferior? The way she sat there and looked at him so calmly. Still more the way she narrowed her eyes and wrinkled her lips, as if rather malicious thoughts were rising in her soul. Her hair, as in the way of fine, soft, almost indigo-coloured hair, was already showing threads of silver. Her whole face and figure thinner than he had remembered, but a striking woman still, with wonderful eyes. Her dress, Felix had scanned many a crank in his day, was not so alarming as it had once seemed to Clara. Its coarse-woven, deep blue linen and needle-worked yoke were pleasing to him, and he could hardly take his gaze from the kingfisher blue band or fillet that she wore round that silver-threaded black hair. He began by giving her Clara's note, the wording of which he had himself dictated. "'Dear Kirstine, though we have not seen each other for so long, I am sure you will forgive my writing. It would give us so much pleasure if you and the two children would come over for a night or two while Felix and his young folk are staying with us. It is no use, I fear, to ask Todd, but of course if he would come too, both Stanley and myself would be delighted. Yours cordially, Clara Freeland. She read it, handed it to Todd, who also read it, and handed it to Felix. Nobody said anything, but it was so altogether simple and friendly a note that Felix felt pleased with it, thinking, I expressed that well. Then Todd said, Go ahead, old man. You've got something to say about the youngsters, haven't you? How on earth did he know that? But then Todd had a sort of queer prescience. Well, he brought out with an effort, don't you think it's a pity to embroil your young people in village troubles? We've been hearing from Stanley— Kirstine interrupted in her calm, staccato voice with just the faintest lisp. Stanley would not understand. She put her arm through Todd's, but never removed her eyes from her brother-in-law's face. But possibly, said Felix, but you must remember that Stanley, John, and myself represent ordinary, what should we say, level-headed opinion, with which we have nothing in common, I'm afraid. Felix glanced from her to Todd. The fellow had his head on one side and seemed listening to something in the distance, and Felix felt a certain irritation. It's all very well, he said, but I think you really have got to look at your children's future from a larger point of view. You don't surely want them to fly out against things before they've had a chance to see life for themselves. She answered, The children know more of life than most young people. They've seen it close too. They've seen its realities. They know what the tyranny of the countryside means. Yes, yes, said Felix, but youth is youth. They're not too young to know and feel the truth. Felix was impressed. How those narrowing eyes shone! What conviction in that faintly lisping voice! I'm a fool for my pains, he thought, and only said, Well, what about this invitation, anyway? Yes, it would be just the thing for them at the moment. The words had to Felix a somewhat sinister import. He knew well enough that she did not mean by them what others would have meant. But he said, When shall we expect them? Tuesday, I suppose, would be best for Clara, after her weekend. Is there no chance of you and Todd? She quaintly wrinkled her lips into not quite a smile, and answered, "'Todd to say. Do you hear, Todd?' "'In the meadow. Was there yesterday. First time this year.' Felix slipped his arm through his brother's. "'Quite so, old man.' "'What?' said Todd. "'Ah, oh, let's go in. I'm awfully hungry.' Sometimes, out of a calm sky, a few drops fall, the twigs rustle, and far away is heard the muttering of thunder. The traveller thinks, "'A storm somewhere about.' Then all once more is so quiet and peaceful that he forgets he ever had that thought, and goes on his way careless. So with Felix returning to Beckett in Stanley's car. That woman's face, those two young heathens, the unconscious Todd. There was mischief in the air above that little household. But once more the smooth gliding of the cushioned car, the soft peace of the meadows so permanently at grass, the churches, mansions, cottage embarred among their elms, the slow, plapping flight of the rooks and crows, lulled Felix to quietude, and the faint, far muttering of that thunder died away. Nedda was in the drive when he returned, gazing at a nymph set up there by Clara. It was a good thing, procured from Berlin, well known for sculpture, and beginning to green over already, as though it had been there a long time. A pretty creature, with shoulders drooping, eyes modestly cast down, and a sparrow perching on her head. "'Well, Dad?' "'They're coming.' 
When? On Tuesday, the youngsters only. You might tell me a little about them. But Felix only smiled. His powers of description faltered before that task, and, proud of those powers, he did not choose to subject them to failure. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 8 Not till three o'clock that Saturday did the bigwigs begin to come. Lord and Lady Brito first, from Urn, by car. Then Sir Gerald and Lady Mallering, also by car, from Joyfields. An early afternoon train brought three members of the lower house who liked a round of golf, Colonel Martlett, Mr. Sleesa, and Sir John Fanfer, with their wives. Also Miss Bawtrey, an American who went everywhere, and Mawson, the landscape painter, a short, very heavy man who went nowhere, and that in almost perfect silence, which he afterward avenged. By a train almost sure to bring no one else came literature in public affairs alone, Henry Wiltram, whom some believed to have been the very first to have ideas about the land. He was followed in the last possible train by Cuthcott, the advanced editor, in his habitual hurry, and Lady Maud Oughtred in her beauty. Clara was pleased, and said to Stanley, while dressing, that almost every shade of opinion about the land was represented this weekend. She was not, she said, afraid of anything. If she could keep Henry Wiltram and Cuthcote apart. The House of Commons men would, of course, be all right. Stanley assented. They'll be fed up with talk. But how about Brito? He can sometimes be very nasty. And Cuthcote's been pretty rough on him in his rag. Clara had remembered that, and she was putting Lady Maud on one side of Cuthcote and Mawson on the other, so that he would be quite safe at dinner. And afterward, Stanley must look out. What have you done with Nedda? Stanley asked. "'Given her to Colonel Martlett with Sir John Fanfair on the other side. They both like something fresh.' She hoped, however, to foster a discussion so that they might really get further this weekend. The opportunity was too good to throw away. Ah, Stanley murmured. "'Felix said some very queer things the other night. He too might make ructions.' "'Oh, no,' Clara persisted. "'Felix had too much good taste.' She thought that something might be coming out of this occasion, something, as it were, national, that would bear fruit. And watching Stanley buttoning his braces, she grew enthusiastic. For think how splendidly everything was represented. Brito, with his view that the thing had gone too far, and all the little efforts we might make now were no good, with Canada and those great spaces to outbid anything we could do, though she could not admit that he was right, there was a lot in what he said. He had great gifts, and some day might, who knew? Then there was Sir John. Clara pursued, who was almost the father of the new Tory policy, assist the farmers to buy their own land, and Colonel Martlett representing the older Tory policy of what the devil would happen to the landowners if they did. Secretly, Clara felt sure, he would never go into a lobby to support that. He had said to her, "'Look at my brother James's property. If we bring this policy in and the farmers take advantage, his house might stand there any day without an acre round it.' "'Quite true. It might.' The same might even happen to Beckett. Stanley grunted. Exactly, Clara went on, and that was the beauty of having got the Mannerings. Theirs was such a steady point of view, and she was not sure that they weren't right, and the whole thing really a question of model proprietorship. Yeah, Stanley muttered. Felix will have his knife into that. Clara did not think that mattered. The thing was to get everybody's opinion. Even to Mr. Mawson's would be valuable, if he weren't so terrifically silent, for he must think a lot, sitting all day as he did, painting the land. "'He's a heavy ass,' said Stanley. "'Yes, but Clara did not wish to be narrow. That was why it was so splendid to have got Mr. Sleaser. If anybody knew the radical mind, he did, and he could give full force to what one always felt was at the bottom of it, that the radicals' real supporters were the urban classes, so that their policy must not go too far with the land, for fear of seeming to neglect the towns.' For, after all, in the end it was out of the pockets of the towns that the land would have to be financed, and nobody really could expect the towns to get anything out of it. Stanley paused in the adjustment of his tie. His wife was a shrewd woman. "'Well, you fit it there,' he said. "'Wiltram would give it to him hot on that, though.' "'Of course,' Clara assented. "'And it was magnificent that they got Henry Wiltram, with his idealism and his really heavy corn tax, not caring what happened to the stunted products of the town.' and they really were stunted, for 
for all that the radicals of the half-penny press said, that at all costs we could grow our own food. There was a lot in that. Yes, Stanley muttered, and if he gets on to it, shan't I have a jolly time of it in the smoking-room. I know what Cuthcott's like with his shirt out. Clara's eyes brightened. She was very curious herself to see Mr. Cuthbert with his, that is to hear him expound the doctrine he was always writing up, namely that the land was gone, and, short of revolution, there was nothing for it but garden cities. She had heard he was so cutting and ferocious that he really did seem as if he hated his opponents. She hoped he would get a chance. Perhaps Felix could encourage him. "'What about the women?' Stanley asked suddenly. "'Will they stand a political power? I must think of them a bit.' Clara had. She was taking a farewell look at herself in the faraway mirror through the door into the, her bedroom. It was a mistake, she added, to suppose that women were not interested in the land. Lady Britto was most intelligent, and Mildred Mallory knew every cottage on her estate. Pokes her nose into him often enough, Stanley muttered. Lady Fanfor again, and Mrs. Lisa, and even Hilda Martlett were interested in their husbands, and Miss Portry, of course, interested in everything. As for Maud Uchtred, all talk would be the same to her. She was always weekending. Stanley did not worry. It would be all right. Some real work would get done, some real advance be made. So saying, she turned her fine shoulders twice, once this way and once that, and went out. She had never told even Stanley her ambition that a becket under her aegis should be laid the foundation stone of the real scheme, whatever it might be, that should regenerate the land. Stanley would only have laughed even though it would be bound to make him Lord Freeland when it came to be known some day. To the eyes and ears of Netta that evening at dinner, all was new indeed, and all wonderful. It was not that she was unaccustomed to society or to conversation, for to their house at Hampstead many people came, uttering many words, but both the people and the words were so very different. After the first blush, the first reconnaissance of the two bigwigs between whom she sat, her eyes would stray, and her ears would only half listen to them. Indeed, half her ears, she soon found out, were quite enough to deal with Colonel Martlett and Sir John Fanfer. Across the azaleas she let her glance come now and again to anchor on her father's face, and exchange with him a most enjoyable blink. She tried once or twice to get through to Alan, but he was always eating. He looked very like a young Uncle Stanley this evening. What was she feeling? short, quick stabs of self-consciousness as to how she was looking, a sort of stunned excitement due to sheer noise and the number of things offered to her to eat and drink, keen pleasure in the consciousness that Colonel Martlett and Sir John Fanfer and other men, especially that nice one with the straggly moustache who looks as if he were going to bite, glanced at her when they thought she wasn't looking. If only she had been quite certain that it was not because they thought her too young to be there. She felt a sort of continual exhilaration, that this was the great world, the world where important things were said and done, together with an intense listening expectancy, and a sense most unexpected and almost frightening, that nothing important was being said or would be done. But this she knew to be impotent. On Sunday evenings at home people talked about a future existence, about Nietzsche, Tolstoy, Chinese pictures, post-impressionism, and would suddenly grow hot and furious about peace and Strauss, justice, marriage and de Maupassant, and whether people were losing their souls through materialism, and sometimes one of them would get up and walk about the room. But to-night the only words she could catch were the names of two politicians whom nobody seemed to approve of, except that nice one who was going to bite. Once, very timidly, she asked Colonel Martlett whether he liked Strauss, and was puzzled by his answer. "'Rather, those tales of Hoffman are ripping, don't you think? We go to the opera much?' She could not, of course, know that the thought which instantly rose within her was doing the governing classes a grave injustice, almost all of whom, save Colonel Martlett, knew that the tales of Hoffmann were by one Offenbach. But beyond all things she felt she would never, never learn to talk as they were all talking, so quickly, so continuously, so without caring whether everybody, or only the person they were talking to, heard what they said. She had always felt that what you said was only meant for the person you said it to, but here, in the great world, she must evidently not say anything that was not meant for everybody, and she felt terribly that she could not think of anything of that sort to say. And suddenly she wanted to be alone. That, however, was surely wicked and wasteful, when she ought to be learning such a tremendous lot. And yet what was there to learn? 
and listening just sufficiently to Colonel Martlett, who was telling her how great a man he thought a certain general, she looked almost despairingly at the one who was going to bite. He was quite silent at that moment, gazing at his plate, which was strangely empty. And Edda thought, "'He has jolly wrinkles about his eyes, only they might be heart disease, and I like the colour of his face so nice and yellow, only that might be liver. But I do like him. I wish I'd been sitting next to him. He looks real.' From that thought, of the reality of a man whose name she did not know, she passed suddenly into the feeling that nothing else of this about her was real at all, neither the talk, nor the faces, nor even the things she was eating. It was all a queer, buzzing dream. Nor did that sensation of unreality cease when her aunt began collecting her gloves, and they trooped forth to the drawing-room. There, seated between Mrs. Sleeser and Lady Brito, with Lady Mallering opposite, and Miss Bawtrey leaning over the piano toward them, she pinched herself to get rid of the feeling that, when all these were out of sight of one another, they would each become silent and have on their lips a little bitter smile. Would it be like that up in their bedrooms, or would it be only on her, Netta's own lips, that this little smile would come? It was a question she could not answer, nor could she very well ask it of any of these ladies. She looked them over as they sat there, talking, and felt very lonely. And suddenly her eyes fell on her grandmother. Frances Freeland was seated halfway down the long room in a sandalwood chair, somewhat insulated by a surrounding sea of polished floor. She sat with a smile on her lips, quite still, save for the continual movement of her white hands on her black lap. To her grey hair some lace of chantilly was pinned with a little diamond brooch, and hung behind her delicate but rather long ears, and from her shoulders was depended a silvery garment of stuff that looked like the mail shirt of a fairy, reaching the ground on either side. A tacit agreement had evidently been come to, that she was incapable of discussing the land, or those other subjects such as the French murder, the Russian opera, the Chinese pictures, and the doings of one L, whose fate was just then in the air, so that she sat alone. And Nenda thought, how much more of a lady she looks than anybody here. There's something deep in her to rest on that isn't in the bigwigs. Perhaps it's because she's of a different generation. And, getting up, she went over and sat down beside her on a little chair. Francis Freeland rose at once and said, "'Now, my darling, you can't be comfortable in that tiny chair. You must take mine.' "'Oh, no, Granny, please.' "'Oh, yes, but you must. It's so comfortable, and I've simply been longing to sit in the chair you're in. Now, darling, to please me.' Seeing that a prolonged struggle would follow if she did not get up, Ned arose and changed chairs. "'Do you like these weekends, Granny?' Frances Freeland seemed to draw her smile more resolutely across her face. With her perfect articulation, in which there was, however, no trace of bigwiggery, she answered, "'I think they're most interesting, darling. It's so nice to see new people. Of course, you don't get to know them, but it's very amusing to watch, especially the headdresses.' And sinking her voice, "'Just look at that one with the feather going straight up. Did you ever see such a guy?' And she cackled with a very gentle archness. Gazing at that almost priceless feather, trying to reach God, Nedda felt suddenly how completely she was in her grandmother's little camp, how entirely she disliked big wiggery. Frances Freeland's voice brought her round. "'Do you know, darling, I found the most splendid thing for eyebrows. You just put a little on every night, and it keeps them in perfect order. I must give you my little pot.' "'I don't like grease, Granny.' "'Oh, but this isn't grease, darling. It's a special thing, and you only put on just the tiniest touch.' Diving suddenly into the recesses of something, she produced an exiguous round silver box. Prizing it open, she looked over her shoulder at the bigwigs, then placed her little finger on the contents of the little box, and said very softly, "'You just take the merest touch, and you put it on like that, and it keeps them together beautifully. Let me, nobody'll see.' Quite well understanding that this was all part of her grandmother's passion for putting the best face upon things, and having no belief in her eyebrows, Netta bent forward, but in a sudden flutter of fear lest the bigwigs might observe the operation, she drew back, murmuring, "'Oh, Granny, darling, not just now.' At that moment the men came in, and under cover of the necessary confusion she slipped away into the window. It was pitch black outside, with the moon not yet up. The bloomy, peaceful dark out there, wisteria and early roses clustering in, had but the ghost of colour on their blossoms. 
Nedda took her rose in her fingers, feeling with delight its soft fragility, its coolness against her hot palm. Here in her hand was a living thing, here was a little soul. And out there in the darkness were millions upon millions of other little souls, of little flame-like or coiled-up shapes, alive and true. A voice behind her said, "'Nothing nicer than darkness, is there?' She knew at once it was the one who was going to bite. The voice was proper for him, having a nice, smothery sound. And looking round gratefully, she said, "'Do you like dinner-parties?' It was jolly to watch his eyes twinkle and his thin cheeks puff out. He shook his head and muttered through that straggly moustache. "'You're a niece, aren't you? I know your father. He's a big man.' Hearing those words spoken of her father, Nedda flushed. "'Yes, he is,' she said fervently. Her new acquaintance went on. "'He's got the gift of truth, can laugh at himself as well as others. That's what makes him precious. These hummingbirds here to-night couldn't raise a smile at their own tomfoolery to save their silly souls. He spoke still in that voice of smothery wrath, and Nedda thought, He is nice. They had been talking about the land. He raised his hands and ran them through his palish hair. The land! Heavenly Father! The land! Why, look at that fellow! Nedda looked and saw a man, like Richard Coeur de Lyon in the history books, with a straw-coloured moustache just growing grey. Sir Gerald Mannering, hope he's not a friend of yours. Divine right of landowners to lead the land by the nose. And our friend Brito. Netta followed his eyes, saw a robust, quick-eyed man with a swear of insolence in his dark, clean-shaved face. Because at heart he's such a supercilious ruffian, too cold-blooded to feel, he'll demonstrate that it's no use to feel, waste of valuable time. Ha! Valuable! To act in any direction. And that's a man they believe things of and poor Henry Wiltram with his pathetic, "'Go our own food, maximum use of the land as food producer, and let the rest take care of itself. As if we weren't all long past that feeble individualism. As if in these days of world markets the land didn't stand or fall in this country as a breeding ground of health and stamina and nothing else. Well, well.' "'Aren't they really in earnest, then?' asked Neddy timidly. "'Miss Freeland, this land question is a perfect tragedy.' Are one or two, they all want to make the omelette without breaking eggs. Well, by the time they begin to think of breaking them, mark me, there'll be no eggs to break. We shall all be all park and suburb. The real men on the land, what few are left, are dumb and helpless. And these fellows here, for one reason or another, don't mean business. They'll talk and tinker and top-dress, that's all. Does your father take any interest in this? He could write something very nice. He takes interest in everything, said Nedda. "'Please go on, Mr. Mr.' She was terribly afraid he would suddenly remember that she was too young and stop his nice, angry talk. "'Cuthcott, I'm an editor, but I was brought up on a farm and know something about it. You see, we English are grumblers, snobs to the backbone, want to be something better than we are. And education nowadays is all in the direction of despising what is quiet and humdrum. We never were a stay-at-home lot, like the French. That's at the back of this business.' They may treat it as they like, radicals or Tories, but if they can't get a fundamental change of opinion into the national mind as to what is a sane and profitable life, if they can't work a revolution in the spirit of our education, they'll do no good. There'll be lots of talk and tinkering, tariffs and tommy rot, and underneath the land-bred men dying, dying all the time. No, madam, industrialism and vested interests have got us. Bar the most strenuous national heroism, there's nothing for it now, of the garden city. Then if we were all heroic, the land could still be saved? Mr. Cuthcott smiled. Of course, we might have a European war or something that would shake everything up. But short of that, when was a country ever consciously and homogeneously heroic, except China with its opium? When did it ever deliberately change the spirit of its education, the trend of its ideas? When did it ever, of its own free will, lay its vested interests on the altar? When did it ever say, with a convinced and resolute heart, I will be healthy and simple before anything, I will not let the love of sanity and natural conditions die out of me? When, Miss Freeland, when? And looking so hard at Nedda that he almost winked, he added, You have the advantage of me by thirty years. You'll see what I shall not, the last of the English peasant. Did you ever read Erewhon? where the people broke up their machines. 
It would take almost that sort of national heroism to save what's left of him, even. For answer, Nedda wrinkled her brow horribly. Before her there had come a vision of the old, lame man whose name she had found out was Gaunt, standing on the path under the apple-trees, looking at that little something he had taken from his pocket. Why she thought of him thus suddenly, she had no idea, and she said quickly, "'It's awfully interesting. I do so want to hear about the land. I only know a little about sweated workers, because I see something of them.' Oh, "'That's all of a piece,' said Mr. Cuthcott. "'Not politics at all, but religion. Touches the point of national self-knowledge and faith, the point of knowing what we want to become, and of resolving to become it. Your father will tell you that we have no more idea of that at present than a cat of its own chemical composition. As for these good people here to-night, I don't want to be disrespectful, but if they think they're within a hundred miles of the land question, I'm a—I'm a, I'm a jingo. More I can't say. And, as if to cool his head, he leaned out of the window. Nothing is nicer than darkness, as I said just now, because you can only see the way you must go, instead of a hundred and fifty ways you might. In darkness your soul is something like your own. In daylight, lamplight, moonlight, never. Nedda's spirit gave a jump. He seemed almost at last to be beginning to talk about the things she wanted, above all, to find out. Her cheeks were hot. She clenched her hands and said resolutely, "'Mr. Cuthcott, do you believe in God?' Mr. Cuthcott made a queer, deep little noise. It was not a laugh, however, and it seemed as if he knew she could not bear him to look at her just then. "'Ah,' he said, "'everyone does that, according to their natures. Some call God it, some him, some her nowadays. That's all. You might as well ask, do I believe that I'm alive?' "'Yes,' said Nedda. "'But which do you call God?' As she asked that, he gave a wriggle, and it flashed through her, he must think me an awful enfant terrible. His face peered round at her, queer and pale and puffy, with nice straight eyes, and she added hastily, "'It isn't a fair question, is it? Only you talked about darkness, and the only way, so I thought.' "'Quite a fair question. My answer is, of course, all three. But the point is, rather, does one wish to make even an attempt to define God to oneself? Frankly, I don't.' I am content to feel that there is in one some kind of instinct towards perfection that one will still feel, I hope, when the lights are going out. Some kind of honour forbidding one to let go and give up. That's all I've got. I really don't know that I want more. Nedda clasped her hands. I like that, she said. Only, what is perfection, Mr. Cuthcott? Again he emitted that deep little sound. Ah, he repeated, what is perfection? Awkward, that, isn't it? Is it... Then I rushed the words out. Is it always to be sacrificing yourself, or is it... Is it always to be... To be expressing yourself? To some, one. To some, the other. To some, half one, half the other. But which is it to me? Ah, that you've got to find out for yourself. There's a sort of metronome inside us. Wonderful, self-adjusting little machine. Most delicate bit of mechanism in the world people call it conscience, that records the proper beat of our tempos. I guess that's all we have to go by. Nedda said breathlessly, Yes, and it's frightfully hard, isn't it? Exactly, Mr. Cuthcott answered. That's why people devise religions and other ways of having the thing done second-hand. We all object to trouble and responsibility if we can possibly avoid it. Where do you live? In Hampstead. "'Your father must be a standby, isn't he?' "'Oh, yes, Dad's splendid. "'And you see, I am a good deal younger than he. "'There was just one thing I was going to ask you. "'Are these very big wigs?' "'Mr. Cuthbert turned to the room "'and let his screwed-up glance wander. "'He looked just then particularly "'if he were going to bite. "'If you take them at their own valuation, yes. "'If at the country's, so-so. "'If at mine, ha! "'I know what you'd like to ask.' Should I be a big wig in their estimation? Not I. As you knock about, Miss Freeland, you'll find out one thing. All bigwiggery is founded on scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Seriously, there are only tenpenny ones. But the mischief is that in the matter of the land, the men who really are in earnest are precious scarce. Nothing short of a rising such as there was in 1832 would make the land question real, even for the moment. Not that I want to see one, God forbid. 
Those poor doomed devils were treated worse than dogs, and would be again. Before Nedda could pour out questions about the rising in 1832, Stanley's voice said, "'Crawford, I want to introduce you.' Her new friend screwed his eyes up tighter, and muttering something, put out his hand to her. "'Thank you for our talk. I hope we shall meet again. Any time you want to know anything, I'll be only too glad. Good night.' She felt the squeeze of his hand, warm and dry, but rather soft, as of a man who uses a pen too much. Saw him following her uncle across the room, with his shoulders a little hunched, as if preparing to inflict and ward off blows. And with the thought, he must be jolly when he gives them one, she turned once more to the darkness, than which she had said there was nothing nicer. It smelled of new-mown grass, was full of little shiverings of leaves, and all coloured like the bloom of a black grape and her heart felt soothed. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 9 When I first saw Derrick, I thought I should never feel anything but shy and hopeless. In four days, only in four days... The whole world is different, and yet if it hadn't been for that thunderstorm I shouldn't have got over being shy in time. He has never loved anybody, nor have I. I can't often be like that, it makes it solemn. There's a picture somewhere, not a good one I know, of a young Highlander being taken away by soldiers from his sweetheart. Derrick is fiery and wild and shy and proud and dark, like the man in that picture. That last day along the hills, along and along, with the wind in our faces, I could have walked forever, and then joy fields at the end. Their mother's wonderful, I'm afraid of her. But Uncle Todd is a perfect dear. I never saw anyone before who noticed so many things that I didn't, and nothing that I did. I'm sure he has in him what Mr. Cuthbert said we were all losing, the love of simple, natural conditions. And then, the moment, when I stood with Derrick at the top of the orchard to say good-bye. The field below, covered with those moony white flowers, and the cows all dark and sleepy. The holy feeling down there was wonderful, and in the branches over our heads too, and the velvety starry sky, and the dewiness against one's face, and the great broad silence. It was all worshipping something, and I was worshipping, worshipping happiness. I was happy, and I think he was. Perhaps I shall never be so happy again. When he kissed me, I didn't think the whole world had so much happiness in it. I know now that I'm not cold a bit. I used to think I was. I believe I could go with him anywhere and do anything he wanted. What would Dad think? Only the other day I was saying I wanted to know everything. One only knows through love. It's love that makes the world all beautiful, makes it like those pictures that seem to be wrapped in gold, makes it like a dream. No, not like a dream. Like a wonderful tune. I suppose that's glamour, a goldeny, misty, lovely feeling, as if my soul were wandering about with his, not in my body at all. I wanted to go on and on wandering. Oh, I don't want it back in my body, all hard and inquisitive and aching. I shall never know anything so lovely as loving him and being loved. I don't want anything more, nothing. Stay with me, please, happiness, don't go away and leave me. They frighten me, though. He frightens me their idealism, wanting to do great things and fight for justice. If only I'd been brought up more like that. But everything's been so different. It's their mother, I think, even more than themselves. I seem to have grown up just looking on at life as at a show, watching it, thinking about it, trying to understand, not living it at all. I must get over that. I will. I believe I can tell the very moment I began to love him. It was in the schoolroom the second evening. Sheen and I were sitting there just before dinner, and he came, in a rage, looking splendid. That footman put out everything just as if I were a baby, asking me for suspenders to fasten on my socks, hung the things on a chair in order, as if I couldn't find out for myself what to put on first, turned the tongues of my shoes out, curled them over. Then Derrick looked at me and said, "'Do they do that for you?' And poor old Gaunt, who's sixty-six and lame, has three shillings a week to buy him everything. Just think of that!' "'If we have the pluck of flies—' "'And he clenched his fists. "'But Sheila got up, looked hard at me, and said, "'That'll do, Derrick.' 
Then he put his hand on my arm and said, "'It's only Cousin Nedda.' I began to love him then, and I believe he saw it because I couldn't take my eyes away. But it was when Sheila sang The Red Saraphan after dinner that I knew for certain. The Red Saraphan, it's a wonderful song, all space and yearning, and yet such calm. It's the song of the soul, and he was looking at me while she sang. How can he love me? I am nothing, no good for anything. Adam calls him a run-up kid, all legs and wings. Sometimes I hate Alan. He's conventional and stodgy. The funny thing is that he admires Sheila. She'll wake him up. She'll stick pins into him. No, I don't want Alan hurt. I want everyone in the world to be happy, happy as I am. The next day was a thunderstorm. I never saw lightning so near, and didn't care a bit. If he were struck, I knew I should be. That made it all right. When you love, you don't care, if only that something must happen to you both. When it was over, and we came out from behind the stack and walked home through the fields, all the beasts looked at us as if we were new and had never been seen before. And the air was ever so sweet, and that long red line of cloud low down in the purple, and the elm trees so heavy and almost black. He put his arm round me, and I let him. It seemed an age to wait till they come to stay with us next week. If any mother likes them, and I can go and stay at Joyfield's, will she like them? It's all so different to what it would be if they were ordinary. But if he were ordinary, I shouldn't love him. It's because there's nobody like him. That isn't a loverish fancy. You only have to look at him against Alan or Uncle Stanley, or even Dad. Everything he does is so different. The way he walks, and the way he stands drawn back into himself, like a stag, and looks out as if he were burning and smouldering inside. Even the way he smiles. Dad asked me what I thought of him. That was only the second day. I thought he was too proud then. And Dad said, he ought to be in a Highland regiment. Pity, great pity. He is a fighter, of course. I don't like fighting, but if I'm not ready to, he'll stop loving me, perhaps. I've got to learn. Oh, darkness out there, help me. And stars, help me. Oh, God, make me brave, and I will believe in you forever. If you are the spirit that grows in things in spite of everything, until they're like the flowers, so perfect that we laugh and sing at their beauty, grow in me, too, make me beautiful and brave, then I shall be fit for him, alive or dead, and that's all I want. Every evening I shall stand in spirit with him at the end of that orchard in the darkness, under the trees, above the white flowers and the sleepy cows, and perhaps I shall feel him kiss me again. I'm glad I saw that old man gaunt. It makes what they feel more real to me. He showed me that poor labourer Trist, too, the one who mustn't marry his wife's sister, or have her staying in the house without marrying her. Why should people interfere with others like that? It does make your blood boil. Denick and Sheila have been brought up to be in sympathy with the poor and oppressed. If they'd lived in London, they would have been even more furious, I expect. And it's no use my saying to myself, I don't know the labourer, I don't know his hardships, because he's really just the country heart for what I do know and see here in London, when I don't hide my eyes. One talk showed me how desperately they feel, at night in Sheila's room when we'd gone up, just we four. Alan began it. They didn't want to, I could see, but he was criticising what some of those bigwigs had said. The varsity makes boys awfully conceited. It was such a lovely night. We were all in the big, long window. A little bat kept flying past, and behind the copper beach the moon was shining on the lake. Derrick sat in the window-sill, and when he moved, he touched me. To be touched by him gives me a warm shiver all through. I could hear him gritting his teeth at what Alan said. Frightfully sententious, just like a newspaper. We can't go into land reform from feeling, we must go into it from reason. Then Derrick broke out. Walk through this country as we've walked. See the pigsties the people live in. See the water they drink. See the tiny patches of ground they have. See the way their roofs let in the rain. See their peaky children. See their patience and their hopelessness. See them working day in and day out and coming on the parish at the end. See all that, and then talk about reason. Reason, it's the coward's excuse, and the rich man's excuse for doing nothing. It's the excuse of the man who takes jolly good care not to see, for fear that he may come to feel. Reason never does anything. It's too reasonable. 
The thing is to act. Then perhaps Weasel would be jolted into doing something. But she'd have touched his arm, and he stopped very suddenly. She doesn't trust us. I shall always be being pushed away from him by her. He's just twenty, and I shall be eighteen in a week. Could we marry now, at once? Then, whatever happened, I couldn't be cut off from him. If I could tell Dad and ask him to help me. But I can't. It seems desecration to talk about it, even to Dad. All the way up in the train today, coming back home, I was struggling not to show anything. Though it's hateful to keep things from Dad. Love alters everything. It melts up the whole world and makes it afresh. Love is the sun of our spirits, and it's the wind, and the rain too. But I won't think of that. I wonder if he's told Aunt Kirstein. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 10 While Nedda sat long past midnight, writing her heart out in her little white lilac-curtained room of the old house above the Spaniard's Road, Derrick, of whom she wrote, was walking along the Malvern Hills, hurrying upward in the darkness. The stars were his companions. Though he was no poet, having rather the fervid temper of the born swordsman that expresses itself in physical ecstasies, he comes straight out from a stormy midnight talk with Sheila. What was he doing? had been the burden of her cry, falling in love just at this moment when they wanted all their wits and all their time and strength for this struggle with the Mannerings. It was foolish, it was weak, with a sweet, soft sort of girl who could be no use. Hotly had answered, what busy was it of hers? As if one fell in love when one wished. She didn't know, her blood didn't run fast enough. Sheila had retorted, I've more blood in my big toe than Nedda in all her body. A lot of use you'll be with your heart mooning up in London. And, crouched together on the end of her bed, gazing fixedly up at her through her hair, she had chanted mockingly, "'Here we go gathering wolves and stars, wolves and stars, wolves and stars.' He had not deigned to answer, but had gone out, furious with her, striding over the dark fields, scrambling his way through the hedges toward the high loom of the hills. Up on the short grass in the cooler air, with nothing between him and those swarming stars, he lost his rage. It never lasted long. Hers was more enduring. With the innate lordliness of a brother, he already put it down to jealousy. Sheila was hurt that he should want any one but her, as if his love for Nedda would make any difference to their resolution to get justice for Trist and the Gaunts, and show those landed tyrants one for all that they could not ride roughshod. Nedda, with her dark eyes so quick and clear, so loving when they looked at him. Nedda, soft and innocent, the touch of whose lips had turned his heart to something strange within him and wakened such feelings of chivalry. Nedda, to see whom for half a minute he felt he would walk a hundred miles. This boy's education had been administered solely by his mother till he was fourteen, and she had brought him up on mathematics, French, and heroism. His extensive reading of history had been focused on the personality of heroes, chiefly knights errant and revolutionaries. He had carried the worship of them to the agricultural college where he had spent four years, and a rather rough time there had not succeeded in knocking romance out of him. He had found that you could not have such beliefs comfortably without fighting for them, and though he ended his career with the reputation of a rebel and a champion of the weak, he had had to earn it. To this day he still fed himself on stories of rebellions and fine deeds. The figures of Spartacus, Montrose, Hofer, Garibaldi, Hamden and John Nicholson were more real to him than the people among whom he lived, though he had learned never to mention, especially not to the matter-of-fact Sheila, his encompassing cloud of heroes. But when he was alone he pranced a bit with them, and promised himself that he too would reach to the stars. So you may sometimes see a little grave boy walking through a field, unwatched as he believes, suddenly fling his feet in his head every which way. An active nature, romantic without being dreamy and book-loving, is not too prone to the attacks of love. Such a one is likely to survive unscathed to a maturer age. But Nedda had seduced him, partly by the appeal of her touchingly manifest love and admiration, and chiefly by her eyes, 
through which he seemed to see such a loyal and loving little soul looking. She had that indefinable something which lovers know that they can never throw away, and he had at once made of her, secretly, the crown of his active romanticism, the lady waiting for the spoils of his lance. Queer is the heart of a boy, strange its blending of reality and idealism. Climbing at a great pace, he reached Morven Beacon just as it came dawn, and stood there on the top, watching. He had not much ascetic sense, but he had enough to be impressed by the slow paling of the stars over space that seemed infinite, so little were its dreamy confines visible in the May morning haze, where the quivering crimson flags and spears of sunrise were forging up in a march upon the sky. That vision of the English land at dawn, wide and mysterious, hardly tallied with Mr. Cuthcote's view of a future dedicated to park and garden city. While Derrick stood there gazing, the first lark soared up and began its ecstatic praise. Save for that song, silence possessed all the driven dark right out to the Severn and the sea, and the fastnesses of the Welsh hills, and the Rekin away in the north, a black point in the grey. For a moment dark and light hovered and clung together. Would victory wing back into night, or on into day? Then, as the town is taken, all was over in one overmastering rush, and light proclaimed. Derrick tightened his belt, and took a bee-line down over the slippery grass. He meant to reach the cottage of the labourer Trist before that early bird was away to the fields. He meditated as he went. Bob Trist was all right, if they only had a dozen or two like him. A dozen or two whom they could trust, and who would trust each other, and stand firm to form the nucleus of a strike, which could be timed for hay-harvest. What slaves these labourers still were! If any they could be relied on, if any they would stand together! Slavery! It was slavery! so long as they could be turned out of their homes at will in this fashion. His rebellion against the conditions of their lives, above all against the manifold petty tyrannies that he knew they underwent, came from use of his eyes and ears in daily contact with the class among whom he had been more or less brought up. In sympathy with, and yet not of them, he had the queer privilege of feeling their slights as if they were his own, together with feelings of protection, and even of contempt that they should let themselves be slighted. He was near enough to understand how they must feel, not near enough to understand why, feeling as they did, they did not act as he would have acted. In truth, he knew no better than he should. He found Trist washing at his pump. In the early morning light the big labourer's square, stubborn face, with its strange, dog-like eyes, had a sodden, hungry, lost look. Cutting short ablutions that certainly were never protracted, he welcomed Derrick, and motioned him to pass into the kitchen. The young man went in, and perched himself on the window-sill beside a pot of bridal wreath. The cottage was one of the Mallorings, and recently repaired. A little fire was burning, and a teapot of stewed tea sat there beside it. Four cups and spoons and some sugar were put out on a deal table, for Trist was in fact brewing the morning draught of himself and children, who still lay abed upstairs. The sight made Derrick shiver and his eyes darken. He knew the full significance of what he saw. "'Did you ask him again, Bob?' "'Yes, I asked him.' "'What did he say?' "'Said his orders were plain. So long as you live there, he says, alone of yourself alone, you can't have her come back.' "'Did you say the children wanted looking after badly? Did you make it clear? Did you say Mrs. Triss wished it before she—' "'I said that.' "'What did he say then?' "'Sorry for you, my lad, but them's me lady's orders, and I can't go contrary. "'I don't wish to go into things,' he says. "'You know better than I how far tis gone when she was here before. "'But seeing as my lady don't never give in to deceased wife's sister Marion, "'if she comes back, tis certain to be the other thing. "'So that won't do neither. You go elsewhere,' he says. "'Having spoken thus at length, Triss lifted the teapot "'and poured out the dark tea into the three cups. "'Will you have some, sir?' Derrick shook his head. Taking the cups, Trist departed up the narrow stairway, and Derrick remained motionless, staring at the bridal wreath, till the big man came down again, and, retiring into a far corner, sat sipping at his own cup. "'Bob,' said the boy suddenly, "'do you like being a dog, put to what company your master wishes?' 
Trist set his cup down, stood up and crossed his thick arms. The swift movement from that stolid creature had in it something sinister, but he did not speak. "'Do you like it, Bob?' "'I'll not say what I feel, Mr. Derrick. That's for me. What I does be for others, perhaps.' And he lifted his strange, lowering eyes to Derrick's. For a full minute the two stared. Then Derrick said, "'Look out, then. Be ready.' And getting off the sill, he went out. On the bright, slimy surface of the pond, three ducks were quietly revelling in that hour before man and his damned soul the dog rose to put the fear of God into them. In the sunlight against the green duckweed, their whiteness was truly marvellous. Difficult to believe that they were not white all through. Passing the three cottages, in the last of which the Gaunts lived, he came next to his own home, but did not turn in and made on toward the church. It was a very little one, very old, and had for him a curious fascination, never confessed to man or beast. To his mother, and Sheila, more intolerant, as became women, that little lichened greystone building was the very emblem of hypocrisy, of a creed preached, not practised. To his father it was nothing, for it was not alive, and any tramp, dog, bird, or fruit tree meant far more. But in Derrick it roused a peculiar feeling, such as a man might have gazing at the shores of a native country, out of which he had been thrown for no fault of his own, a yearning deeply muffled up in pride and resentment. Not infrequently he would come and sit brooding on the grassy hillock just above the churchyard. Church-going, with its pageantry, its tradition, dogma, and demand for blind devotion, would have suited him very well, if only blind devotion to his mother had not stood across that threshold. He could not bring himself to bow to that which viewed his rebellious mother as lost. And yet the deep fibres of heredity from her papistic highland ancestors, and from old pious Mortons, drew him constantly to this spot at times when no one would be about. It was his enemy, this little church, the fold of all the instincts and all the qualities against which he had been brought up to rebel, the very home of patronage and property and superiority, the school where his friends the labourers were taught their place. And yet it had that queer, ironical attraction for him. In some such sort had his pet hero, Montrose, rebelled, and then been drawn, despite himself, once more to the side of that against which he had taken arms. While he leaned against the rail, gazing at that ancient edifice, he saw a girl walk into the churchyard at the far end, sit down on a gravestone, and begin digging a little hole in the grass with the toe of her boot. She did not seem to see him, and at his ease he studied her face, one of those broad, bright English country faces, with deep-set rogue eyes and red, thick, soft lips, smiling on little provocation. In spite of her disgrace, in spite of the fact that she was sitting on her mother's grave, she did not look depressed. And Derrick thought, Wilmot Gaunt is the jolliest of them all, he isn't a bit a bad girl, as they say. It's only that she must have fun. If they drive her out of here, she'll still want fun wherever she is. She'll go to a town, and end up like those girls I saw in Bristol. And the memory of those night girls, with their rouged faces and cringing boldness, came back to him with horror. He went across the grass toward her. She looked round as he came, and her face livened. "'Well, Wilmot, you're an early bird, Mr. Derrick.' "'Haven't been to bed.' "'Oh! Been up more than Beacon to see the sunrise. "'You're tired, I expect.' "'No. Must be fine up there. You see a long ways from there. "'Near to London, I should think. "'Do you know London, Mr. Derrick?' "'No. They say it is a funny place, too.' Her rogue eyes gleamed from under a heavy frown. "'It would not be all do this and do that, and you bad girl and you little assy in London.' They say there's room for more than one sort of girl there. All towns are beastly places, Wilmot. Again her rogue's eyes gleamed. I don't know so much about that, Mr. Derrick. I'm going where I won't be chivied about and pointed at, like what I am here. Your dad stuck to you. You ought to stick to him. Ah, dad. He's losing his place for me, but that don't stop his tongue at home. Tis no use to nag me, nag me. "'Suppose one of my lady's daughters had a bit of fun. "'They say the Zotzers do. I've heard tales. "'There'd be none coming to chase her out of her home. 
"'No, my girl, you can't live here no more endangering the young men. "'You go away. Best for you's where they'll teach you to behave. "'Go on, out with you. I don't care where you go, but you just go.' "'Tis that the girls are all pats of butter. "'Same square, same pattern on it, same weight and all.' Derrick had come closer. He put his hand down and gripped her arm. Her eloquence dried up before the intentness of his face, and she just stared up at him. "'Now look here, Wilmot. You promise me not to scoot without letting us know. We'll get you a place to go to. Promise.' A little sheepishly, the rogue girl answered, "'I promise. Only I'm going.' Suddenly she dimpled and broke into her broad smile. "'Mr. Derrick, do you know what they say? They say you're in love. You were seen in the orchard. Ah, tis all right for you and her. But if any one kiss and hug me, I gotta go.' Derrick drew back among the graves, as if he'd been struck with a whip. She looked up at him with coaxing sweetness. "'Don't you mind me, Mr. Derrick, and don't you stay here, neither. If they saw you here with me, they'd say, "'Oh, look, endangering another young man, poor young man.' "'Good morning, Mr. Derrick.' The rogue eyes followed him gravely, then once more began examining the grass, and the toe of her boot again began kicking a little hole. But Derrick did not look back. End of chapter 10《Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 11. It is in the nature of men and angels to pursue with death such birds as are uncommon, such animals as are rare. And society had no use for one like Todd, so uncut to its pattern as to be practically unconscious of its existence. Not that he had deliberately turned his back on anything. He had merely begun as a very young man to keep bees. The better to do that, he had gone on to the cultivation of flowers and fruit, together with just enough farming as kept his household in vegetables, milk, butter and eggs. Living thus among insects, birds, cows and the peace of trees, he had become queer. His was not a very reflective mind. It distilled but slowly certain large conclusions and followed intently the minute happenings of his little world. To him a bee, a bird, a flower, a tree was well nigh as interesting as a man. Yet men, women, and especially children took to him, as one takes to a Newfoundland dog, because, though capable of anger, he seemed incapable of contempt, and to be endowed with a sort of permanent wonder at things. Then, too, he was good to look at, which counts for more than a little in the scales of our affections. Indeed, the slight air of absence in his blue eyes was not chilling, as is that which portends a wandering of its owner on his own business. People recognised that it meant some bee or other in that bonnet, or elsewhere, some sound or scent or sight of life, suddenly perceived, always of life. He had often been observed gazing with peculiar gravity at a dead flower, bee, bird or beetle, and, if spoken to at such a moment, would say, Gone! touching a wing or petal with his finger. To conceive of what happened after death did not apparently come within the few large conclusions of his reflective powers. That quaint grief of his in the presence of the death of things that were not human had, more than anything, fostered a habit among the gentry and clergy of the neighbourhood of drawing up the mouth when they spoke of him and slightly raising the shoulders. For the cottagers, to be sure, his eccentricity consisted rather in his being a gentleman, yet neither eating flesh, drinking wine, nor telling them how they ought to behave themselves, together with the way he would sit down on anything and listen to what they had to tell him, without giving them the impression that he was proud of himself for doing so. In fact, it was the extraordinary impression he made of listening and answering without wanting anything, either for himself or for them, that they could not understand. How on earth it came about that he did not give them advice about their politics, religion, morals or monetary states, was to them a never-ending mystery, and though they were too well-bred to shrug their shoulders, there did lurk in their dim minds the suspicion that the good gentleman, as they called him, was a tiddly bit off. He had, of course, done many practical little things towards helping them and their beasts, but always, as it seemed, by accident, so that they could never make up their minds afterward whether he remembered having done them, which, in fact, he probably did not. And this seemed to them perhaps the most damning fact of all about his being, well, about his being 
not quite all there. Another worrying habit he had, too, that of apparently not distinguishing between them and any tramps or strangers who might happen along and come across him. This was, in their eyes, undoubtedly a fault, for the village was, after all, their village, and he, as it were, their property. To crown all, there was a story, full ten years old now, which had lost nothing in the telling, of his treatment of a cattle drover. To the village it had an eerie look, that windmill-like rage let loose upon a man who, after all, had only been twisting a bullock's tail and running a spiked stick into its softer parts as any drover might. People said, the postman and the wagoner had seen the business, raconteurs born, so that the tail had perhaps lost nothing, that he had positively roared as he came leaping down into the lane upon the man, a stout and thick-set fellow, taking him up like a baby, popped him into a furze bush and held him there. People said that his own bare arms had been pricked to the very shoulder from pressing the drover down into that uncompromising shrub, and the man's howls had pierced the very heavens. The postman, to this day, would tell how the mere recollection of seeing it still made him sore all over. Of the words assigned to Todd on this occasion, the mildest, and probably most true, were, "'By the Lord God, if you treat a beast like that again, I'll cut your liver out, you half-hearted sweep!' The incident, which had produced a somewhat marked effect in regard to the treatment of animals all round that neighbourhood, had never been forgotten, nor, in a sense, forgiven. In conjunction with the extraordinary peace and mildness of his general behaviour, it had endowed Todd with mystery, and people, especially simple folk, cannot bring themselves to feel quite at home with mystery. Children only, to whom everything is so mysterious that nothing can be, treated him as he treated them, giving him their hands with confidence. But children, even his own, as they grew up, began to have a little of the village feeling toward Todd. His world was not theirs, and what exactly his world was they could not grasp. Possibly it was the sense that they partook of his interest and affection too much on a level with any other kind of living thing that might happen to be about, which discomforted their understanding. They held him, however, in a certain reverence. That early morning he had already done a good two hours' work in connection with broad beans, of which he grew perhaps the best in the whole county, and had knocked off for a moment to examine a spider's web. This marvellous creation, which the dew had visited and clustered over as stars over the firmament, was hung on the gate of the vegetable garden, and the spider, a large and active one, was regarding Todd with the misgiving natural to its species. Intensely still Todd stood, absorbed in contemplation of that bright and dusty miracle. Then, taking up his hoe again, he went back to the weeds that threatened his broad beans. Now and again he stopped to listen, or to look at the sky, as is the way of husbandmen, thinking of nothing, enjoying the peace of his muscles. "'Please, sir, father's got into a fit again!' Two little girls were standing in the lane below. The elder, who had spoken in that small, anxious voice, had a pale little face with pointed chin. Her hair, the colour of overripe corn, hung fluffy on her thin shoulders. Her flower-like eyes were something motherly in them already, with the same hue as her pale blue, almost clean, overall. She had her smaller, chubbier sister by the hand, and having delivered her message, stood still, gazing up at Todd as one might at God. Todd dropped his hoe. "'Biddy, come with me. Susie, go and tell Mrs. Freeland, or Miss Sheeler.' He took the frail little hand of the elder Trist, and ran. They ran at the child's pace, the one so very massive, the other such a whiff of flesh and blood. "'Did you come at once, Biddy?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Where was he taken?' "'In the kitchen, just as I was cooking breakfast.' "'Ah, is it a bad one?' "'Yes, sir, awful bad. He's all for me.' "'What did you do for it?' "'Susie and me turned him over, and Biddy's seeing he don't get his tongue down his throat. That what you told us?' We ran to you. Susie was frightened, he hollered so. Past the three cottages, whence a woman at a window stared in amaze to see that queer couple running, past the pond where the ducks, whiter than ever in the brightening sunlight, dived and circled carelessly into the tryst kitchen. There, on the brick floor, lay the distressful man, already struggling back out of epilepsy, while his little frightened son sat manfully beside him. Towels and hot water, Biddy! 
with extraordinary calm rapidity the small creature brought what might have been two towels, a basin, and the kettle, and in silence she and Todd steeped his forehead. "'I look better, Biddy. "'You don't look so funny now, sir.' Picking up that form, almost as big as his own, Todd carried it up impossibly narrow stairs and laid it on a dishevelled bed. "'Poor! Open the window, Biddy!' The small creature opened what there was of window. "'Now go down and heat two bricks and wrap them in something and bring them up.' Trist's boots and socks removed, Todd rubbed the large warped feet. While doing this, he whistled, and the little boy crept upstairs and squatted in the doorway to watch and listen. The morning air overcame with its sweetness the natural odour of that small room, and a bird or two went flirting past. The small creature came back with the bricks, wrapped in petticoats of her own, and placing them against the soles of her father's feet, she stood gazing at Todd, for all the world like a little mother dog with puppies. "'You can't go to school today, Biddy.' "'Is Susie and Billy to go?' "'Yes, there's nothing to be frightened of now. It'll be nearly all right by evening. But someone shall stay with you.' At this moment Triss lifted his hand, and the small creature went and stood beside him, listening to the whispering that emerged from his thick lips. "'Father says I'm to thank you, please.' "'Yes. Have you had your breakfast?' The small creature and her smaller brother shook their heads. "'Go down and get them.' Whispering and twisting back, they went, and by the side of the bed Todd sat down. In Triss's eyes was that same look of dog-like devotion he had bent on Derrick earlier that morning. Todd stared out of the window and gave the man's big hand a squeeze. And what did he think, watching a lime tree outside and the sunlight through its foliage painting bright the room's newly whitewashed wall, already grey spotted with damp again, watching the shadows of the leaves playing in that sunlight? Almost cruel, that lovely shadow game of outside life so full and joyful, so careless of man and suffering. Too gay almost, too alive. And what did he think? watching the chase and dart of shadow on shadow, as of grey butterflies fluttering swift to the sack of flowers, while beside him on the bed the big labourer lay. When Kirsten and Sheila came to relieve him of that vigil, he went downstairs. There, in the kitchen, Biddy was washing up, and Susie and Biddy putting on their boots for school. They stopped to gaze at Todd, feeling in his pockets, for they knew that things sometimes happened after that. Today there came out two carrots, some lumps of sugar, some cord, a bill, a pruning knife, a bit of wax, a bit of chalk, three flints, a pouch of tobacco, two pipes, a matchbox with a single match in it, a sixpence, a necktie, a stick of chocolate, a tomato, a handkerchief, a dead bee, an old razor, a bit of gauze, some tow, a stick of caustic, a reel of cotton, a needle, no thimble, two dock leaves, and some sheets of yellowish paper. He separated from the rest the sixpence, the dead bee, and what was edible. And in delighted silence the three little trysts gazed, till Biddy, with the tip of one wet finger, touched the bee. Not good to eat, Biddy. At those words, one after the other, cautiously, the three little trysts smiled. Finding that Todd smiled too, they broadened, and Biddy burst into chuckles. Then, clustering in the doorway, grasping the edibles and the sixpence, and consulting with each other, they looked long after his big figure passing down the road. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of the Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twelve. Still later, the same morning, Derrick and Sheila moved slowly up the Mallorings' well-swept drive. Their lips were set, as though they had spoken the last word before battle, and an old cock pheasant running into the bushes close by rose with a whirr and skimmed out towards his covert, scared, perhaps, by something uncompromising in the footsteps of those two. Only when actually under the shelter of the porch, which some folk thought enhanced the old Greek temple effect of the Mallorings' house, Derrick broke through that taciturnity. "'What if they won't? Wait and see, and don't lose your head, Derrick.' The man who stood there when the door opened was tall, grave, wore his hair in powder, and waited without speech. 
"'Will you ask Sir Gerald and Lady Mannering "'if Miss Freeland and Mr. Derrick Freeland could see them, please? "'And will you say the matter is urgent?' "'The man bowed, left them, and soon came back. "'My lady will see you, miss. "'Sir Gerald is not in. "'This way.' Past the statuary, flowers, and antlers of the hall, they traversed a long, cool corridor, and through a white door entered a white room, not very large, and very pretty. Two children got up as they came in, and flapped out past them like young partridges, and Lady Mallering rose from her writing-table and came forward, holding out her hand. The two young Freelands took it gravely. For all their hostility they could not withstand the feeling that she would think them terrible young prigs if they simply bowed and they looked steadily at one with whom they had never before been at quite such close quarters. Lady Mannering, who had originally been the Honourable Mildred Killery, a daughter of Viscount Silport, was tall, slender, and not very striking, with very fair hair going rather grey. Her expression in repose was pleasant, a little anxious. Only by her eyes was the suspicion awakened that she was a woman of some character. They had that peculiar look of belonging to two worlds, so often to be met with in English eyes, a look of self-denying aspiration, tinctured with the suggestion that denial might not be confined to self. In a quite friendly voice she said, "'Can I do anything for you?' And while she waited for an answer, her glance travelled from face to face of the two young people, with a certain curiosity. After a silence of several seconds, Sheila answered, "'Not for us, thank you. For others you can.' Lady Mallering's eyebrows rose a little, as if there seemed to her something rather unjust in those words, for others. "'Yes,' she said. Sheila, whose hands were clenched and whose face had been fiery red, grew suddenly almost white. "'Lady Marilyn, would you please let the Gaunts stay in their cottage, and Trist's wife's sister come to live with the children and him?' Lady Mallory raised one hand. The motion, quite involuntary, ended at the tiny cross on her breast. She said quietly, "'I'm afraid you don't understand.' "'Yes,' said Sheila, still very pale. "'We understand quite well. "'We understand that you are acting in what you believe to be the interests of morality. "'All the same, won't you? Do.' "'I'm very sorry, but I can't. "'May we ask why?' Lady Mallory started and transferred her glance to Derrick. "'I don't know,' she said with a smile, "'that I'm obliged to account for my actions to you two young people.' "'Besides, you must know why quite well.' Sheila put out her hand. "'Will McGaunt will go to the bad if you turn them out.' "'I am afraid I think she has gone to the bad already, and I do not mean her to take others there with her. I am sorry for poor Trist, and I wish he could find some nice woman to marry. But what he proposes is impossible.' The blood had flared up again in Sheila's cheeks. She was as red as the comb of a turkey-cock. "'Why shouldn't he marry his wife's sister?' "'It's legal now, and you've no right to stop it.' Lady Mallory bit her lips. She looked straight and hard at Sheila. "'I do not stop it. I have no means of stopping it. And he cannot do it and live in one of our cottages. I don't think we need discuss this further.' "'I beg your pardon.' The words had come from Derrick. Lady Mallory paused in her walk towards the bell. With his peculiar thin-lipped smile the boy went on. "'We imagined you would say no. "'We really came because we thought it fair to warn you "'that there may be trouble.' "'Lady Mannering smiled. "'This is a private matter between us and our tenants, "'and we should be so glad if you could manage not to interfere.' "'Derrick bowed and put his hand within his sister's arm. "'But Sheila did not move. "'She was trembling with anger. "'Who are you?' she suddenly burst out. "'To dispose of the poor, body and soul? "'Who are you to dictate their private lives?' If they pay their rent, that should be enough for you. Lady Mannering moved swiftly again toward the bell. She paused with her hand on it and said, I am sorry for you two. You have been miserably brought up. There was a silence. Then Derrick said quietly, Thank you. We shall remember that insult to our people. Don't ring, please. We are going. In a silence of anything more profound than that of their approach, the two young people retired down the drive. They had not yet learned, most difficult of lessons, how to believe that people could in their bones differ from them. It had always seemed to them that if only they had a chance of putting directly what they thought, the other side must at heart agree, and only go on saying they didn't out of mere self-interest. They came away, therefore, from this encounter with the enemy, 
a little dazed by the discovery that Lady Mallory and her bones believed that she was right. It confused them and heated the fires of their anger. They had shaken off all private dust before Sheila spoke. They're all like that, can't see or feel, simply certain they're superior. It makes, it makes me hate them. It's terrible, ghastly. And while she stammered out those little stabs of speech, tears of rage rolled down her cheeks. Derrick put his arm round her waist. All right, no good groaning. Let's think seriously what to do. There was comfort to the girl in that curiously sudden reversal of their usual attitudes. Whatever's done, he went on, has got to be startling. It's no good pottering and protesting any more. And between his teeth he muttered, Men of England, wherefore plough? In the room where the encounter had taken place, Mildred Mannering was taking her time to recover. From very childhood she felt that the essence of her own goodness, the essence of her duty in life, was the doing of good to others. From very childhood she never doubted that she was in a position to do this, and that those to whom she did good, although they might kick against it as inconvenient, must admit that it was their good. The thought, they don't admit that I am superior, had never even occurred to her, so completely was she unself-conscious in her convinced superiority. It was hard, indeed, to be flung against such outspoken rudeness. It shook her more than she gave sign of, for she was not by any means an insensitive woman. Shook her almost to the point of feeling that there was something in the remonstrance of those dreadful young people. Yet how could there be, when no one knew better than she, that the labourers on the Mannering estate were better off than those on nine out of ten estates, better paid and better housed and better looked after in their morals? Ought she to give up that, when she knew that she was better able to tell them what was good than they were themselves. After all, without stripping herself naked of every thought, experience, and action since her birth, how could she admit that she was not better able? And slowly, in the white room with the moss-green carpet, she recovered, till there was only just a touch of soreness left at the injustice implicit in their words. Those two had been miserably brought up, and never had a chance of finding their proper place, of understanding they were just two caddo young things for whom life had some fearful knocks in store. She could even feel now that she had meant that, saying, I am sorry for you too. She was sorry for them, sorry for their want of manners and their point of view, none of which they could help, of course, with a mother like that. For all her gentleness and sensibility, there was much practical directness about Mildred Mannering. For her, a page turned was a page turned, an idea absorbed was never disgorged. She was of religious temperament, ever trimming her course down the exact channel marked out with boys by the port authorities, and really incapable of imagining spiritual wants in others that could not be satisfied by what satisfied herself. And this pathetic strength she had in common with many of her fellow creatures in every class. Sitting down at the writing-table from which she had been disturbed, she leaned her thin, rather long, gentle but stubborn face on her hand, thinking. These gaunts were a source of irritation in the parish, a kind of open sore. It would be better if they could be got rid of before quarter day, up to which she had weakly said they might remain. Far better for them to go at once if it could be arranged. As for the poor fellow Trist, thinking that by plunging into sin he could improve his lot and his poor children's, it was really criminal of those Freelands to encourage him. She had refrained hitherto from seriously worrying Gerald on such points of village policy. His hands were so full. But he must now take his part. And she rang the bell. Tell Sir Gerald I'd like to see him, please, as soon as he gets back. Uh, Sir Gerald has just come in, my lady. And now, then. Gerald Mallering, an excellent fellow, as could be seen from his face of strictly Norman architecture, with blue stained-at-last windows rather deep set in, had only one defect. He was not a poet. Not that this would have seemed to him anything but an advantage, had he been aware of it. His was one of those high-principled natures who hold that breadth is synonymous with weakness. It may be said without exaggeration that the few meetings of his life with those who had a touch of the poet in them had been exquisitely uncomfortable. Silent, almost taciturn by nature, he was a great reader of poetry, and seldom went to sleep without having digested a page or two of Wordsworth, Milton, Tennyson, or Scott. Byron, save such poems as Don Juan or The Waltz, he could, but did not, read, for fear of setting a bad example. Burns, Shelley, and Keats he did not care for. Browning, paint him, 
except by such things as how they brought the good news from Ghent to Aix and the cavalier tunes, while of Omar Khayyam and the Hound of Heaven he definitely disapproved. For Shakespeare he had no real liking, though he concealed this from humility in the face of accepted opinion. His was a firmer mind, sure of itself, but not self-assertive. His points were so good, and he had so many of them, that it was only when he met anyone touched with poetry that his limitations became apparent. It was rare, however, and getting more so every year for him to have this unpleasant experience. When summoned by his wife, he came in with a wrinkle between his straight brows, he had just finished a morning's work on a drainage scheme, like the really good fellow that he was. She greeted him with a little special smile. Nothing could be friendlier than the relations between these two. Affection and trust, undeviating undemonstrativeness, identity of feeling as to religion, children, property, and in regard to views on the question of sex, a really strange unanimity, considering that they were man and woman. It's about these gaunts, Gerald. I feel they must go at once. They're only creating bad feeling by staying till quarter day. I've had the young freelance here. Well, those young pups! Can't it be managed? Marrying did not answer hastily. He had the best point of the good Englishman, a dislike to be moved out of a course of conduct by anything save the appeal of his own conscience. I don't know, he said, why we should alter what we thought was just. Must give him time to look round and get a job elsewhere. I think the general state of feeling demands it. It's not fair to the villagers to let the freelands have such a handle for agitating. Labour's badly wanted everywhere. He can't have any difficulty in getting a place, if he likes. No, only I rather admire the fellow for sticking by his girl, as he is such a land lawyer. I think it's a bit harsh to remove him suddenly. So did I, till I saw from those young furies what harm it's doing. They really do infect the cottagers. You know how discontent spreads. And Trist, they're egging him on, too. Mannering very thoughtfully filled a pipe. He was not an alarmist. If anything, he erred on the side of not being alarmed until it was all over, and there was no longer anything to be alarmed at. His imagination would then sometimes take fire, and he would say that such-and-such, such, or so-and-so, was dangerous. "'I'd rather go and have a talk with Freeland, he said. "'He's queer, but he's not at all a bad chap.' Lady Mannering rose and took one of his red leather buttons in her hand. "'My dear Gerald, Mr. Freeland doesn't exist.' "'I don't know about that. Man can always come to life, if he likes, in his own family.' Lady Mannering was silent. It was true. For all their unanimity of thought and feeling, for all the latitude she had in domestic and village affairs, Gerald had a habit of filling his pipe with her decisions. Quite honestly, she had no objection to their becoming smoke through his lips, though she might wriggle just a little. To her credit, she did not entirely carry out in her life her professed belief that husbands should be the forefronts of their wives. For all that, there burst from her lips the words, "'That Freeland woman! When I think of the mischief she's always done here by her example and her irreligion, I can't forgive her. I don't believe you'll make any impression on Mr. Freeland. He's entirely under her thumb. Smoking slowly, and looking just over the top of his wife's head, Mannering answered, mm, I'll have a try. Don't you worry. Lady Mannering turned away. Her soreness still wanted salve. Those two young people, she murmured, and said some very unpleasant things to me. The boy, I believe, might have some good in him, but the girl is simply terrible. Oh, I think just the reverse, you know. They'll come to awful grief if they're not brought up sharp. They ought to be sent to the colonies to learn reality. Mannering nodded. Come out, Mildred, and see how they're getting on with the new vinery. And they went out together through the French window. The vinery was of their own designing and of extraordinary interest. In contemplation of its lofty glass and aluminum-cased pipes, the feeling of soreness left her. It was very pleasant, standing with Gerald, looking at what they had planned together. There was a soothing sense of reality about that visit, after the morning's happening, with its disappointment, its reminder of immorality and discontent, and of folk ungrateful for what was done for their good. And, squeezing her husband's arm, she murmured, "'It's really exactly what we thought it would be, Gerald.'" End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 13 About five o'clock of that same afternoon, Gerald Mallering went to see Todd. An open-air man himself, who often deplored the long hours he was compelled to spend in the special atmosphere of the House of Commons, he rather envied Todd his existence in this cottage, crazed from age and clothed with wisteria, rambler roses, sweet bra, honeysuckle and Virginia creeper. Freeland had, in his opinion, quite a jolly life of it, the poor fellow not being able, of course, to help having a cranky wife and children like that. He pondered, as he went along, over a talk at Beckett, when Stanley, still under the influence of Felix's outburst, had uttered some rather queer sayings. For instance, he had supposed that they, meaning apparently himself and Mallory, were rather unable to put themselves in the position of these trysts and gaunts. He seemed to speak of them as one might speak generically of Hodge, which had struck Mallory as singular, it not being his habit to see anything in common between an individual case, especially on his own estate, and the ethics of a general proposition. The place for general propositions was undoubtedly the House of Commons, where they could be supported, one way or the other, out of blue books. He had little use for them in private life, where innumerable things, such as human nature and all that, came into play. He had stared rather hard at his host when Stanley had followed up their first remark with, "'I'm bound to say I shouldn't care to have to get up at half-past five and go out without a bath.' What that had to do with the land problem or the regulation of village morality, Mallering had been unable to perceive. It all depended on what one was accustomed to, and in any case threw no light on the question as to whether or not he was to tolerate on his estate conduct of which his wife and himself distinctly disapproved. At the back of national life there was always this problem of individual conduct, especially sexual conduct, without regularity in which the family, as the unit of national life, was gravely threatened, to put it on the lowest ground. And he did not see how to bring it home to the villagers that they got to be regular, without making examples now and then. He had hoped very much to get through this call without coming across Freeland's wife and children, and was greatly relieved to find Todd seated on a window sill in front of his cottage, smoking and gazing apparently at nothing. In taking the other call of the window sill, the thought passed through his mind that Freeland was really a very fine-looking fellow. Todd was indeed about Mallering's own height of six feet one, with the same fairness and straight build of figure and feature. But Todd's head was round and massive, his hair crisp and uncut, Mallering's head long and narrow, his hair smooth and close-cropped. Todd's eyes, blue and deep-set, seemed fixed on the horizon. Mallering's blue and deep-set on the nearest thing they could light on. Todd smiled, as it were, without knowing. Mallering seemed to know what he was smiling at almost too well. It was comforting, however, that Freedom was as shy and silent as himself, for this produced a feeling that there could not be any real difference between their points of view. Perceiving at last that if he did not speak they would continue sitting there dumb till it was time for him to go, Mannering said, "'Look here, Freeland, about my wife and yours and Trist and the Gaunts and all the rest of it. It's a pity, isn't it? This is a small place, you know. What's your own feeling?' Todd answered, "'A man has only one life.' Mannering was a little puzzled. "'In this world I, I don't follow.' Live and let live. A part of Mallering undoubtedly responded to that curt saying, a part of him as strongly rebelled against it, and which impulse he was going to follow was not at first patent. You see, you keep apart, he said at last. You couldn't say that so easily if you had, like us, to take up the position in which we find ourselves. Why take it up? Mannering frowned. How would things go on? All right, said Todd. Mannering got up from the sill. This was laissez-faire with a vengeance. Such philosophy it always seemed to him to savour dangerously of anarchism. And yet twenty years' experience as a neighbour had shown him that Todd was in himself perhaps the most harmless person in Worcestershire, and held in a curious esteem by most of the people about. He was puzzled and sat down again. "'I've never had a chance to talk things over with you,' he said. "'There are a good few people, Freeland, who can't behave themselves.' We're not bees, you know. He stopped, having an uncomfortable suspicion that his hearer was not listening. First I've heard this year, said Todd. 
For all the rudeness of that interruption, Mary felt a stirring of interest. He himself liked birds. Unfortunately, he could hear nothing but the general chorus of their songs. "'Thought they'd gone,' murmured Todd. Mannering again got up. "'Look here, Freeland,' he said. "'I wish you'd give your mind to this. "'You really ought not to let your wife and children make trouble in the village.' Confound the fellow, he was smiling. There was a sort of twinkle in his smile, too, that Mannering found infectious. No, "'No, seriously,' he said. "'You don't know what harm you mayn't do.' "'Have you ever watched a dog looking at a fire?' asked Todd. "'Yes, often. Why?' "'He knows better than to touch it.' "'You mean you're helpless, but you oughtn't to be.' The fellow was smiling again. "'Then you don't mean to do anything?' Todd shook his head. Mannering flushed. "'Now look here, Freeland,' he said. "'Forgive my saying so, but this strikes me as a bit cynical. "'Do you think I enjoy trying to keep things straight?' Todd looked up. "'Birds,' he said. "'Animals, insects, vegetable life. "'They all eat each other, more or less, but they don't fuss about it.' Mannering turned abruptly and went down the path. "'Fuss? He never fussed. Fuss? "'The word was an insult addressed to him.' If there was one thing he detested more than another, whether in public or private life, it was fussing. Did he not belong to the League for Suspression of Interference with the Liberty of the Subject? Was he not a member of the party notoriously opposed to fussy legislation? Had anyone ever used the word in connection with conduct of his before? If so, he had never heard them. Was it fussy to try and help the Church to improve the standard of morals in the village? Was it fussy to make a simple decision and stick to it? The injustice of the word really hurt him, and the more it hurt him, the slower and more dignified and upright became his march toward his drive gate. Wild geese in the morning sky had been forerunners. Very heavy clouds were sweeping up from the west, and rain began to fall. He passed an old man leaning on a gate of a cottage garden, and said, "'Good evening.' The old man touched his hat, but did not speak. "'How's your leg, Gaunt?' "'Tis much the same, Sir Gerald.' "'Rain coming makes it shoot, I expect?' "'It do.' Mallory stood still. The impasse was on him to see if, after all, the gaunt affair could not be disposed of without turning the old fellow and his son out. "'Look here,' he said, "'about this unfortunate business. Why don't you and your son make up your minds without more ado to let your granddaughter go out to service? You've been here all your lives. I don't want to see you go.' The least touch of colour invaded the old man's carved and greyish face. "'Asking your pardon,' he said. "'My son sticks by his girl, and I sticks by my son.' "'Oh, very well. You know your own business, Gaunt. I spoke for your good.' A faint smile curled the corners of old Gaunt's mouth downward beneath his grey moustaches. "'Thank you kindly,' he said. Mannering raised a finger to his cap and passed on. Though he felt a longing to stride his feelings off, he did not increase his pace, knowing that the old man's eyes were following him. But how pig-headed they were, seeing nothing but their own point of view. Well, he could not alter his decision. They would go at the June quarter, not a day before, nor after. Passing Trist's cottage, he noticed a fly drawn up outside, and its driver talking to a woman in hat and coat at the cottage doorway. She avoided his eye. The wife's sister again, he thought. So that fellow's going to be an ass too. Hopeless, stubborn lot his mind passed on to his scheme for draining the bottom fields at Cantley Bromage. This village trouble was too small to occupy for long the mind of one who had so many duties. Old Gaunt remained at the gate, watching till the tall figure passed out of sight, then limped slowly down the path and entered his son's cottage. Tom Gaunt, not long in from work, was sitting in his shirt-sleeves, reading the paper. A short, thick-set man, with small eyes, round, ruddy cheeks, and humorous lips indifferently concealed by a ragged moustache. Even in repose there was about him something talkative and disputatious. He was clearly the kind of man whose eyes and wit would sparkle above a pewter pot. A good workman, he averaged out an income of perhaps eighteen shillings a week, counting the two shillings' worth of vegetables that he grew. His erring daughter washed for two old ladies in a bungalow, so that with old Gaunt's five shillings from the parish, the total resources of this family of five, including two small boys at school, 
was seven and twenty shillings a week. Quite a sum. His comparative wealth no doubt contributed to the reputation of Tom Gaunt, well known as local wag and disturber of political meetings. His method with these gatherings, whether Liberal or Tory, had a certain masterly simplicity. By interjecting questions that could not be understood, and commenting on the answers received, he ensured perpetual laughter, with the most salutary effects on the over-consideration of any political question, together with a tendency to make his neighbours say, "'Ah, Tom Gaunt, he's a proper caution, he is!' An encomium dear to his ears. What he seriously thought about anything in this world, no one knew. But some suspected him of voting Liberal, because he disturbed their meetings most. His loyalty to his daughter was not credited to affection. It was like Tom Gaunt to stick his toes in and kick. The quality for choice. To look at him and old Gaunt, one would not have thought they could be son and father, a relationship indeed ever dubious. As for his wife, she had been dead twelve years. Some said he had joked her out of life, others that she had gone into consumption. He was a reader, perhaps the only one in all the village, and could whistle like a blackbird. To work hard, but without too great method, to drink hard, but with perfect method, and to talk ninety to the dozen anywhere except at home, was his mode of life. In a word, he was a character. Old Gaunt sat down in a wooden rocking chair and spoke. Sir Gerald Eva just passed. Sir Gerald Eva got a hell. The no one there by his little ears. Eva spoken about us stopping, so as Moody goes out to service. Eva spoke about what ye don't know about then. Let them do what they like. They can't put Tom Gaunt about. He can get work anywhere, Tom Gaunt can. And don't you forget that, old man. The old man, placing his thin brown hands on his knees, was silent, and thoughts passed through and through him. If so be it as Tom goes, there'll be no one as'll take me in for less than three bob a week. Two bob a week, that's what I'll have to feed me. Two bob a week, two bob a week. But if it so be as I go with Tom... I'll have to regular sit down under ye for my bread and butter. And he contemplated his son. Where are you going, then? he said. Tom Gaunt rustled the greenish paper he was reading, and his little hard grey eyes fixed his father. Who said I was going? Old Gaunt, smoothing and smoothing the lined, thin cheeks of the parchmenty, thin-nosed face that Francis Freeland had thought to be almost like a gentleman's, answered, "'I thought you said you was going. "'You think too much, then, that's what it is. "'You think too much, old man.' "'With a slight deepening of the sardonic patience in his face, "'old Gaunt rose, took a bowl and spoon down from a shelf, "'and very slowly proceeded to make himself his evening meal. "'He consisted of crusts of bread soaked in hot water "'and tempered with salt, pepper, onion, and a touch of butter. "'And while he waited, crouched over the kettle, his son smoked his greyish clay and read his greenish journal. An old clock ticked, and a little cat purred without provocation on the ledge of the tightly closed window. Then the door opened, and the rogue girl appeared. She shook her shoulders as though to dismiss the wetting she had got, took off her turn-down, speckly, straw hat, put on an apron, and rolled up her sleeves. Her arms were full and firm and red. The whole of her was full and firm. From her rosy cheeks to her stout ankles she was superabundant with vitality, the strangest contrast to her shadowy, thin old grandfather. About the preparation of her father's tea she moved with a sort of brooding stolidity, out of which would suddenly gleam a twinkle of rogue sweetness, as when she stopped to stroke the little cat, or to tickle the back of her grandfather's lead neck in passing. Having set the tea, she stood by the table and said slowly, "'Tea's ready, father.' "'I'm going to London.' Tom Gaunt put down his pipe and journal, took his seat at the table, filled his mouth with sausage, and says, "'You're going where I tell you.' "'I'm going to London.' Tom Gaunt stayed the morsel in one cheek, and fixed her with his little wild boar's eye. "'You're going to catch the stick,' he said. "'Look here, my girl. Tom Gaunt's been put about enough along of you already. Don't you make no mistake.' "'I'm going to London,' repeated the rogue girl stolidly. "'You can get Alice to come over.' "'Oh, can I? You're not going till I tell you.' 
Don't you think it? I'm going. I saw Mr. Derrick this morning. They'll get me a place there. Tom Gaunt remained with his fork, as it were, transfixed. The effort of devising contradiction to the chief supporters of his own rebellion was for the moment too much for him. He resumed mastication. You'll go where I want you to go, and don't you think you can tell me where that is? In the silence that ensued, the only sound was that of old Gaunt supping at his crusty broth. Then the rogue girl went to the window, and taking the little cat on her breast, sat looking out into the rain. Having finished his broth, old Gaunt got up, and behind his son's back he looked at his granddaughter and thought, "'Going to London. It will be best for us all. We shouldn't need to be moving, then. Going to London.' But he felt desolate. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of The Freeland by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Fourteen. When spring and first love meet in a girl's heart, then the birds sing. The songs that blackbirds and dusty-coated thrushes flung through Neda's window when she awoke in Hampstead those May mornings seemed to have been sung by herself all night. Whether the sun were flashing on the leaves, or raindrops sieving through on a south-west wind, the same warmth glowed up in her the moment her eyes opened. Whether the lawn below were a field of bright dew, or dry and darkish in a shiver of east wind, her eyes never grew dim all day, and her blood felt as light as ostrich feathers. Stormed by an attack of his cacoethes scrupendi, after those few blank days at Beckett, Felix saw nothing amiss with his young daughter. The great observer was not observant of things that other people observed. Neither he nor Flora, occupied with matters of more spiritual importance, could tell off-hand, for example, on which hand a wedding-ring was worn. They had talked enough of Beckett and the Todds to produce the impression on Flora's mind that one day or another two young people would arrive in her house on a visit. But she had begun a poem called Dionysus at the Well, and Felix himself had plunged into a satiric allegory entitled The Last of the Labourers. Nedda, therefore, walked alone, but at her side went always an invisible companion. In that long, imaginary walking out, she gave her thoughts and the whole of her heart, and to be doing this never surprised her, who before had not given them whole to anything. A bee knows the first summer day, and clings intoxicated to its flowers. So did Nedda know and cling. She wrote him two letters, and he wrote her one. It was not poetry. Indeed, it was almost all concerned with Wilmot Gaunt, asking Nedda to find a place in London where the girl could go. But it ended with the words, Your lover, Derrick. This letter troubled Nedda. She would have taken it at once to Felix or to Flora, if it had not been for the first words, Dearest Nedda, and those last three. Except her mother, she instinctively distrusted women in such a matter as that of Wilmot Gaunt, feeling they would want to know more than she could tell them, and not be too tolerant of what they heard. Casting about, at a loss, she thought suddenly of Mr. Cuthcott. At dinner that day she fished round carefully. Felix spoke of him almost warmly. What Cuthcott could have been doing at Beckett, of all places, he could not imagine, the last sort of man one expected to see there. A good fellow, rather desperate, perhaps, as men of his age were apt to get if they had too many women, or no woman, about them. Which, said Nedda, had Mr. Cuthcott? Oh, none. How had he struck Nedda? Felix looked at his little daughter with a certain humble curiosity. He always felt that the young instinctively knew so much more than he did. I liked him awfully. He was like a dog. Ah, said Felix, he is like a dog. Very honest. He grins and runs about the city and might be inclined to bay the moon. I don't mind that, Nedda thought, so long as he's not superior. He's very human, Felix added. And having found out that he lived in Gray's Inn, Nedda thought, I will, I'll ask him. To put her project into execution, she wrote this note. Dear Mr. Cuthcott, you were so kind as to tell me you wouldn't mind if I bothered you about things. I've got a very bothery thing to know what to do about, and I would be so glad of your advice. It so happens that I can't ask my mother and father. I hope you won't think me very horrible, wasting your time. And please say no, if you'd rather. Your sincerely, Nedda Freeland. 
The answer came. Dear Miss Freeland, delighted, but if very bothery, better save time and ink and have a snack of lunch with me tomorrow at the Elgin restaurant close to the British Museum. Quiet and respectable. No flowers by request. One o'clock. Very truly yours, Giles Cuthcote. Putting on no flowers, and with a fast-beating heart, Nedda went on her first lonely adventure. To say truth, she did not know in the least however she was going to ask this almost strange man about a girl of doubtful character. But she kept saying to herself, "'I don't care. He has nice eyes.' And her spirit would rise as she got nearer, because, after all, she was going to find things out, and to find things out was jolly. The new warmth and singing in her heart had not destroyed, but rather heightened, her sense of the extraordinary interest of all things that be. And, very mysterious to her that morning, was the kaleidoscope of Oxford Street and its innumerable girls and women, each going about her business with a life of her own that was not Nedda's. For men she had little use just now. They had acquired a certain insignificance, not having grey-black eyes that smoked and flared, nor Harris tweed suits that smelled delicious. Only once on her journey from Oxford Circus she felt the sense of curiosity rise in her in relation to a man, and this was when she asked a policeman at Tottenham Court Road, and he put his head down fully a foot to listen to her. So huge, so broad, so red in the face, so stolid, it seemed wonderful to her that he paid her any attention. If he were a human being, could she really be one too? But that, after all, was no more odd than everything. Why, for instance, the spring flowers in that woman's basket had been born? Why that high white cloud floated over? Why and what was Nedda Freeland? At the entrance of the little restaurant she saw Mr. Cuthcote waiting. In a brown suit, with his pale but freckled face, and his gnawed at sandy moustache, and his eyes that looked out and beyond, he was certainly no beauty. But Nedda thought, "'He's even nicer than I remembered, and I'm sure he knows a lot.' At first, to be sitting opposite to him in front of little plates containing red substances and small fishes was so exciting that she simply listened to his rapid, rather stammering voice, mentioning that the English had no idea of life or cookery, that God had so made this country by mistake that everything, even the sun, knew it. What, however, would she drink? Chardonnay? Wasn't bad here. She assented, not liking to confess that she did not know what Chardonnay might be, and hoping it was some kind of sherbet. She had never yet drunk wine, and after a glass felt suddenly extremely strong. "'Well,' said Mr. Cuthcote, and his eyes twinkled, "'what's your botheration? I suppose you want to strike out for yourself. My daughters did that without consulting me.' "'Oh, have you got daughters?' "'Yes, funny ones, older than you.' "'That's why you understand, then?' Mr. Cuthcote smiled. "'They were a liberal education.' And Nedda thought, "'Poor Dad, I wonder if I am.' "'Yes,' Mr. Cuthcote murmured. "'Who would think a gosling would ever become a goose?' "'Ah,' said Nettie eagerly, "'isn't it wonderful how things grow?' She felt his eyes suddenly catch hold of her. "'You're in love,' he said. It seemed to her a great piece of luck that he found that out. It made everything easy at once, and her words came out pell-mell. "'Yes, and I haven't told my people yet. I don't seem able. He's given me something to do, and I haven't much experience.' A funny little wriggle passed over Mr. Cuthcote's face. "'Yes, yes, go on. Tell us about it.' She took a sip from her glass, and the feeling that he had been going to laugh passed away. "'It's about the daughter of a labourer, down there in Worcestershire, where he lives, not very far from Beckett. He's my cousin Derrick, the son of my other uncle at Joyfields. He and his sister feel most awfully strongly about the labourers.' "'Ah,' said Mr. Cuthcote, "'the labourers. Queer how they're in the air, all of a sudden.' "'This girl hasn't been very good, and she has to go from the village, or else her family has. "'He wants me to find a place for her in London.' "'I see. And she hasn't been very good?' "'Not very.' She knew that her cheeks were flushing, but her eyes felt steady, and seeing that his eyes never moved, she did not mind. She went on, "'It's Sir Gerald Mallorings' estate. Lady Mallorings won't—' She heard a snap. Mr. Cuthbert's mouth had closed. "'Oh,' he said, "'say no more.' "'He can bite nicely,' she thought. Mr. Cuthcote, who had begun lightly thumping the little table with his open hand, broke out suddenly. "'That petty bullying in the country! I know it! My God, these prudes, those prisms! They're the ruination of half the girls on the—' 
He looked at Noda and stopped short. "'If she could do any kind of work, I'll find her a place. In fact, she'd better come for a start under my old housekeeper. Let your cousin know. She could turn up any day. Name? Will McGaunt. Right you are.' He wrote it on his cuff. Noda rose to her feet, having an inclination to seize his hand or stroke his head or something. She subsided again with a fervid sigh, and sat exchanging with him a happy smile. At last she said, "'Mr. Cuthcott, is there any chance of things like that changing?' "'Changing?' He certainly had grown paler, and was again lightly thumping the table. "'Changing? By gum, it's got to change! This damned Pluto-aristocratic ideal! The weed's so grown up that it's choking us! Yes, Miss Friedland, whether from inside or out I don't know yet, but there's a blazing row coming. Things are going to be made new before long.' Under his thumps the little plates had begun to rattle and leap, and Edda thought, "'I do like him.' But she said anxiously, "'You believe there's something to be done, then? Derrick is simply full of it. I want to feel like that, too, and I mean to.' His face grew twinkly. He put out his hand. And, wondering a little whether he meant her to, Nedda timidly stretched forth her own and grasped it. "'I like you,' he said. "'Love your cousin, and don't worry.' Nedda's eyes slipped into the distance. "'But uh, I'm afraid for him. If you saw him, you'd know.' "'One's always afraid for the fellows that are worth anything. There was another young Freeland at your uncle's the other night. "'My brother Alan. Oh, your brother. Well, I wasn't afraid for him, and it seemed a pity. Have some of this. It's about the only thing they do well here.' "'Oh, thank you, no. I've had a lovely lunch. Mother and I generally have about nothing.' And clasping her hand, she added, "'This is a secret, isn't it, Mr. Cuthcott?' "'Dead.' He laughed, and his face melted into a mass of wrinkles. Nedda laughed also, and drank up the rest of her wine. She felt blissful. "'Yes,' said Mr. Cuthcott. "'There's nothing like loving. How long have you been at it?' "'Only five days. But it's everything.' Mr. Cuthcott sighed. "'That's right. When you can't love, the only thing is to hate.' "'Oh,' said Nedda. Mr. Cuthbert again began banging on the little table. "'Look at them! Look at them!' His eyes wandered angrily about the room, wherein sat some few who had passed through the mills of gentility. "'What do they know of life? Where are their souls and sympathies? They haven't any. I like to see their blood flow, the silly brutes!' Netta looked at them with alarm and curiosity. They seemed to her somewhat like everybody she knew. She said timidly, "'Do you think our blood ought to flow too?' Mr. Cuthcott relapsed into twinkles. "'Rather, mine first. "'He is human,' thought Nedda, and she got up. "'I'm afraid I ought to go now. "'It's been awfully nice. "'Thank you so very much. "'Good-bye.' He shook her firm little hand with his frail, thin one, and stood smiling till the restaurant door cut him off from her view. The streets seemed so gorgeously full of life now that Nedda's head swam. She looked at it all with such absorption that she could not tell one thing from another. It seemed rather long to the Tottenham Court Road, though she noted carefully the names of all the streets she passed, and was sure she had not missed it. She came at last to one called Poultry. Poultry, she thought. I should have remembered that. Poultry. And she laughed. It was so sweet and feathery a laugh that the driver of an old four-wheeler stopped his horse. He was old and anxious-looking, with a grey beard and deep folds in his red cheeks. Poultry, she said. Please, am I right for the Tottenham Court Road? The old man answered, Glory, no, miss, you're going east. East, thought Nedda. I'd better take him. And she got in. She sat in the four-wheeler, smiling. And how far this was due to Chardonnay, she did not consider. She was to love and not worry. It was wonderful. In this mood, she was put down, still smiling, at the Tottenham Court Road tube, and getting out her purse, she prepared to pay the cabman. The fare would be a shilling, but she felt like giving him two. He looked so anxious and worn, in spite of his red face. He took them, looked at her, and said, "'Thank you, miss. I wanted that.' "'Oh,' murmured Nedda, "'then please take this, too. It's all I happen to have except my tube fare.' The old man took it, and water actually ran along his nose. "'God bless you,' he said, and taking up his whip he drove off quickly. Rather choky, but still glowing, Nedda descended to her train. It was not till she was walking to the Spaniard's Road that a cloud seemed to come over her sky, 
and she reached home, dejected. In the garden of the Friedland's old house was a nook shut away by Berberis and rhododendrons, where some bees were supposed to make honey, but knowing its destination and belonging to a union, made no more than they were obliged. In this retreat, which contained a rustic bench, Dedda was accustomed to sit and read. She went there now. And her eyes began filling with tears. How must the poor old fellow who had driven her look so anxious and call on God to bless her for giving him that little present? Why must people grow old and helpless, like that grandfather Gaunt she had seen at Beckett? Why was there all the tyranny that made Derrick and Sheila so wild? And all the grinding poverty that she herself could see when she went with her mother to their girls' club in Bethnal Green? What was the use of being young and strong if nothing happened, nothing was really changed, so that one got old and died, seeing still the same things as before? What was the use even of loving, if love itself had to yield to death? The trees! How they grew from tiny seeds to great and beautiful things, and then slowly, slowly dried and decayed away to dust. What was the good of it all? What comfort was there in a God so great and universal that he did not care to keep her and Derrick alive and loving for ever, and was not interested enough to see that the poor old cab-driver should not be haunted day and night with fear of the workhouse for himself, and an old wife, perhaps? Netta's tears fell fast, and how far this was Chardonnay! No one could tell. Felix, seeking inspiration from the sky in regard to the last of the labourers, heard a noise like sobbing, and, searching, found his little daughter sitting there and crying as if her heart would break. The sight was so unusual and so utterly disturbing that he stood rooted, quite unable to bring her help. Should he sneak away? Should he go for Flora? What should he do? Like many men whose work keeps them centred within themselves, he instinctively avoided everything likely to pain or trouble him. For this reason, when anything did penetrate those mechanical defences, he became almost strangely tender. Loath, for example, to believe that anyone was ill, if once convinced of it, he made so good a nurse that Flora, at any rate, was in the habit of getting well with suspicious alacrity. Thoroughly moved now, he sat down on the bench beside Nedda and said, "'My darling!' She leaned her forehead against its arm and sobbed the more. Felix waited, patting her far shoulders gently. He had often dealt with such situations in his books, and now that one had come true was completely at a loss. He could not even begin to remember what was usually said or done, and he only made little soothing noises. To Nella this tenderness brought a sudden sharp sense of guilt and yearning. She began, "'It's not because of that I'm crying, Dad, but... I want you to know that Derrick and I are in love. The words, You? What? In those few days? Rose, and got as far as Felix's teeth. He swallowed them and went on patting her shoulder. Nedda, in love. He felt blank and ashy. That special feeling of owning her more than anyone else, which was so warming and delightful, so really precious, it would be gone. What right had she to take it from him, thus, without warning? Then he remembered how odious he'd always said the elderly were to spoke the wheels of youth, and managed to murmur, "'Good luck to you, my pretty.' He said it, conscious that a father ought to be saying, "'You're much too young, and he's your cousin.' But what a father ought to say appeared to him just then both sensible and ridiculous. Neda rubbed her cheek against his hand. "'It won't make any difference, Dad, I promise you.' And Felix thought, "'Not to you, only to me.' but he said, "'Not a scrap, my love. What were you crying about?' "'About the world. It seems so heartless.' And she told him about the water that had run along the nose of the old four-wheeler man. But while he seemed to listen, Felix thought, "'I wish to God I were made of leather. Then I shouldn't feel as if I'd lost the warmth inside me. I mustn't let her see. Fathers are queer. I always suspected that. There goes my work for a good week.' Then he answered, "'No, my dear, the world is not heartless. It's only arranged according to certain necessary contraries. No pain, no pleasure, no dark, no light, and the rest of it. If you think it couldn't be arranged differently.' As he spoke, a blackbird came running with a chuckle from underneath the Berberis, looking at them with alarm, and ran back. Nedda raised her face. "'Dad, I mean to do something with my life.' Felix answered, 
Yes, that's right. But long after Nedda had fallen into dreams that night, he lay awake, with his left foot enclosed between Flora's, trying to regain that sense of warmth which he knew he must never confess to having lost. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 15 Flora took the news rather with the air of a mother dog that says to her puppy, Oh, very well, young thing, go and stick your teeth in it and find out for yourself. Sooner or later this always happened, and generally sooner nowadays. Besides, she could not help feeling that she would get more of Felix, to her a matter of greater importance than she gave sign of. But inwardly the news had given her a shock almost as sharp as that felt by him. Was she really the mother of one old enough to love? Was the child that used to cuddle up to her in the window-seat to be read to gone from her, that used to rush in every morning at all inconvenient moments of her toilet, that used to be found sitting in the dark on the stairs like a little sleepy owl, because, forsooth, it was so cosy? Not having seen Derrick, she did not as yet share her husband's anxiety on that score, though his description was dubious. Upstanding young cockerel, swinging his sporran and marching to pipes! A fine spurs about him! Born to trouble, if I know anything, trying to sweep the sky with his little broom! Is he a prig? No, there's simplicity about his scorn, and he seems to have been brought up on facts, not on literature, like most of these young monkeys. The cousinship I don't think matters. Kirstine brings in too strong an outstrain. He's her son, not Todd's. But perhaps, he added, sighing, it won't last. Flora shook her head. It will last, she said. Nedda's deep. And if Nedda held, so would fate. No one would throw Nedda over. They naturally both felt that. Dionysus at the well, no less than the last of the labourers, had a light week of it. Though in a sense relieved at having parted with her secret, Nedda yet felt that she had committed desecration. Suppose Derrick should mind her people knowing. On the day that he and Sheila were to come, feeling she could not trust herself to seem even reasonably calm, she started out, meaning to go to the South Kensington Museum and wander the time away there. But, once out of doors, the sky seemed what she wanted, and turning down the hill on the north side, she sat down under a gorse-bush. Here, tramps, coming into London, passed the night under the stars. Here was a vision, however dim, of nature, and nature alone could a little soothe her ecstatic nerves. How would he greet her? Would he be exactly as he was when they stood at the edge of Todd's orchard, above the dreamy darkening fields, joining hands and lips, moved as they had never been moved before? May Blossom was beginning to come out along the hedge of the private grounds that bordered that bit of Cockney Common and from it, warmed by the sun, the scent stole up to her. Familiar, like so many children of the cultured classes, with the pagan and fairy tales of nature, she forgot them all the moment she was really by herself with earth and sky. In their breadth, their soft and stirring continuity, they rejected bookish fancy, and woke in her rapture and yearning, a sort of long delight, a never-appeased hunger. Crouching, hands round knees, she turned her face to get the warmth of the sun, and see the white clouds go slowly by, and catch all the songs that the birds sang. And every now and then she drew a deep breath. It was true what Dad had said. There was no real heartlessness in nature. It was warm, beating, breathing. And if things ate each other, what did it matter? They had lived and died quickly, helping to make others live. The sacred swing and circle of it went on forever, full and harmonious under the lighted sky, under the friendly stars. It was wonderful to be alive, and all done by love. Love! More, more, more love! And then death, if it must come. For after all, to Nedda, death was so far away, so unimaginably dim and distant, that it did not really count. While she sat, letting her fingers, that were growing slowly black, scrabble the grass and fern, a feeling came on her of a presence, a creature with wings above and around, that seemed to have on its face a long, mysterious smile, of which she, Nedda, was herself a tiny twinkle. She would bring Derrick here. They two would sit together and let the clouds go over them, and she would learn all that he really thought, 
and tell him all her longings and fears. They would be silent, too, loving each other too much to talk. She made elaborate plans of what they were to do and see, beginning with the East End and the National Gallery, and ending with sunrise from Parliament Hill. But she somehow knew that nothing would happen as she had designed. If only the first moment were not different from what she had hoped. She sat there so long that she rose quite stiff and so hungry that she could not help going home and stealing into the kitchen. It was three o'clock, and the old cook, as usual, asleep in an armchair with her apron thrown up between her face and the fire. What would Cookie say if she knew? In that oven she had been allowed to bake, in fancy, perfect little doll loaves, while Cookie baked them in reality. Here she had watched the mysterious making of pink cream, had burned countless goes of toffee and coconut ice, and tasted all kinds of loveliness. Dear old Cookie! Stealing about on tiptoe, seeking what she might devour, she found four small jam tarts, and ate them while the cook snored softly. Then, by the table that looked so like a great loaf platter, she stood contemplating Cook. Old darling, with her fat, pale, crumply face, hung to the dresser hung to the dresser opposite was a little mahogany looking-glass tilted forward. Neda could see herself almost down to her toes. "'I mean to be prettier than I am,' she thought, putting her hands on her waist. "'I wonder if I can pull them in a bit.' Sliding her fingers under her blouse, she began to pull at certain strings. They would not budge. They were loose, yes, really too comfortable. She would have to get the next size smaller. And, dropping her chin, she rubbed it on the lace edging of her chest, where it felt warm and smelled piney. Had Cookie ever been in love? Her grey hairs were coming, poor old duck. The windows, where a protection of wire gauze kept out the flies, were opened wide, and the sun shone in and dimmed the fire. The kitchen clock ticked like a conscience. A faint perfume of frying pan and mint scented the air. And for the first time since this new sensation of love had come to her, Nedda felt as if a favourite book, read through and done with, were dropping from her hands. The lovely times in that kitchen, in every nook of that old house and garden, would never come again. Gone. She felt suddenly cast down to sadness. They had been lovely times. To be deserting in spirit all that had been so good to her, it seemed like a crime. She slid down off the table, and, passing behind the cook, put her arms round those substantial sides. Without meaning to, out of sheer emotion, she pressed them somewhat hard, and as from a concertina emerged a jerked and drawn-out cord, so from the cook came a long, quaking sound. Her apron fell, her body heaved, and her drowsy, flat, soft voice, greasy from pondering over dishes, murmured, "'Ah, Miss Nedder, it's you, my dear. Bless your pretty heart!' But down Nedder's cheek behind her rolled two tears. "'Cookie! Oh, Cookie!' And she ran out. At the first moment, it was like nothing she had dreamed of. Strange, stiff, one darting look, and then eyes down. One convulsive squeeze, then such a formal shake of hot, dry hands. And off he had gone with Felix to his room, and she with Sheila to hers, bewildered, biting down consternation, trying desperately to behave like a little lady, as her old nurse would have put it. Before Sheila, especially whose hostility she knew by instinct she had earned. All that evening, furtive watching, formal talk, and underneath a ferment of doubt and fear and longing. All a mistake, an awful mistake. Did he love her? Heaven! If he did not, she could never face any one again. He could not love her. His eyes were like those of a swan when its neck is drawn up and back in anger. Terrible, having to show nothing, having to smile at Sheila, at Dad and Mother. And when at last she got to her room, she stood at the window and at first simply leaned her forehead against the glass and shivered. What had she done? Had she dreamed it all, dreamed that they had stood together under those boughs in the darkness, and through their lips exchanged their hearts? She must have dreamed it, dreamed that most wonderful, false dream, and the walk home in the thunderstorm, and his arm round her, and her letters, and his letter, dreamed it all. And now she was awake. From her lips came a little moan, and she sank down, huddled, and stayed there ever so long, numb and chilly. Undress, go to bed, not for the world. By the time the morning came she got to forget that she had dreamed. 
For very shame she had got to forget that. No one should see. Her cheeks and ears and lips were burning, but her body felt icy cold. Then, what time she did not know at all, she felt she must go out and sit on the stairs. They had always been her comforters, those wide, shallow, cosy stairs. Out and down the passage, past all their rooms, his the last, to the dark stairs, eerie at night, where the scent of age oozed out of the old house. All doors below, above, were closed. It was like looking down into a well, to sit with her head leaning against the banisters. And silent, so silent, just those faint creakings that come from nowhere, as it might be the breathing of the house. She put her arms round a cold banister and hugged it hard. It hurt her, and she braced it the harder. The first tears of self-pity came welling up, and without warning a great sob burst out of her. Alarmed at the sound, she smothered her mouth with her arm. No good. They came breaking out. A door opened. All the blood rushed to her heart and away from it, and with a little dreadful gurgle she was silent. Someone was listening. How long that terrible listening lasted she had no idea. Then footsteps, and she was conscious that it was standing in the dark behind her. Her foot touched her back. She gave a little gasp. Derrick's voice whispered hoarsely, "'What? Who are you?' And below her breath she answered, "'Nada.' His arms wrenched her away from the banister. His voice in her ear said, "'Nedda, darling, Nedda. But despair had sunk too deep. She could only quiver and shake and try to drive, sobbing out of her breath. Then, most queer, not his words nor the feel of his arms, comforted her. Anyone could pity, but the smell and the roughness of his Norfolk jacket. So he too had not been in bed. He too had been unhappy. And burying her face in his sleeve, she murmured, "'Oh, Derrick, why?' "'I didn't want them all to see. "'I can't bear to give it away. "'Neda, come down lower, and let's love each other.' "'Softly, stumbling, clinging together, "'they went down to the last turn of the wide stairs. "'How many times had she not sat there, in white frocks, "'her hair hanging down as now, "'twisting the tassels of little programmes "'covered with hieroglyphics only intelligible to herself, "'talking spasmodically to spasmodic boys with budding tails, while Chinese lanterns let fall their rose and orange light on them and all the other little couples as exquisitely devoid of ease. Ah, it was worth those hours of torture to sit there together now, comforting each other with hands and lips and whisperings. It was more, as much more than that moment in the orchard, as sun shining after a spring storm is more than sun in placid mid-July. To hear him say, Nedda, I love you, to feel it at his hand, clasped on her heart, was much more, now that she knew how difficult it was for him to say or show it, except in the dark, with her alone. Many a long day they might have gone through together that would not have shown her so much of his real heart as that hour of whispering and kisses. He had known she was unhappy, and yet he couldn't. It had only made him more dumb. It was awful to be like that. But now that she knew, she was glad to think that it was buried so deep in him and kept for her alone. And if he did it again, she would just know that it was only shyness and pride. And he was not a brute and a beast, as he insisted. But suppose she had chanced not to come out, would she ever have lived through the night? And she shivered. Are you cold, darling? Put on my coat. It was put on her in spite of all efforts to prevent him. Never was anything so warm, so delicious, wrapping her in something more than Harry's tweed. And the hall clock struck. Two. She could just see his face in the glimmer that filtered from the skylight at the top. And she felt that he was learning her, learning all that she had to give him, learning the trust that was shining through her eyes. There was just enough light for them to realise the old house watching from below and from above. A glint on the dark floor there, on the dark wall here. A blackness that seemed to be inhabited by some spirit, so that their hands clutched and twitched when the tiny, tiny noises of time playing in wood and stone clicked out. That stare of the old house, with all its knowledge of lives past, of youth and kisses spent and gone, of hopes spun and faiths abashed, the old house cynical, stirred in them desire to clutch each other close and feel the thrill of peering out together into mystery that must hold for them so much of love and joy and trouble. 
and suddenly she put her fingers to his face, passed them softly, cleanly over his hair, forehead, eyes, traced the sharp cheekbones down to his jaw, round by the hard chin up to his lips, over the straight bone of his nose, lingering back to his eyes again. Now, if I go blind, I shall know you. Give me one kiss, Derrick. You must be tired. Buried in the old dark house, that kiss lasted long. Then, tiptoeing, she in front, pausing at every creek, holding breath, they still up to their rooms. And the clock struck. Three. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 16 Felix, nothing if not modern, had succumbed already to the feeling that youth ruled the roost. Whatever his misgivings, his and Flora's sense of loss, Nedda must be given a free hand. Derrick gave no outward show of his condition, and but for his little daughter's happy serenity, Felix would have thought as she had thought that first night. He had a feeling that his nephew rather despised one so soaked in mildness and reputation as Felix Freeland, and he got on better with Sheila, not because she was milder, but because she was devoid of that scornful tang which clung about her brother. No, Sheila was not mild. Rich-coloured, downright of speech, with her mane of short hair, she was a no less startling companion. The smile of Felix had ever been more whimsically employed than during that ten-day visit. The evening John Freeland came to dinner was the high-water mark of his alarmed amusement. Mr Cuthcott, also bidden at Netta's instigation, seemed to take a mischievous delight in drawing out those two young people in face of their official uncle. The pleasure of the dinner to Felix, and it was not too great, was in watching Netta's face. She hardly spoke, but how she listened! Nor did Derrick say much, but what he did say had a queer, sarcastic twinge about it. "'Unpleasant young man,' was John's comment afterwards. "'How the deuce did he ever come to be Todd's son? Sheila, of course, is one of those hot-headed young women that make themselves a nuisance nowadays, but she's intelligible. By the way, that fellow Cuthcott's a queer chap.' One subject of conversation at dinner had been the morality of revolutionary violence, and the saying that had really upset John had been Derrick's. Conflagration first, morality afterward. He had looked at his nephew from under brows, which a constant need for rejecting petitions to the Home Office had drawn permanently down and in toward the nose, and made no answer. To Felix these words had a more sinister significance. With his juster appreciation both of the fiery and the official points of view, his far greater insight into his nephew than ever John would have, he saw that they were more than a mere arrow of controversy. And he made up his mind that night that he would tackle his nephew and try to find out exactly what was smouldering within that crisp black pate. Following him into the garden next morning, he said to himself, No irony, that's fatal. Man to man, or boy to boy, whichever it is, but on the garden path, alongside that young spread-eagle, whose dark, glowering, self-contained face he secretly admired, he merely began, "'How do you like your Uncle John?' "'He doesn't like me, Uncle Felix.' Somewhat baffled, Felix proceeded, "'I say, Derrick, fortunately or unfortunately, I've some claim now to a little knowledge of you. You've got to open out a bit to me. What are you going to do with yourself in life? You can't support Nedda on revolution.' Having drawn this bow at a venture, he paused, doubtful of his wisdom. A glance at Derrick's face confirmed his doubt. It was closer than ever, more defiant. "'There's a lot of money in revolution, Uncle Felix. Other people's.' "'Dash the young brute! There was something in him.' He swerved off to a fresh line. Uh, "'How do you like London?' "'I don't like it. But, Uncle Felix, don't you wish you were seeing it for the first time?' What books you'd write? Felix felt that unconscious thrust go home. Revolt against staleness and clipped wings, against the terrible security of his too solid reputation, smote him. What strikes you most about it, then? he asked. That it ought to be jolly well blown up. Everybody seems to know that, too. They look it, anyway, yet they go on as if it oughtn't. 
Why ought it to be blown up? Well, what's the good of anything while London and all these other big towns are sitting on the country's chest? England must have been a fine place once, though. Some of us think it's a fine place still. Well, of course it is, in a way. But anything new and keen gets sat on. England's like an old tomcat by the fire, too jolly comfortable for anything. At this support to his own theory that the country was going to the dogs, owing to such as John and Stanley, Felix thought, out of the mouths of babes. But he merely said, you're a cheerful young man. It's got cramp, Derrick muttered. Can't even give women votes. Fancy my mother without a vote. I ain't going to wait till every labourer is off the land before it attends to them. It's like the port you gave us last night, Uncle Felix. Wonderful crust. And what is to be your contribution to its renovation? Derrick's face instantly resumed its peculiar defiant smile, and Felix thought, Young beggar, he's as close as wax. After the little talk, however, he had more understanding of his nephew. His defiant self-sufficiency seemed more genuine. In spite of his sensations when dining with Felix, John Freeland, little if not punctilious, decided that it was incumbent on him to have the young Todds to dinner, especially since Francis Freeland had come to stay with him the day after the arrival of those two young people at Hampstead. She had reached Porchester Gardens, faintly flushed from the prospect of seeing darling John, with one large cane trunk and a handbag of a pattern which the man in the shop had told her was the best thing out. It had a clasp which had worked wonderfully in the shop, but which for some reason on the journey had caused her both pain and anxiety. Convinced, however, that she could cure it and open the bag the moment she could get to that splendid new pair of pincers in her trunk, which a man had only yesterday told her were the latest, she still felt that she had a soft thing, and dear John must have one like it if she could get him one at the stores tomorrow. John, who had come away early from the home office, met her in that dark hall, to which he paid no attention since his young wife died fifteen years ago. Embracing him with a smile of love almost timorous from intensity, Francis Freeland looked him up and down, and catching what light there was gleaming on his temples, determined that she had in her bag, as soon as she could get it open, the very thing for dear John's hair. He had such a nice moustache, and it was a pity he was getting bald. Brought to her room, she sat down rather suddenly, feeling, as a fact, very much like fainting, a condition of affairs to which he had never in the past, and indeed he had never in the future, to come, making such a fuss. Owing to that nice new patent clasp, she had not been able to get at her smelling salts, nor the little flask of brandy and the one hard-boiled egg without which she never travelled. And for want of a cup of tea, her soul was nearly dying within her. Dear John would never think she had not had anything since breakfast. She travelled always by a slow train, disliking motion, and she would not for the world let him know, so near dinner-time, giving a lot of trouble. She therefore stayed quite quiet, smiling a little, for fear he might suspect her. Seeing John, however, put her bag down in the wrong place, she felt stronger. No, darling, not there, in the window. And while he was changing the position of the bag, her heart swelled with joy, because his back was so straight, and with a thought, What a pity the dear boy has never married again. It does so keep a man from getting moony. With all that writing and thinking he had to do, such important work, too, it would have been so good for him, especially at night. She would not have expressed it thus in words, that would not have been quite nice, but in thought Francis Freeland was a realist. When he was gone and she could do as she liked, she sat stiller than ever, knowing by long experience that to indulge oneself in private only made it more difficult not to indulge oneself in public. It really was provoking that this nice new class should go wrong just this once, and that the first time it was used. And she took from her pocket a tiny prayer book, and holding it to the light, read the eighteenth psalm. It was a particularly good one that never failed her when she felt low. She used no glasses, and up to the present had avoided any line between the brows, knowing it was her duty to remain as nice as she could to look at, so as not to spoil the pleasure of people round about her. Then, saying to herself firmly, I do not, I will not want any tea, but I shall be glad of dinner, she rose and opened her cane trunk. Though she knew exactly where they were, she was some time finding the pincers, because there were so many interesting things about them, 
each raising a different train of thought. A pair of field glasses, the very latest, the man had said, for darling Derrick. They would be so useful to keep his mind from thinking about things that it was no good thinking about. And for dear Flora, how wonderful that she could write poetry. Poetry? A really splendid and perfectly new little pill. She herself had already taken two, and they'd suited her to perfection. For darling Felix, a new kind of eau de cologne, made in Worcester, because that was the only scent he would use. For her pet, Nedda, a piece of point de venise that she really could not be selfish enough to keep any longer, especially as she was particularly fond of it. For Alan, a new kind of tin opener that the dear boy would like enormously. He was so nice and practical. For Sheila, such a nice new novel by Mr. and Mrs. Worthingham, a bright, wholesome tale with such a good description of quite a new country in it. The dear child was so clever, it would be a change for her. Then, actually resting on the pincers, she came on her passbook, recently made up, containing little or no balance, just enough to get darling John that bag like hers with the new clasp, which would be so handy for his papers when he went travelling. And having reached the pincers, she took them in her hand and sat down again to be quite quiet a moment, with her still dark eyelashes resting on her ivory cheeks and her lips pressed to a colourless line, for her head swam from stooping over. In repose, with three flies circling above her frying grey hair, she might have served a sculptor for a study of the stoic spirit. Then, going to the bag, her compressed lips twitching, her grey eyes piercing into its clasp with a kind of distrustful optimism, she lifted the pincers and tweaked it hard. If the atmosphere of that dinner to which all six from Hampstead came was less disturbed than Jong anticipated, it was due to his sense of hospitality and to everyone's feeling that controversy would puzzle and distress Granny. That there were things about which people differed, Francis Freeland well knew, but that they should so differ as to make them forget to smile and have good manners would not have seemed right to her at all. And of this, in her presence, they were all conscious, so that when they had reached the asparagus there was hardly anything left that could by any possibility be talked about. And this, for fear of seeming awkward, they at once proceeded to discuss, Flora remarking that London was very full. John agreed. Francis Freeland, smiling, said, "'It's so nice for Derrick and Sheila to be seeing it like this for the first time.' Sheila said, "'Why, isn't it always as full as this?' John answered, "'In August, practically empty. They say a hundred thousand people at least go away.' "'Double,' remarked Felix. "'Figures are variously given, my estimate. One in sixty, that shows you.' At this interruption of Derrick's, John frowned slightly. "'What does it show you?' he said. Derrick glanced at his grandmother. "'Oh, nothing.' "'Of course it shows you,' exclaimed Sheila. "'What a heartless great place it is. "'All the world goes out of town and London's empty. "'If you weren't told, so you'd never know the difference.' Derrick muttered, "'I think it shows more than that.' Under the table, Flora was touching John's foot warningly. Nedda attempted to catch Derrick's, Felix endeavouring to catch John's eye, Alan trying to catch Sheila's, John biting his lip and looking carefully at nothing. Only Francis Freeland was smiling and gazing lovingly at her dear Derrick, thinking he would be so handsome when he'd grown a nice black moustache. And she said, "'Yes, dear, what were you going to say?' Derrick looked up. "'Do you really want it, Granny?' Nedda murmured across the table, "'No, Derrick.' Francis Freeland raised her brows quizzically. She almost looked arch. But of course I do, darling. I want to hear immensely. It's so interesting. Derrick was going to say, Mother, everyone at once looked at Felix, who had thus broken in, that all we West End people, John and I and Flora and Stanley, and even you, all we people born in purple and fine linen, are so accustomed to think we're all that matters that when we're out of London there's nobody in it. He meant to say that this is appalling enough. But that which is still more appalling is the fact that we really are all that matters, and that if people try to disturb us, we can, and jolly well will, take care they don't disturb us long. Is that what you meant, Derrick? Derrick turned a rather startled look on Felix. What he meant to say, so it went on Felix, was that age and habit, vested interests, culture and security sit so heavy on this country's chest that aspiration may wriggle and squirm but will never get from under. 
That, for all we pretend to admire enthusiasm and youth, and the rest of it, would push it out of us just a little faster than it grows up. Is that what you meant, Derrick? You'll try to, but you won't succeed. I'm afraid we shall, and with a smile, too, so that you won't see us doing it. I call that devilish. I call it natural. Look at a man who's growing old. Notice how very gracefully and gradually he does it. Take my hair. Your aunt says she can't tell the difference from month to month. And there it is, or rather isn't, little by little. Francis Freeland, who during Felix's long speech had almost closed her eyes, opened them and looked piercingly at the top of his head. Darling, she said, I've got the very thing for you. You must take some with you when you go tonight. John is going to try it. Checked in the flow of his philosophy, Felix blinked like an owl, surprised. Mother, he said, you only have the gift of keeping young. Oh, my dear, I'm getting dreadfully old. I have the greatest difficulty in keeping awake sometimes when people are talking. But I mean to fight against it. It's so dreadfully rude and ugly, too. I catch myself sometimes with my mouth open. Laura said quietly, Granny, I have the very best thing for that, quite new. A sweet but rather rueful smile passed over Francis Freeland's face. Now, she said, you're chafing me. And her eyes looked loving. It is doubtful if John understood the drift of Felix's exordium. It is doubtful if he had quite listened, he having so much to not listen to at the home office that the practice was growing on him. A vested interest to John was a vested interest. Culture was culture, and security was certainly security. None of them were symbols of age. Further, the social question, at least so far as it had to do with outbreaks of youth and enthusiasm, was too familiar to him to have any general significance whatever. What with women, labour people and the rest of it, he had no time for philosophy, a dubious process at the best. A man who had to get through so many daily hours of real work did not dissipate his energy in speculation. Though he had not listened to, to Felix's remarks, they had ruffled him. There's no philosophy quite so irritating as that of a brother. True, no doubt, that the country was in a bad way, but as to vested interests and security, that was all nonsense. The guilty causes were free thought and industrialism. Having seen them all off to Hampstead, he gave his mother her good-night kiss. He was proud of her, a wonderful woman, who always put a good face on everything. Even her funny way of always having some new thing or other to do you good. Even that was all part of her wanting to make the best of things. She never lost her form. John worshipped that kind of stoicism which would die with its head up rather than live with its tail down. Perhaps the moment of which he was most proud in all his life was that, when at the finish of his school mile, he ever heard a young badsman say, I like that young chap's running. He breathes through his bastard nose. At that moment, if he'd stooped to breathe through his mouth, he must have won. As it was, he had lost in great distress and perfect form. When then he had kissed Frances Freeland and watched her ascend the stairs, breathless because she would breathe through her nose to the very last step, he turned into his study, lighted his pipe, and sat down to a couple of hours of a report upon the forces of constabulary available in the various counties, in the event of any further agricultural rioting, such as had recently taken place on a mild scale, in one or two districts where there was still Danish blood. He worked at the numbers steadily, with just that engineer's touch of mechanical invention which had caused it to be so greatly valued in a department where the evolution of twelve policemen out of ten was constantly desired. His mastery of figures was highly prized, for while it had not any of that flamboyance which had come from America in the game of poker, it possessed a kind of English optimism, only dangerous when, as rarely happened, it was put to the test. He worked two full pipes long, and looked at the clock. Twelve. No good knocking off just yet. He had no liking for bed this many a long year, having, from loyalty to memory and a drier sense of what became one in the home department, preserved his form against temptations of the flesh. Yet somehow, tonight he felt no spring, no inspiration, in his handling of county constabulary. A kind of English stolidity about them baffled him. Ten of them remained ten and, leaning that forehead whose height so troubled Francis Freeland on his neat hand, he felt a brooding. Those young people with everything before them, 
Did he envy them? Or was he glad of his own age? Fifty. Fifty already. A fogey. An official fogey. For all the world like an umbrella that every day someone put into a stand and left there till it was time to take it out again. Neatly rolled, too, with an elastic and button. And this fancy, which had never come to him before, surprised him. One day he too would wear out, slit up all his seams, and they would leave him at home, or give him away to the butler. He went to the window, a scent of, of May or something, and nothing in sight save houses just like his own. He looked up at the strip of sky privileged to hang just there. He'd got a bit of rusty with his stars. There, however, certainly was Venus, and he thought of how he'd stood by the ship's rail on that honeymoon trip of his twenty years ago, giving his young wife her first lesson in counting the stars. And something very deep down, very mossed and crusted over in John's heart, beat and stirred, and hurt him. Nedda. He caught her looking at that young fellow just as Anne had once looked at him, John Freeland, now an official fogey, an umbrella in a stand. There was a policeman, how ridiculous the fellow looked, putting one foot before the other, flirting his lantern and trying the area gates. This confounded scent of Hawthorne. Could it be Hawthorne? Got here into the heart of London? The look in that girl's eyes. What was he about, to let them make him feel as though he could give his soul for a face looking up into his own, for a breast touching his, and the scent of a woman's hair? Hang it, he would smoke a cigarette and go to bed. He turned out the light and began to mount the stairs. They creaked abominably. The felt must be wearing out. A woman about the place would have kept them quiet. Reaching the landing of the second floor, he paused a moment from habit to look down into the dark hall. A voice, thin, sweet, almost young, said, "'Is that you, darling?' John's heart stood still. "'What was that?' Then he perceived that the door of the room that had been his wife's was open, and remembered that his mother was in there. "'What, are you asleep, mother?' Francis Freeland's voice answered cheerfully. "'Oh, no, dear, I'm never asleep before two. Come in.' John entered. Propped very high on her pillows, in perfect regularity, his mother lay. Her carved face was surmounted by a piece of fine lace. Her thin white fingers on the turner of the sheet moved in continual interlocking. Her lips smiled. "'There's something you must have,' she said. "'I left my door open on purpose. "'Give me that little bottle, darling.' "'John took from a small table by the bed a still smaller bottle. "'Francis Freeland opened it, and out came three tiny white globules. "'Now,' she said, "'pop them in. "'You've no idea how they'll send you to sleep. "'They're the most splendid things, perfectly harmless. "'Just let them rest on the tongue and swallow.' "'John let them rest. "'They were sweetish.' swallowed. "'How is it, then,' he said, "'that you never go to sleep before two? Francis Freeland caught the little bottle, as if enclosing within it that awkward question. "'They don't happen to act with me, darling, but that's nothing. It's a very thing for anyone who has to sit up so late.' And her eyes searched his face. "'Yes,' they seemed to say, "'I know you pretend to have work, but if only you had a dear little wife.' "'I shall leave you this bottle when I go.' "'Kiss me.' "'John bent down, and received one of those kisses of hers "'that had such sudden vitality in the middle of them, "'as if her lips were trying to get inside his cheek. "'From the door he looked back. "'She was smiling, composed again to her stoic wakefulness. "'Shall I shut the door, mother?' "'Please, darling.' "'With a little lump in his throat, John closed the door. "'End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of The Freelands by John Goldsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Seventeen. The London which Derrick had said should be blown up was at its maximum of life those May days. Even on this outer rampart of Hampstead, people, engines, horses, all had a touch of the spring fever. Indeed, especially on this rampart of Hampstead was there increase of the effort to believe that nature was not dead and embalmed in books. The poets, painters, talkers who lived up there 
were at each other all the time in their great game of make-believe. How could it be otherwise, when there was veritably blossom on the trees and the chimneys were ceasing to smoke? How otherwise, when the sun actually shone on the ponds? But the four young people, for Alan joined in, hypnotised by Sheila, did not stay in Hampstead. Chiefly on top of tram and bus they roamed the wilderness. Bethel Green and Leytonstone, Kensington and Lambeth, St. James's and Soho, Whitechapel, Shoreditch, West Ham and Piccadilly, they traversed the whole antique at its most ebullient moment. They knew their Whitman and their Dostoevsky sufficiently to be aware that they ought to love and delight in everything, in the gentleman walking down Piccadilly with a flower in his buttonhole, and in the ladies sewing that buttonhole in Bethnal Green, in the orator boarding himself hoarse close to the marble arch, the coster loading his barrow in Covent Garden, and in Uncle John Freeland rejecting petitions in Whitehall. All these things, of course, together with the long lines of little grey houses in Camden Town, long lines of carts with bobtail horses rattling over Blackfriars Bridge, long smells drifting behind taxicabs. All these things were as delightful and as stimulating to the soul as the clouds that trailed the heavens, the fronds of the lilac, and Leonardo's cartoon in the diploma gallery. All were equal manifestations of that energy and flower known as life. They knew that everything they saw and felt and smelled ought equally to make them long to catch creatures to their hearts and cry Hosanna. And Netta and Alan, bred in Hampstead, even knew that to admit that these things did not at all move them in the same way would be regarded as a sign of anemia. Nevertheless, most queerly, these four young people confessed to each other all sorts of sensations besides that Hosanna one. They even confessed to rage and pity and disgust one moment, and to joy and dreams the next, and they differed greatly as to what excited which. It was truly odd. The only thing on which they did seem to agree was that they were having a, a thundering good time. A sort of sense of blow everything was in their wings, and this was due not to the fact that they were thinking of and loving and admiring the little grey streets and the gentlemen in Piccadilly, as no doubt in accordance with modern culture they should have been, but to the fact that they were loving and admiring themselves, and that entirely without the trouble of thinking about it at all. The practice, too, of dividing into couples was distinctly precious to them, for though they never failed to start out together, they never failed to come home two by two. In this way did they put to a confusion Whitman and Dostoevsky and all the other thinkers in Hampstead. In the daytime, they all, save Alan, felt that London ought to be blown up. But at night it undermined their philosophies, so that they sat silent on the tops of their respective buses, with arms twined in each other's. For then a something seemed to have floated up from that mass of houses and machines, of men and trees, and to be hovering above them, violet-coloured, caught between the stars and the lights, a spirit of such overpowering beauty that it drenched even Alan in a kind of awe. After all, the huge creature that sat with such a giant's weight on the country's chest, the monster that has spoiled so many fields and robbed so many lives of peace and health, could fly at night upon blue and gold and purple wings, murmur a passionate lullaby, and fall into deep sleep. One such night they went to the gallery at the opera, to supper at an oyster shop under Alan's pilotage, and then set out to walk back to Hampstead, timing themselves to catch the dawn. They had not gone twenty steps up Southampton Row before Alan and Sheila were forty steps in front. A fellow feeling had made Derrick and Nedda stand to watch an old man who walked, tortuous, extremely happy, bidding them all come. And when they moved on, it was very slowly, just keeping sight of the others across the lumbered dimness of Covent Garden, where tarpaulin-covered carts and barrows seemed to slumber under the blinks of lamps and watchmen's lanterns. Across Long Acre they came into a street where there was not a soul save the two others, a long way ahead. Walking with his arm tightly laced with hers, touching her all down one side, Derrick felt that it would be glorious to be attacked by night birds in this dark, lonely street, to have a splendid fight and drive them off, showing himself to Nedda for a man and her protector. But nothing save one black cat came near, and that ran for its life. 
He bent round and looked under the blue veil thing that wrapped Netta's head. Her face seemed mysteriously lovely, and her eyes lifted so quickly, mysteriously true. She said, Derek, I feel like a hill with the sun on it. I feel like that yellow cloud with the wind in it. I feel like an apple tree coming into blossom. I feel like a giant. I feel like a song. I feel I could sing you. On a river floating along, a wide one with great plains on each side, and beasts coming down to drink, and either the sun or a yellow moon shining, and someone singing too far off. The red sarafan. Let's run. From that yellow cloud sailing in moonlight, a spurt of rain had driven into their faces, and they ran as fast as their blood was flowing, and the raindrops coming down, jumping half the width of the little dark streets, clutching each other's arms. And peering round into her face, so sweet and breathless, into her eyes so dark and dancing, he felt he could run all night if he had her there to run beside him through the dark. Into another street they dashed, and again another, till she stopped, panting. "'Where are we now?' Neither knew. A policeman put them right for Portland Place. Half-past one, and it would be dawn soon after three. They walked soberly again, now into the outer circle of Regent's Park. Talked soberly, too, discussing sublunary matters. And every now and then, their arms round each other, gave little convulsive squeezes. The rain had stopped, and the moon shone clear. By its light the trees and flowers were clothed in colours whose blood had spilled away. The town's murmur was dying, the house lights dead already. They came out of the park into a road where the latest taxis were rattling past. A face, a bare neck, silk hat or shirk front gleamed in the window squares, and now and then a laugh came floating through. They stopped to watch them from under the low-hanging branches of an acacia tree, and Derrick, gazing at her face, still wet with rain, so young and round and soft, thought, "'And she loves me.' Suddenly she clutched him round the neck, and their lips met. They talked not at all for a long time after that kiss, walking slowly up the long, empty road, while the whitish clouds sailed across the dark river of the sky, and the moon slowly sank. This was the most delicious part of all that long walk home, for the kiss had made them feel as though they had no bodies, but were just two spirits walking side by side. This is its curious effect sometimes in first love, between the very young. Having sent Flora to bed, Felix was sitting up among his books. There was no need to do this, for the young folk had latch keys, but having begun the vigil, he went on with it, a volume about Eastern philosophies on his knee, a bowl of Narcissus blooms giving forth unexpected whiffs of odour beside him. And he sank into a long reverie. Could it be said, as was said in this Eastern book, the man's life was really but a dream? Could that be said with any more truth than it had once been said that he rose again in his body to perpetual life? Could anything be said with truth, save that we knew nothing? Or was that not really what had always been said by man, that we knew nothing, but were just blown over and about the world like sows of wind, in obedience to some immortal, unknowable coherence? But had that want of knowledge ever retarded what was known as the upward growth of man? Had it ever stopped man from working, fighting, loving, dying like a hero, if need were? Had faith ever been anything but embroidery to an instinctive heroism, so strong that it needed no such trappings? Had faith ever been anything but anodyne, or gratification of the aesthetic sense? Or had it really body and substance of its own? Was it something absolute and solid that he, Felix Freeland, had missed? Or again, was it perhaps but the natural concomitant of youth, a naive effervescence with which thought and brooding had to part? And, turning the page of his book, he noticed that he could no longer see to read. The lamp had grown too dim, and showed but a decorative glow in the bright moonlight flooding through the study window. He got up and put another log on the fire, for these last nights of May were chilly. Nearly three. Where were these young people? Had he been asleep and they come in? Sure enough, in the hall, Alan's hat and Sheila's cloak, the dark red one he admired when she went forth, 
were lying on a chair. But of the other two, nothing. He crept upstairs. Their doors were open. They certainly took their time, these young lovers. And the same sore feeling which had attacked Felix when Nedda first told him of her love came on him badly in the small of the night when his vitality was lowest. All the hours she spent clambering about him, or quietly resting on his knee with her head tucked in just where his arm and shoulder met, listening while he read or told her stories, and now and again turning those clear eyes of hers wide open to his face to see if he meant it. The wilful little tugs of her hand, when they too went exploring the customs of birds or bees or flowers, all her, Daddy, I love yous, and her rushes to the front door and long hugs when he came back from a travel, all those later crookings of her little finger in his, and the times he'd sat when she did not know it, watching her and thinking, that little creature with all that's before her is my very own daughter to take care of and share joy and sorrow with. Each one of all these seemed to come now and tweak at him, as the songs of blackbirds tweak the heart of one who lies, unable to get out into the spring. His lamp had burned itself quite out, the moon was fallen below the clump of pines, and away to the northeast something stirred in the stain and texture of the sky. Felix opened the window. What peace out there! The chill, scentless peace of night, waiting for dawn's renewal of warmth and youth. Through that bay window facing north he could see on one side of the town, still wan with the light of its lamps, on the other the country, whose dark bloom was greying fast. Suddenly a tiny bird twittered, and Felix saw his two truants coming slowly from the gate across the grass, his arm round her shoulders, hers round his waist. With their backs turned to him, they passed the corner of the house, across where the garden sloped away. There they stood above the wide country, their bodies outlined against the sky, fast-growing light, evidently waiting for the sun to rise. Silent they stood, while the birds, one by one, twittered out their first calls. And suddenly Felix saw the boy fling his hands up into the air. The sun, far away on the grey horizon, was a flare of red. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 18 The anxieties of the Lady Mallorings of this life concerning the moral welfare of their humbler neighbours are inclined to march in front of events. The behaviour in Trist's cottage was more correct than it would have been in nine out of ten middle or upper-class demean under similar conditions. Between the big labourer and that woman, who, since the epileptic fit, had again come into residence, there had passed nothing whatever that might not have been witnessed by Biddy and her two nurslings. For love is an emotion singularly dumb and undemonstrative in those who live the life of the fields, passion a feeling severely beneath the thumb of a propriety born of the age-long absence of exigent opportunities and the ascetic sense, and those two waited, almost as a matter of course, for the marriage which was forbidden them in this parish. The most they did was to sit and look at one another. On the day of which Felix had seen the dawn at Hampstead, Sir Gerald's agent tapped on the door of Trist's cottage, and was answered by Biddy, just in from the school midday meal. "'Your father's home, my dear?' "'No, sir. Auntie's in. Asked your auntie to come and speak to me.' The mother-child vanished up the narrow stairs, and the agent sighed. A strong-built, leathery-skinned man in a brown suit and leggings, with a bristly little moustache and yellow whites to his eyes, he did not, as he had said to his wife that morning, like the job a little bit. And while he stood there waiting, Susie and Billy emerged from the kitchen and came to stare at him. The agent returned that stare till a voice behind him said, "'Yes, sir?' That woman was certainly no great shakes to look at, a fresh, decent, faithful sort of body. And he said gruffly, "'Morning, miss. Sorry to say my orders are to make the clearance here. I suppose Trist didn't think we should act on it, but I'm afraid I've got to put his things out, you know. Now, where are you all going? That's the point.' I shall go home, I suppose, but Trist and the children, we don't know. 
The agent tapped his leggings with a riding cane. So you've been expecting it, he said with relief. That's right. And staring down at the mother child, he added, Well, what do you say, my dear? You look full of sense, you do. Biddy answered, I'll go and tell Mr. Freeland, sir. Ah, you're a bright maid. He'll know where to put you for the time being. Have you had your dinner? No, sir, it's just ready. Better have it, better have it first. No hurry. What have you got in that pot that smells so good? Bubble and squeak, sir. Bubble and squeak, ah. With those words, the agent withdrew, to where, in a farm wagon drawn up by the side of the road, three men were solemnly pulling at their pipes. He moved away from them a little, for, as he expressed it to his wife afterward, Look bad, you know, look bad, anybody seeing me. Those three little children, that's where it is. If our friends of the all had to do these jobs for themselves, there wouldn't be any to do. Presently, from his discreet distance, he saw the mother-child going down the road toward Todd's in her blue pinny and corn-coloured hair. Nice little thing. Pretty little thing, too. Pity, great pity. And he went back to the cottage. On his way a thought struck him so that he well-nigh shivered. Suppose the little thing brought back that Mrs. Freeland, the lady who always went about in blue without a hat. Phew! Mr. Freeland, he was another sort. A bit off, certainly. Harmless, quite harmless. But that lady... And he entered the cottage. The woman was washing up. Seemed a sensible body. When the two kids cleared off to school, he could go to work and get it over. The sooner the better, before people came hanging round. A job of this kind sometimes made nasty blood. His yellowish eyes took in the nature of the task before him. Funny jam-up they did get about them, to be sure. Every blessed little thing they never bought, and more, too. Have to take precious good care nothing got smashed, or the law would be on the other leg. And he said to the woman, "'Now, miss, can I begin?' "'I can't stop you, sir.' "'No,' he thought, "'you can't stop me, and I blame well wish you could.' But he said, Got an old wagon out here. Thought I'd save him damage by weather or anything. We'll put everything in that and run it up into the empty barn at Marrow and leave it. And there they'll be for him when he wants them. The woman answered, You're very kind, I'm sure. Perceiving that she meant no irony, the agent produced a sound from somewhere deep and went out to summon his men. With the best intentions, however, it is not possible, even in villages so scattered that they cannot be said to exist, to do anything without every one knowing, and the work of putting out the household goods of the Trist family and placing them within the wagon was not an hour in progress before the road in front of the cottage contained its knot of watchers. Old Gaunt first, alone, for the rogue girl had gone to Mr Cuthcott's and Tom Gaunt was at work. The old man had seen evictions in his time and looked on silently with a faint sardonic grin. Four children, so small that not even school had any use for them as yet, soon gathered round his legs, followed by mothers coming to retrieve them, and there was no longer silence. Then came two labourers on their way to a job, a stonebreaker, and two more women. It was through this little throng that the mother-child and Kirstine passed into the fast-being-gutted cottage. The agent was standing by Trist's bed, keeping up a stream of comment to two of his men, who were taking that aged bed to pieces. It was his habit to feel less when he talked more, but no one could have fallen into a more perfect taciturnity than he when he saw Kirstein coming up those narrow stairs. In so small a space as this room, where his head nearly touched the ceiling, was it fair to be confronted by that lady? He put it to his wife that evening. Was it fair? He had seen a mother wild duck look like that when you took away its young, snaky fierce above the neck and its dark eye. He'd seen a mare, going to bite, looked not half so vicious. There she stood, and, let me have it, not a bit. Too much ready for that, you know. Just looked at me and said very quiet, Oh, Mr Simmons, and are you really doing this? And put her hand on that little girl of his. Orders are orders, ma'am. What could I say? Ah, she said, yes, orders are orders, but they needn't be obeyed. As to that, ma'am, I said, mind you, she's a lady, you can't help feeling that I'm a working man, the same as Tristia, got to earn my living. "'So I have slave-drivers, Mr. Simmons. "'Every profession,' I said, "'has got its dirty jobs, ma'am, and that's a fact. "'And we'll have,' she said, "'so long as professional men consent "'to do the dirty work of their employers.' "'And where should I be, I should like to know,' I said, "'if I went on that lay. "'I've got to take the rough with the smooth.' 
Well, she said, Mr. Friedland and I will take Trist and the little ones in at present. Good-hearted people do a lot for the neighbours in their way. All the same, she's a bit of a vixen. Picture of a woman, too, standing there. Shows blood, mind you. Once said, all over, no nagging. She took the little girl off with her. I'm pretty small, I felt, knowing I'd got to finish that job, and the folk outside getting nastier all the time. Not saying much, of course, but looking a lot. The agent paused in his recital, and gazed fixedly at a blue bottle crawling up the window pane. Stretching out his thumb and finger, he nipped it suddenly and threw it in the grate. Blessed if that fellow himself didn't turn up, just as I was finishing. I was sorry for the man, you know. There was his home turned out of doors. Big man, too. You blankety-blank, he says. If I'd been here, you shouldn't have done this. Thought he was going to hit me. Come, Trist, I said. It's not my doing, you know. I oh, said, I know that, and it'll be blanky well the worse for them. Rough tongue, no class of man at all he is. Yes, he said, let them look out. I'll be even with them yet. None of that, I told him. You know what sides the law's buttered. I'll make it easy for you, too, keeping your things in the wagon, ready to shift any time. He gave me a look. He's got very queer eyes, swimming, sad sort of eyes, like a man in liquor. And he said, I've been here twenty years, he said. My wife died here. And all of a sudden he went as dumb as a fish. Never let his eyes off us, though, while we finished up the last of it. Made me feel funny, seeing him glowering like that all the time. He'll savage something over this, you mark my words. Again the agent paused, and remained as though transfixed, holding that face of his, whose yellow had run into the whites of the eyes, as still as wood. He's got some feeling for the place, I suppose, he said suddenly. Or maybe they've put it to him about his rights. There's plenty of him like that. Well, anyhow, nobody likes his private affairs turned inside out for everyone to gape at. I wouldn't myself. And with that deeply felt remark, the agent put out his leathery yellow thumb and finger and nipped a second blue bottle. While the agent was thus recounting to his wife the day's doings, the evicted Trist sat on the end of his bed in a ground-floor room of Todd's cottage. He had taken off his heavy boots, and his feet in their thick, soiled socks were thrust into a pair of Todd's carpet slippers. He sat without moving, precisely as if someone had struck him a blow in the centre of the forehead, and over and over again he turned the heavy thought. They turned me out of there. I'd done nothing, and they turned me out of there. Blast them! They turned me out of there! In the orchard, Todd sat with a grave and puzzled face, surrounded by the three little trysts, and at the wicket gate, Castine, awaiting the arrival of Derrick and Sheena, summoned home by telegram, stood in the evening glow, her blue-clad figure still as that of any worshipper at the Muetzin call. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 19 A fire causing the destruction of several ricks and an empty cowshed occurred in the early morning of Thursday on the home farm of Sir Gerald Mallorings' estate in Worcestershire. Grave suspicions of arson are entertained, but up to the present no arrest has been made. The authorities are in doubt whether the occurrence has any relation with recent similar outbreaks in the eastern counties. So Stanley read at breakfast in his favourite paper, and the little leader thereon. The outbreak of fire on Sir Gerald Mallorings' Worcestershire property may or may not have any significance as a symptom of agrarian unrest. We shall watch the upshot with some anxiety. Certain it is that unless the authorities are prepared to deal sharply with arson, or other cases of deliberate damage to the property of landlords, we may bid good-bye to any hope of ameliorating the lot of the labourer and so on. If Stanley had risen and paced the room, there would have been a great deal to be said for him, for though he did not know as much as Felix of the nature and sentiments of Todd's children, he knew enough to make any but an Englishman uneasy. The fact that he went on eating ham, and said to Clara, half a cup, was proof positive of that mysterious quality called phlegm, which had long enabled his country to enjoy the peace of a weedy duck-pond. Stanley, a man of some intelligence, witness his grasp of the secrets of successful plough-making, none for the home market, 
had often considered this important proposition of phlegm. People said England was becoming degenerate and hysterical, growing soft and nervous and towny, and all the rest of it. In his view there was a good deal of bosh about that. Look, he would say, at the weight that chauffeur's put on. Look at the House of Commons and the size of the upper classes. If there were growing up little shrill types of working men and socialists and new women and halfpenny papers and a rather larger crop of professors and long-haired chaps, all the better for the rest of the country. The flesh all these skimpy ones had lost, solid people had put on. The country might be suffering a bit from officialism and the tendency of modern thought, but the breed was not changing. John Bull was there all right under his moustache. Take it off and clap on little side-whiskers, and you had as many bulls as you liked any day. There would be no social upheaval so long as the climate was what it was. And with this simple formula, and a kind of very deep-down throaty chuckle, he would pass to a subject of more immediate importance. There was something indeed rather masterly in his grasp of the fact that rain might be trusted to put out any fire, give it time, and he kept a special vessel in a special corner which recorded for him faithfully the number of inches that fell. And now and again he wrote to his paper to say that there were more inches in his vessel than there had been for thirty years. His conviction that the country was in a bad way was nothing but a skin affection, causing him local irritation rather than affecting the deeper organs of his substantial body. He did not readily confide in Clara concerning his own family, having in a marked degree the truly domestic quality of thinking it superior to his wife's. She had been a Thompson, not one of THE Thompsons, and it was quite a question whether he or she were trying to forget that fact the faster. But he did say to her, as he was getting into the car, "'It's just possible I might go round by Todd's on my way home. I want to run.' She answered, "'Be careful what you say to that woman. I don't want her here by any chance. The young ones were quite bad enough.' and when he had put in his day at the works, he did turn the nose of his car toward Todd's. Travelling along grass-bordered roads, the beauty of this England struck his not-too-sensitive spirit and made him almost gasp. It was that moment of the year when the countryside seems to faint from its own loveliness, from the intoxication of its scents and sounds. Creamy white may, splashed here and there with crimson, flooded the hedges in breaking waves of flower foam. The fields were all buttercup glory, Every tree had its cuckoo calling, every bush its blackbird or thrush in full even song. Swallows were flying rather low, and the sky, whose moods they watch, had the slumberous surcharge beauty of a long, fine day, with showers not far away. Some orchards were still in blossom, and the great wild bees, hunting over flowers and grasses warm to their touch, kept the air deeply murmurous. Movement, light, colour, song, scent, the warm air, and the fluttering leaves were confused, till one had almost become the other. And Stanley thought, for he was not rhapsodic, "'Wonderful pretty country! The way everything's looked after, you never see it abroad!' But the car, a creature with little patience for natural beauty, had brought him to the crossroads, and stood, panting slightly, under the cliff bank whereon grew Todd's cottage, so loaded now with lilac, wisteria, and roses, that from the road nothing but a peak or two of the thatched roof could be seen. Stanley was distinctly nervous. It was not a weakness his face and figure were very capable of showing, but he felt that dryness of mouth and quivering of chest which precede adventures of the soul. Advancing up the steps and pebbled path, which Clara had trodden once, just nineteen years ago, and he himself but three times as yet in all, he cleared his throat and said to himself, "'Easy, old man!' What is it, after all? She won't bite. And at the very doorway he came upon her. What there was about this woman to produce in a man of common sense such peculiar sensations, he no more knew after seeing her than before. Felix, on returning from his visit, had said, She's like a song of the Hebrides sung in the middle of a programme of English ballads. The remark, as any literary man's might, had conveyed nothing to Stanley, and that in a far-fetched way. Still, when she said, "'Will you come in?' he felt heavier and thicker than he ever remembered feeling, as a glass of stout might feel coming across a glass of claret. It was perhaps the gaze of her eyes, whose colour he could not determine, under eyebrows that waved in the middle and twitched faintly, 
or a dress that was blue with the queerest effect of another colour at the back of it. Or, perhaps, the feeling of a torrent flowing there under a coat of ice that might give way in little holes, so that your leg went in, but not the whole of you. Something, anyway, made him feel both small and heavy. That awkward combination for a man accustomed to associate himself with cheerful but solid dignity. In seating himself, by request, at a table, in what seemed to be a sort of kitchen, he experienced a singular sensation in the legs, and heard her say, as it might be to the air, "'Pity, dear, take Susie and Billy out.' And then upon a little girl with a sad and motherly face came crawling out from underneath the table, and dropped him a little curtsy. Then another still smaller girl came out, and a very small boy, staring with all his eyes. All these things were against Stanley, and he felt that if he did not make it quite clear that he was there, he would soon not know where he was. "'I came,' he said, "'to talk about this business up at Mallorings.' And encouraged by having begun, he added, "'Whose kids were those?' A level voice with a faint lisp answered him. "'They belonged to a man called Twith. He was turned out of his cottage on Wednesday because his dead wife's sister was staying with him, so we've taken them in. Did you notice that look on the face of the eldest?' Stanley nodded. In truth, he had noticed something, though what he could not have said. At nine years old, she has to do the housework and be a mother to the other two, besides going to school. This is all because Lady Mallering has conscientious scruples about marriage with the deceased wife's sister. Certainly, thought Stanley. That does sound a bit thick. And he asked, Is the woman here too? No, she's gone home for the present. He felt relief. I suppose Mallering's point is, he said, whether or not you're to do what you like with your own property. For instance, if you'd let this cottage to someone you thought was harming the neighbourhood, wouldn't you terminate his tenancy? She answered, still in that level voice. Her action is cowardly, narrow, and tyrannical, and no amount of sophistry will make me think differently. Stanley felt precisely as if one of his feet had gone through the ice into water so cold that it seemed burning hot. Sophistry? In a plain man like himself? He had always connected the word with Felix. He looked at her, realising suddenly that the association of his brother's family with the outrage on Mannering's estate was probably even nearer than he had feared. "'Look here, Kirstine, he said, uttering the unlikely name with resolution, for after all she was his sister-in-law. "'Did this fellow ever set fire to Mannering's rakes?' He was aware of a queer flash, a quiver, a something all over her face, which passed at once back to its intent gravity. "'We have no reason to suppose so, but tyranny produces revenge, as you know.' Stanley shrugged his shoulders. "'It's not my business to go into the rights and wrongs of what's been done, but as a man of the world and a relative, I do ask you to look after your youngsters and see they don't get into a mess. They're an inflammable young people, young blood, you know.' Having made this speech, Stanley looked down, with a feeling that it would give her more chance. "'You are very kind,' he heard her saying in that quiet, faintly lisping voice, "'but there are certain principles involved.' And, suddenly, his curious fear of this woman took shape. "'Principles?' He had unconsciously been waiting for that word, than which none was more like a red rag to him. "'What principles can possibly be involved in going against the law?' "'And where the law is unjust?' Stanley was startled, but he said, "'Remember that your principles, as you call them, "'may hurt other people besides yourself, "'Todd and your children most of all. "'How is the law unjust, may I ask?' "'She had been sitting at the table opposite, "'but she got up now and went to the hearth. "'For a woman of forty-two, as he supposed she would be, "'she was extraordinarily lithe, "'and her eyes, fixed on him from under those twitching, wavy brows, had a curious glow in their darkness. The few silver threads of the mass of her over-fine black hair seemed to give it extra vitality. The whole of her had a sort of intensity that made him profoundly uncomfortable. And he thought suddenly, Poor old Todd, fancy having to go to bed with that woman. Without raising her voice, she began answering his question. These poor people have no means of setting law in motion, no means of choosing where and how they will live, no means of doing anything except just what they are told. The Mannerings have the means to set the law in motion, to choose where and how to live, and to dictate to others. That is why the law is unjust. 
with every independent pound a year, this equal law of yours varies. Phew, said Sally, that's a proposition. I give you a simple case. If I had chosen not to marry Todd, but to live with him in free love, we could have done it without inconvenience. We have some independent income. We could have afforded to disregard what people thought or did. We could have bought, as we did buy, our piece of land and our cottage, out of which we could not have been turned. Since we don't care for society, it would have been made absolutely no difference to our present position. But Trist, who does not even want to defy the law, what happens to him? What happens to hundreds of labourers all over the country who venture to differ in politics, religion or morals from those who own them? "'By George,' thought Stanley, "'it's true in a way. I never looked at it quite like that.' But the feeling that he had come to persuade her to be reasonable and the deeply rooted Englishry of him conspired to make him say, "'That's all very well, but, you see, it's only a necessary incident of property-holding. You can't interfere with plain rights.' "'You mean an evil inherent in property-holding?' "'If you like, I don't split words. "'The lesser of two evils. "'What's your remedy? "'You don't want to abolish property. "'You've confessed that property gives you your independence.' "'Again that curious quiver and flash. "'Yes, but if people haven't decency enough "'to see for themselves how the law favours their independence, "'they must be shown that it doesn't pay to do to others "'as they would hate to be done by. "'And you wouldn't try reasoning?' They're not amenable to reason. Stanley took up his hat. Well, I think some of us are. I see your point. But, you know, Varnus never did any good. It isn't, it isn't English. She did not answer. And, nonplussed thereby, he added lamely, I should have liked to have seen Todd and your youngsters. Remember me to them. Clara sent her regards. And looking round the room in a rather lost way, he held out his hand. He had an impression of something warm and dry put into it, with even a little pressure. Back in the car he said to his chauffeur, "'Go home the other way, Batter, past the church.' The vision of that kitchen, with its brick floor, its black oak beams, bright copper pans, the flowers on the window sill, the great open hearth, and the figure of that woman in her blue dress standing before it, with her foot poised on a log, clung to his mind's eye with curious fidelity. And those three kids popping out like that, proof that the whole thing was not a rather bad dream. Queer business, he thought. Bad business. That woman's uncommonly all there, though. Not in what she said, too. Where the deuce should we all be if there were many like her? And suddenly he noticed in a field to the right a number of men coming along the hedge towards the road, evidently labourers. What were they doing? He stopped the car. There were fifteen or twenty of them, and back in the field he could see a girl's red blouse, where a little group of four still lingered. By George, he thought, those must be the young Todds going it. And curious to see what it might mean, Stanley fixed his attention on the gate through which the men were bound to come. First emerged a fellow in corduroys tied below the knee, with long brown moustaches decorating a face that, for all its haggardness, had a jovial look. Next came a sturdy little red-faced bow-legged man, in shirt-sleeves rolled up, walking alongside a big dark fellow with a cap pushed up on his head, who had evidently just made a joke. Then came two old men, one of whom was limping, and three striplings. Another big man came along next, in a little clearance, as it were, between main groups. He walked heavily, and looked up lowering at the car. The fellow's eyes were queer and threatening, and sad, giving Stanley a feeling of discomfort. Then came a short, square man with an impudent, loquacious face and a bit of swagger in his walk. He too looked up at Stanley and made some remark which caused two thin-faced fellows with him to grin sheepishly. A spare old man, limping heavily, with a yellow face and drooping grey moustaches, walked next alongside a warped, bent fellow with yellowish hair all over his face, whose expression struck Stanley as half idiotic. Then two more striplings of seventeen or so, whittling at bits of sticks. An active, clean-shorn man with drawn-in cheeks. And, last of all, a small man by himself, without a cap on a round head covered with thin, light hair, moving at a dot-here, dot-there walk, as though he had beast to drive. Stanley noticed that all, save the big man with the threatening sad eyes, the old yellow-faced man with a limp, and the little man who came last, lost in his imaginary beasts, 
looked at the car furtively as they went their ways. And Stanley thought, English peasant, poor devil, who is he? What is he? Who'd miss him if he did die out? What's the use of all this fuss about him? He's done for. Glad I've nothing to do with him at Beckett, anyway. Back to the land. Independent peasantry. Not much. Can't say that to Clara, though. Not the bottom out of her weekends. And to his chauffeur he muttered, Get on, batter. So, through the peace of that country, all laid down in grass, through the dignity and loveliness of trees and meadows, this May evening, with the birds singing under a sky surcharged with warmth and colour, he sped home to dinner. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 20 But next morning, turning on his back as it came dawn, Stanley thought, with the curious intensity which in those small hours so soon becomes fear, "'By Jove, I don't trust that woman a yard. I shall wire for Felix.' And the longer he lay on his back, the more the conviction bored a hole in him. There was a kind of fever in the air nowadays that women seemed to catch as children caught the measles. What did it all mean? England used to be a place to live in. One would have thought an old country like this would have got through its infantile diseases. Hysteria. No one gave in to that. Still, one must look out. Arson was about the limit. And Stanley had a vision suddenly of his plough-works in flames. Why not? The ploughs were not for the English market. Who knew whether these labouring fellows mightn't take that as a grievance, if trouble began to spread? This somewhat far-fetched notion, having started to burrow, threw up a really horrid molehill in Stanley. And it was only the habit in the human mind of saying suddenly to fears, "'Stop! I'm tired of you!' that sent him to sleep about half-past four. He did not, however, neglect to wire to Felix. "'If at all possible, come down again at once. Awkward business at Joyfield's.' Nor, on the charitable pretext of employing two old fellows past ordinary work, did he omit to treble his night watchman. On Wednesday, the day of which he had seen the dawn rise, Felix had already been startled, on returning from his constitutional, to discover his niece and nephew in the act of departure. All the explanation vouchsafes had been, "'Awfully sorry, Uncle Felix. Mother's wired for us.' Save for the general uneasiness which attended on all actions of that woman, Felix would have felt relieved at their going. They had disturbed his life, slipped between him and Nedda, so much so that he did not even expect her to come and tell him why they had gone, nor feel inclined to ask her. So little breaks the fine coherence of really tender ties. The deeper the quality of affection, the more it starts and puffs, and from sheer sensitive feeling, each for the other, spares attempt to get back into touch. His paper, though he did not apply it to the word favourite, having that proper literary feeling towards all newspapers, that they took him in rather than he them, gave him on Friday morning precisely the same news of the rick-burning as it gave to Stanley at breakfast and to John on his way to the home office. To John, less in the know, it merely brought a knitting of the brow and a vague attempt to recollect the numbers of the Worcestershire Constabulary. To Felix it brought a feeling of sickness. Men whose work in life demands that they shall daily whip their nerves run, as a rule, a little in advance of everything. And goodness knows what he did not see at that moment. He said no word to Nedda, but debated with himself and Flora what, if anything, was to be done. Flora, whose sense of humour seldom deserted her, held the more comfortable theory that there was nothing to be done as yet. Soon enough to cry when milk was spilled. He did not agree, but unable to suggest a better course, followed her advice. On Saturday, however, receiving Stanley's wire, he had much difficulty in not saying to her, "'I told you so.' The question that agitated him now was whether or not to take Nedda with him. Flora said, "'Yes, the child will be the best restraining influence if there is really trouble brewing.' Some feeling fought against this in Felix, but suspecting it to be mere jealousy, he decided to take her. And, to the girl's rather puzzled delight, they arrived at Beckett that day in time for dinner. It was not too reassuring to find John there too. Stanley had also wired him. The matter must indeed be serious. 
The usual weekend was in progress. Clara had made one of her greatest efforts. A Bulgarian had providentially written a book in which he showed, beyond doubt, that persons fed on brown bread, potatoes and margarine gave the most satisfactory results of all. It was a discovery of the first value as a topic for her dinner table, seeming to solve the whole vexed problem of the labourers almost at one stroke. If they could only be got to feed themselves on this perfect programme, what a saving of the situation! On those three edibles, the Bulgarian said, and he had been well translated, a family of five could be maintained at full efficiency for a shilling per day. Why, that would leave nearly eight shillings a week, in many cases more, for rent, firing, insurance, the man's tobacco, and the children's boots. There would be no more of that terrible pinching by the mothers to feed the husband and children properly, of which one heard so much. No more lamentable deterioration in our stock. Brown bread, potatoes, margarine. Quite a great deal could be bribed for seven shillings. And what was more delicious than a well-baked potato with margarine of good quality? The carbohydrates, or was it hypocardrates, oh, oh yes, the, the carbohydrates, would be present in really sufficient quantity. Little else was talked of all through dinner at her end of the table. Above the flowers, which Frances Freeland always insisted on arranging, and very charmingly, when she was there, over bare shoulders and white shirt fronts, those words bombed and rebombed. Brown bread, potatoes, margarine, carbohydrates, calorific. They mingled with the creamy sizzle of champagne, with the soft murmur of well-bred dilutition. White bosoms heaved and eyebrows rose at them. And now and again some bigwig versed in sards murmured the word fats. An agricultural population fed to the point of efficiency without disturbance of the existing state of things. Eureka! If only into the bargain they could be induced to bake their own brown bread and cook their potatoes well. Faces flushed, eyes brightened, and teeth shone. It was the best, the most stimulating dinner ever swallowed in that room. Nor was it until each male guest had eaten, drunk, and talked himself into torpor suitable to the company of his wife that the three brothers could sit in the smoking-room together undisturbed. When Stanley had described his interview with that woman, his glimpse of the red blouse and the labourers' meeting, there was a silence before John said, "'It might be as well if Todd would send his two youngsters abroad for a bit.' Felix shook his head. "'I don't think he would, and I don't think they'd go. But we might try to get those two to see that anything the poor devils of labourers do is bound to record on themselves fourfold. I suppose, he added with sudden malice, a labourer's rising would have no chance. Neither John nor Stanley winced. Rising? Why should they rise? They did in thirty-two. In thirty-two, repeated John. Agriculture had its importance then. Now it has none. Besides, there's no cohesion, no power like the miners or railway men. Rising? No chance, no earthly. Weight of metals dead against it. Felix smiled. Money and guns, guns and money. Confess with me, brethren, that we're glad of metal. John stared, and Stanley drank off his whisky and potash. Felix really was a bit too thick sometimes. Then Stanley said, Wonder what Todd thinks of it all. Will you go over, Felix, and advise that our young friends be more considerate to these poor beggars? Felix nodded, and with, Good night, old man, all round, and no shaking of the hands, the three brothers dispersed. But behind Felix, as he opened his bedroom door, a voice whispered, Dad! And there, in the doorway of the joining room, was Nedda in her dressing gown. Do come in for a minute. I've been waiting up. You are late. Felix followed her into her room. The pleasure he would once have had in this midnight conspiracy was superseded now, and he stood blinking at her gravely. In that blue gown, with her dark hair falling on its lace collar, and her face so round and childish, she seemed more than ever to have defrauded him. Hooking her arm in his, she drew him to the window, and Felix thought, "'She just wants to talk to me about Derrick, dog in the manger that I am. Here goes to be decent,' so he said. "'Well, my dear?' Ned pressed his hand with a little coaxing squeeze. "'Daddy, darling, I do love you.' And though Felix knew that she had grasped what he was feeling, a sort of warmth spread in him. She had begun counting his fingers with one of her own, sitting close beside him. The warmth in Felix deepened, but he thought, "'She must want a good deal out of me.' Then she began, "'Why did we come down again? I know there's something wrong. It's 
it's hard not to know when you're anxious. And she sighed. That little sigh affected Felix. I'd always rather know the truth, Dad. Aunt Clara said something about a fire at the Mannerings. Felix stirred a look at her. Yes, there was a lot in this child of his. Depth, warmth, and strength to hold to things. No use to treat her as a child. And he answered, My dear, there's really nothing beyond what you know. Our young man and Sheila are hotheads, and things over there are working up a bit. We must try and smooth them down. Dad, ought I to back him, whatever he does? What a question! The more so that one cannot answer superficially the questions of those whom one loves. Ah, he said at last, I don't know yet. Some things it's not your duty to do, that's certain. It can't be right to do things simply because he does them. That's not real, however form one is. No, I feel that, only it's so hard to know what I do really think. There's always such a lot of trying to make one feel that only what's nice and cosy is right. And Felix thought, I've been brought up to believe that only Russian girls care for truth. Seems I was wrong. The saints forbid I should be a stumbling block to my own daughter searching for it. And yet, where's it all leading? Is this the same child that told me only the other night she wanted to know everything? She's a woman now. So much for love. And he said, Let's go forward quietly, without expecting too much of ourselves. Yes, Dad. Only I distrust myself so. No one ever got near the truth who didn't. Can we go over to Joyfield's tomorrow? I don't think I could bear a whole day of bigwigs and eating with this hanging. Poor bigwigs. All right, we'll go. And out bed, and think of nothing. Her whisper tickled his ear. You are a darling to me, Dad. He went out comforted. And for some time after she had forgotten everything, he leaned out of his window, smoking cigarettes, and tried to see the body and soul of night. How quiet she was, night with her mystery, bereft of moon, in whose darkness seemed to vibrate still the song of the cuckoos that had been calling so all day. And whisperings of leaves communed with Felix. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 21. What Todd thought of all this was perhaps as much of an enigma to Todd as to his three brothers, and never more so than on that Sunday morning when two police constables appeared at his door with a warrant for the arrest of Trist. After regarding them fixedly for full thirty seconds, he said, Wait! and left them in the doorway. Kirstine was washing breakfast things, which had a leadless glaze, and Trist's three children, extremely tidy, stood motionless at the edge of the little scullery, watching. When she joined him in the kitchen, Todd shut the door. Two policemen, he said, want Trist. Are they to have him? In the life together of these two, there had, from the very start, been a queer understanding as to who should decide what. It had become by now so much a matter of instinct that combative consultations, which bulk so large in married lives, had no place in theirs. A frowning tremor passed over her face. I suppose they must. Derrick is out. Leave it to me, Todd, and take the tidies into the orchard. Todd took the three little trysts to the very spot where Derrick and Nedda had gazed over the darkening fields in exchanging that first kiss, and, sitting on the stump of the apple tree he had cut down, he presented each of them with an apple. While they ate, he stared, and his dog stared at him. How far there worked in Todd the feelings of an ordinary man watching three small children, whose only parent the law was just taking into its charge, it would be rash to say. But his eyes were extremely blue, and there was a frown between them. "'Well, Biddy,' he said at last. Biddy did not reply. The habit of being a mother had imposed on her— together with the gravity of her little, pale, oval face, a peculiar talent for silence. But the round-cheeked Susie said, "'Billy can eat cores.' After this statement, silence was broken only by a munching, till Todd remarked, "'What makes things?' The children, having the instinct that he had not asked them but himself, came closer. He had in his hand a little beetle. "'This beetle lives in rotten wood. Nice chap, isn't he?' "'We kill beetles. We're afraid of them,' says Susie. 
They were now round Todd so close that Billy was standing on one of his large feet, Susie leaning her elbows on one of his broad knees, and Biddy's slender little body pressed against his huge arm. No, said Todd. Beetles are nice chaps. The birds eat them, remarked Billy. This beetle, said Todd, eats wood. It eats through trees, and the trees get rotten. Biddy spoke. Then they don't give no more apples. Todd put the beetle down, and Biddy got off his foot to tread on it. When he had done his best, the beetle emerged and vanished in the grass. Todd, who had offered no remonstrance, stretched out his hand and replaced Billy on his foot. "'What about my treading on you, Billy?' he said. "'Why?' "'I'm big and you're little.' On Billy's square face came a puzzled defiance. If he had not been early toward his station, he would evidently have found some poignant retort. An intoxicated humblebee broke the silence by buzzing into Biddy's fluffed-out corn-gold hair. Todd took it off with his hand. "'Lovely chap, isn't he?' The children, who had recoiled, drew close again, while the drunken bee crawled feebly in the cage of Todd's large hand. "'Bees sting,' said Biddy. "'I fell on a bee, and it stang me.' "'You stang it first, said Todd. "'This chap won't sting. Not for worlds. Stroke it.' Bitty put out her little pale finger, but stayed it a couple of inches from the bee. "'Go on,' said Todd. Opening her mouth a little, Biddy went on and touched the bee. "'It's soft,' she said. "'Why don't it buzz?' "'I want to stroke it too,' said Susie. And Billy stamped a little on Todd's foot. "'No,' said Todd, "'only Biddy.' There was perfect silence, till the dog, rising, approached its nose, black with a splash of pinky whiteness on the end of the bridge, as if to love the bee. "'No,' said Todd. The dog looked at him, and his yellow-brown eyes were dark with anxiety. "'It'll sting the dog's nose,' said Biddy, and Susie and Biddy came yet closer. It was at this moment when the heads of the dog, the bee, Todd, Biddy, Susie and Billy might have been contained within a noose three feet in diameter, that Felix dismounted from Stanley's car, and, coming from the cottage, caught sight of that little idyll under the dappled sunlight of green and blossom. It was something from the core of life, out of the heartbeat of things, like a rare picture or song, the revelation of the childlike wonder and delight to which all other things are but the supernumerary casings, a little pool of simplicity into which fever and yearning sank, and were for a moment drowned. And quite possibly he would have gone away without disturbing them, if the dog had not growled and wagged his tail. But when the children had been sent down into the field, he experienced the usual difficulty in commencing a talk with Todd. How far was his big brother within reach of mere unphilosophic statements? How far was he going to attend to facts? "'We uh, came back yesterday,' he began, Ned and I. "'You know all about Derek and Nedder, I suppose?' Todd nodded. "'What do you think of it?' "'He's a good chap.' "'Yes.' murmured Felix, but a firebrand. This business at Mallorings, what's it going to lead to, Todd? We must look out, old man. Couldn't you send Derrick and Sheila abroad for a bit? Wouldn't go. But after all, they're dependent on you. Don't say that to them. I should never see them again. Felix, who felt the instinctive wisdom of that remark, answered helplessly, What's to be done, then? Sit tight. And Todd's hand came down on Felix's shoulder. But suppose they get into real trouble. Stanley and John don't like it. And there's Mother. And Felix added with sudden heat, Besides, I can't stand Nedder being made anxious like this. Todd removed his hand. Felix would have given a good deal to have been able to see into the brain behind the frowning stare of those blue eyes. Can't help by worrying. What must be, will. Look at the birds. The remark from any other man would have irritated Felix profoundly. Coming from Todd, it seemed the unconscious expression of a really felt philosophy. And, after all, was he not right? What was this life they all lived but a ceaseless worrying over what was to come? Was not all man's unhappiness caused by nervous anticipations of the future? Was not that the disease and the misfortune of the age, perhaps of all the countless ages man had lived through? With an effort he recalled his thoughts from that far flight. What if Todd had rediscovered the secrets of the happiness that belonged to birds and lilies of the field, such overpowering interests in the moment that the future did not exist? Why not? 
were not the only minutes when he himself was really happy, those when he lost himself in work or love? And why were there so few, for want of pressure to the square moment? Yes, all unhappiness was fear and lack of vitality to live the present fully. That was why love and fighting were such poignant ecstasies. They lived their present to the full. And so it would be almost comic to say to those young people, Go away, do nothing in this matter in which your interests and your feelings are concerned. Don't have a present, because you've got to have a future. And he said, I'd give a good deal for your power of losing yourself for the moment, old boy. That's all right, said Todd. He was examining the bark of a tree which had nothing the matter with it, so far as Felix could see, while his dog, who had followed them, carefully examined Todd. Both were obviously lost in the moment, and with a feeling of defeat, Felix led the way back to the cottage. In the brick-floored kitchen, Derrick was striding up and down, while around him, in an equilateral triangle, stood the three women, Sheila at the window, Kirstein by the open hearth, Nedda against the wall opposite. Derrick exclaimed at once, "'Why did you let them, father? Why didn't you refuse to give him up?' Felix looked at his brother. In the doorway, where his curly head nearly touched the wood, Tot's face was puzzled, rueful. He did not answer. "'Anyone could have said he wasn't here. We could have smuggled him away. Now the brutes have got him. I don't know that—' And he made suddenly for the door. Todd did not budge. "'No,' he said. Derrick turned. His mother was at the other door, at the window of the two girls. The comedy of this scene, if there be comedy in the face of grief, was for the moment lost on Felix. "'It's come,' he thought. "'What now?' Derrick had flung himself down at the table and was burying his head in his hands. Sheila went up to him. "'Don't be a fool, Derrick.' However right and natural that remark, it seemed inadequate. And Felix looked at Nedda. The blue motor-scarf she had worn had slipped off her dark head. Her face was white. Her eyes, fixed immovably on Derrick, seemed waiting for him to recognise that she was there. The boy broke out again. "'It was treachery!' We took him in, and now we're giving him up. They wouldn't have touched us if we got him away. Not they. Felix literally heard the breathing of Todd on one side of him, and of Kirstein on the other. He crossed over and stood opposite his nephew. Look here, Derrick, he said. Your mother was quite right. You might have put this off for a day or two, but it was bound to come. You don't know the reach of the law. Come, my dear fellow, it's no good making a fuss. That's childish. The same thing is to see that the man gets every chance. Derrick looked up. Probably he had not yet realised that his uncle was in the room, and Felix was astonished at his really haggard face, as if the incident had bitten and twisted some vital in his body. "'He trusted us!' Felix saw Kirstein's quiver and flinch, and understood why they had none of them felt quite able to turn their backs on that display of passion. Something deep and unreasoning was on the boy's side, something that would not fit with common sense and the habits of civilised society— something from an Arab's tent or a Highland glen. Then Todd came up behind and put his hands on his son's shoulders. Come, he said, milk spilled. All right, said Derrick gruffly, and he went to the door. Felix made Nedda a sign, and she slipped out after him. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 22 Nedda, her blue headgear trailing, followed along at the boy's side while he passed through the orchard and two fields, and when he threw himself down under an ash tree, she too subsided, waiting for him to notice her. I am here, she said at last. At that ironic little speech, Derrick sat up. "'It'll kill him,' he said. "'But to burn things, Derrick, to, to light horrible, cruel flames and burn things, even if they aren't alive?' Derrick said through his teeth, "'It's I who did it. If I'd never talked to him, he'd have been like the others. They were taking him in a cart, like a calf.' Ned got possession of his hand and held it tight. There was a bitter and frightening hour under the faintly rustling ash-tree, while the wind sprinkled over her flakes of the May blossom just past its prime. Love seemed now so little a thing, 
seemed to have lost warmth and power, seemed like a suppliant outside a door. Why did trouble come like this the moment one felt deeply? The church bell was tolling. They could see the little congregation pass across the churchyard into that weekly dream they knew too well. And presently the drone emerged, mingling with the voices outside, of sighing trees and trickling water, of the rub of wings, bird songs, and the callings of beasts everywhere beneath the sky. In spite of suffering, because love was not the first emotion in his heart, the girl could only feel he was right not to be loving her, that she ought to be glad of what was eating up all else within him. It was ungenerous, unworthy to want to be loved at such a moment, yet she could not help it. This was her first experience of the eternal tug between self and the loved one, pooled in the hearts of lovers. Would he ever come to feel happy when he was just doing what he thought was right? And she drew a little away from him, then perceived that unwittingly she had done the right thing, for he at once tried to take her hand again. And this was her first lesson, too, in the nature of man. If she did not give her hand, he wanted it. But she was not one of those who calculated love, so she gave him her hand at once. That went to his heart and he put his arm round her, till he could feel the emotion under those stays that would not be drawn any closer. In this nest beneath the ash-tree they sat till they heard the organ wheeze and the furious sound of the last hymn, and saw the brisk coming forth with its air of, Thank God, and now to eat, till at last there was no stir again about the little church, no stir at all save that of nature's ceaseless thanksgiving. Todd, his brown face still rueful, had followed those two out into the air, and Sheila had gone quickly after him. Thus, left alone with his sister-in-law, Felix said gravely, "'If you don't want the boy to get into real trouble, do all you can to show him that the last way in the world to help these poor fellows is to let them fall foul of the law. It's badness to light flames you can't put out. What happened this morning? Did the man resist?' Her face still showed how bitter had been her mortification, and he was astonished that she kept her voice so level and emotionless. No, he went with them quite quietly. The back door was open. He could have walked out. I did not advise him to. I'm glad no one saw his face except myself. You see, she added, he's devoted to Derrick, and Derrick knows it. That's why he feels it so, and will feel it more and more. The boy has a great sense of honour, Felix. Under that tranquillity, Felix caught the pain and yearning in her voice. Yes, this woman really felt and saw. She was not one of those who make disturbance with their brains and powers of criticism. Rebellion leaped out from the heat in her heart. But he said, Is it right to fan this flame? Do you think any good end is being served? Waiting for her answer, he found himself gazing at the ghost of dark down on her upper lip, wondering that he had never noticed it before. Very low, as if to herself, she said, I would kill myself today if I didn't believe that tyranny and injustice must end. In our time? Perhaps not. Are you content to go on working for a utopia that you will never see? While our labourers are treated and housed more like dogs than human beings, while the best life under the sun, because life on the soil might be the best life, is despised and starved and made the plaything of people's tongues, Neither I nor mine are going to rest. The admiration she inspired in Felix at that moment was mingled with a kind of pity. He said impressively, Do you know the forces you are up against? Have you looked into the unfathomable heart of this trouble? Understood the tug of the towns, the call of money to money? Grasp the destructive restlessness of modern life? The abysmal selfishness of people when you threaten their interests? The age-long apathy of those you want to help? Have you grasped all these? And more. Felix held out his hand. Then, he said, you are truly brave. She shook her head. It got bitten into me very young. I was brought up in the highlands among the crofters in their worst days. In some ways the people here are not so badly off, but they're still slaves. Except that they can go to Canada if they want and save old England. She flushed. I hate irony. Felix looked at her with ever-increasing interest. She certainly was of the kind that could be relied on to make trouble. Ah, he murmured, 
Don't forget that when we can no longer smile, we can only swell and burst. It is some consolation to reflect that by the time we've determined to do something really effectual for the ploughmen of England, there'll be no ploughmen left. I cannot smile at that. And studying her face, Felix thought, You're right there. You'll get no help from humour. Early that afternoon, with Nedda between them, Felix and his nephew were speeding towards Tranchum. The little town, a hamlet when Edmund Morton dropped the E from his name and put up the works which Stanley had so much enlarged, had monopolised by now the hill on which it stood. Living entirely on its ploughs, it had yet but little of the true look of a British factory town, having been for the most part built since ideas came into fashion. With its red roofs and chimneys, it was only moderately ugly, and here and there an old white timbered house still testified to the fact that it had once been country. On this fine Sunday afternoon the population were in the streets, and presented all that long, narrow-headedness, that twist and distortion of feature, that perfect absence of beauty in face, figure, and dress, which is the glory of the Briton who has been for three generations in a town. And my great-grandfather, thought Felix, did all this, God rest his soul. At a rather new church on the very top they halted, and went in to expect the Morton memorials. There they were, in dedicated corners. Edmund and his wife Catherine, Charles Edmund and his wife Florence, Maurice Edmund and his wife Dorothy. Clara had set her foot down against Stanley and his wife Clara being in the fourth. Her soul was above ploughs, and she, of course, intended to be buried at Beckett, as Clara, Dowager Lady Freeland, for her efforts in regard to the land. Felix, who had a tendency to note how things affected other people, watched Derrick's inspection of these memorials, and marked that they excited in him no tendency to ribaldry. The boy, indeed, could hardly be expected to see in them what Felix saw, an epitome of the great, perhaps fatal, change that had befallen his native country, a record of the beginning of that far-back fever whose course ran ever faster, which had emptied country into town, and slowly, surely, changed the whole spirit of life. When Edmund Morton, about 1780, took the infection disseminated by the development of machinery, and left the farming of his acres to make money, that thing was done which they were all now talking about trying to undo, with their cries of, Back to the land! Back to peace and sanity in the shade of the elms! Back to the simple and patriarchal state of feeling which old documents disclose! Back to a time before these little squashed heads and bodies and features jutted every which way! Before there were long squashed streets of grey houses, long squashed chimneys emitting smoke blight, long squashed rows of graves, and long squashed columns of the daily papers. Back to well fed countrymen who could not read, with common rights and a kindly feeling for old Mortons who had a kindly feeling for them. Back to all that? A dream! A dream, sirs! There was nothing for it now but progress! Progress! On with the dance! Let engines rip, and the little squash-headed fellows with them. Commerce, literature, religion, science, politics, all taking a hand. What a glorious chance have money, ugliness, and ill-will. Such were the reflections of Felix before the brass tablet. In loving memory of Edmund Morton and his devoted wife Catherine, at rest in the Lord, A.D. 1816. From the church they went about their proper business, to interview a Mr. Pogram, of the firm of Pogram and Collett, solicitors, in whose hands the interests of many citizens of Trancham and the country round were almost securely deposited. He occupied, curiously enough, the house where Edmund Morton himself had lived, conducted his works on the one hand, and the squirearchy of the parish on the other. Incorporated now into the line of a long, loose street, it still stood rather apart from his neighbours, behind some large shrubs and trees of the Holm Oak variety. Mr. Pogram, who was finishing his Sunday after-lunch cigar, was a short, clean-shaved man, with strong cheeks, and those rather lustful grey-blue eyes which accompany a sturdy figure. He rose when they were introduced, and, uncrossing his fat little thighs, asked what he could do for them. Felix propounded the story of the arrest, so far as might be, in words of one syllable, avoiding the sentimental aspect of the question, and finding it hard to be on the side of disorder, as any modern writer might. There was something, however, about Mr. Pogram that reassured him. The small fellow looked a fighter, 
looked as if he would sympathise with Trist's want of a woman about him. The tusky but soft-hearted little brute kept nodding his round, sparsely covered head while he listened, exuding a smell of lavender water, cigars and gutter percha. When Felix ceased, he said rather dryly, "'Sir Gerald Marrowing? Yes, Sir Gerald's country agents, I rather think, are Messrs. Porter of Worcester. Mm, quite so. And a conviction that Mr. Pogram thought they should have been Messrs. Pogram and Collet of Transham confirmed in Felix the feeling that they had come to the right man. "'I gather,' Mr. Pogram said, and he looked at Nedda with a glance from which he obviously tried to remove all earthly desires, "'that you, sir, and your nephew, wish to go and see the man. "'Mrs. Pogram would be delighted to show Miss Freeland our garden. "'Your great-grandfather, sir, on the mother's side, lived in this house. "'Delighted to meet you. Often heard of your books. "'Mrs. Pogram has read one. Uh, let me see, uh, the, the banister, was it?' "'The balustrade,' Felix answered gently. "'Mr. Pogram rang the bell. "'Quite so,' he said. "'Assizes are just over, so that we can't come up for trial till August or September. "'Pity, great pity. "'Bail in case of arson for a labourer, very doubtful. "'Ask your mistress to come, please.' "'There entered a faded rose of a woman "'on whom Mr. Pogram in his time had evidently made a great impression. "'A vista of two or three little Pogroms behind her "'was hastily removed by the maid, "'and they all went into the garden.' "'Through here,' said Mr. Pogram, coming to a side door in the garden wall, "'we can make a short cut to the police station. "'As we go along I shall ask you one or two blunt questions.' "'And he thrust out his underlip. "'For instance, what's your interest in this matter?' "'Before Felix could answer, Derrick had broken in. "'My uncle has come out of kindness. "'It's my affair, sir. "'The man has been tyrannously treated.' "'Mr. Pogram cocked his eye. "'Yes, yes, no doubt, no doubt.' "'He's not confessed, I understand.' "'No, but—' Mr. Pogram laid a finger on his lips. "'Never say die. That's what we're here for.' "'So,' he went on, "'you're a rebel. Socialist, perhaps. Dear me. Well, we're all of us something nowadays. I'm a humanitarian myself. Often say to Mrs. Pogram, "'Humanity's the thing in this age, and so it is. Well, now, what line shall we take?' And he rubbed his hands. "'Shall we have a try at once to upset what evidence they've got?' We should want a strong alibi. Our friends here will commit if they can. Nobody likes arson. I understand he was sleeping in your cottage. His room now? Was it on the ground floor? Yes, but... Mr. Pogram frowned, as who would say, Ah, be careful. He'd better reserve his defence and give us time to turn round, he said rather shortly. They had arrived at the police station, and after a little parley were ushered into the presence of Trist. The big labourer was sitting on the stool in his cell, leaning back against the wall, his hands loose and open at his sides. His gaze passed at once from Felix and Mr. Pogram, who were in the advance, to Derrick, and the dumb soul seemed suddenly to look through, as one may see all there is of spirit in a dog reach out to its master. This was the first time that Felix had seen him, who had caused already so much anxiety, and that broad, almost brutal face, with the yearning fidelity in its tragic eyes, made a powerful impression on him. It was a sort of face one did not forget, and might be glad of not remembering, in one dreams. What had put this yearning spirit into so gross a frame, destroying its solid coherence? Why could not Trist have been left by nature, just a beer-loving serf, devoid of grief for his dead wife, devoid of longing for the nearest he could get to her again, devoid of susceptibility to this young man's influence? And the thought of all that was before the mute creature— sitting there in heavy, hopeless patience, stung Felix's heart, so that he could hardly bear to look him in the face. Derrick's had taken the man's thick brown hand. Felix could see with what effort the boy was biting back his feelings. "'This is Mr. Pogram, Bob, a solicitor who'll do all he can for you.' Felix looked at Mr. Pogram. The little man was standing with arms akimbo, his face the queerest mixture of shrewdness and compassion, and he was giving an almost needlessly strong scent of gutter percha. "'Yes, my man,' he said, "'you and I are going to have a talk when these two gentlemen have done with you.' And turning on his heel, he began to touch up the points of his little pink nails with a penknife, in front of the constable who stood outside the cell door, with his professional air of giving a man a chance. Invaded by a feeling, apt to come to him in zoos, that he was watching a creature who had no chance to escape being watched, Phoenix also turned. 
but though his eyes saw not, his ears could not help hearing. "'Forgive me, Bob. It's I who got you into this.' "'No, sir, not to forgive. I'll soon be back, and then they'll see.' By the reading of Mr. Pogram's ears, Felix formed the opinion that the little man also could hear. "'Tell her not to fret, Mr. Derrick. I'd like a shirt in case I've got to stop. Children needn't know where I be. Though I ain't ashamed.' "'It may be a longer job than you think, Bob.' In the silence that followed, Felix could not help turning. The labourer's eyes were moving quickly round his cell, as if for the first time he realised that he was shut up. Suddenly he brought those big hands of his together and clasped them between his knees, and again his gaze ran round to the cell. Felix heard the clearing of a throat close by, and more than ever conscious of the scent of gutter percha, grasped its connection with compassion in the heart of Mr. Pogram. He caught Derrick's muttered, "'Don't ever think we're forgetting you, Bob,' and something that sounded like, "'and don't ever say you did it.' Then, passing Felix and the little lawyer, the boy went out. His head was held high, but tears were running down his cheeks. Felix followed. A bank of clouds, grey-white, was rising just above the red-tiled roofs, but the sun still shone brightly. And the thought of the big labourer sitting there knocked and knocked at Felix's heart mournfully, miserably. He had a warmer feeling for his young nephew than he had ever had. Mr. Pogram rejoined them soon, and they walked on together. "'Well,' said Felix. Mr. Pogram answered in a somewhat grumpy voice, "'Not guilty and reserved defence. You have influence, young man. Dumb as a waiter. Poor devil!' Yet another word did he say till they had re-entered his garden. Here the ladies, surrounded by many little problems, were having tea, and seated next the little lawyer, whose eyes were fixed on Nedda, Felix was able to appreciate that in a happier mood he exhaled almost exclusively the scent of lavender water and cigars. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 23 On their way back to Beckett, after the visit to Trist, Felix and Nedda dropped Derrick halfway on the road to Joyfields. They found that the Beckett household already knew of the arrest. Woven into a dirge on the subject of the land, the last town doings and adventures on golf courses, it formed the genial topic of the dinner-table, for the Bulgarian with his carbohydrates was already a wonder of the past. The bigwigs of this weekend were quite a different lot from those of three weeks ago, and comparatively homogeneous, having only three different plans for settling the land question, none of which fortunately involved any more real disturbance of the existing state of things than the potato-brown bread plan, for all were based on the belief held by the respectable press and constructive portions of the community that omelette can be made without breaking eggs. On one thing alone the whole house-party was agreed, the importance of the question. Indeed, a sincere conviction on this point was like the card one produces before one is admitted to certain functions. No one came to Beckett without it, or if he did, he begged, borrowed, or stole it the moment he smelled Clara's special potpourri in the hall. And though he sometimes threw it out of the railway carriage window in returning to town, there was nothing remarkable about that. The conversational debauch of the first night's dinner, and alas, there were only two, even at Beckett during a weekend, had undoubtedly revealed the feeling, which had set in of late, that there was nothing really wrong with the condition of the agricultural labourer, the only trouble being that the unreasonable fellow did not stay on the land. It was believed that Henry Wiltram, in conjunction with Colonel Martlett, was on the point of promoting a policy for imposing penalties on those who attempted to leave it without good reason, such reason to be left to the discretion of impartial district boards, composed each of one labourer, one farmer and one landowner, decision going by favour of majority. And though opinion was rather freely expressed that, since the voting would always be two to one against, this might trench on the liberty of the subject, many thought that the interests of the country were so much above this consideration that something of the sort would be found, after all, to be the best arrangement. The cruder, early notions of resettling in the land by fostering peasant proprietorship, with habitable houses and security of tenure, were already under a cloud since it was more than suspected that they would interfere unduly with the game laws and other soundly vested interests. Mere penalisation of those who, 
or whose fathers before them, had at great pains planted so much covert, enclosed so much common, and laid so much country down in grass, was hardly a policy for statesmen. A section of the guests, and that perhaps strongest because most silent, distinctly favoured this new departure of Henry Wiltram's. Coupled with his swinging corn tax, he was indubitably a stout platform. A second section of the guests spoke openly in favour of Lord Settlement's policy of goodwill. The whole thing, they thought, must be voluntary, and they did not see any reason why, if it were left to the kindness and good intentions of the landowner, there should be any land question at all. Boards would be formed in every county, on which such model landowners as Sir Gerald Mannering, or Lord Settlement himself, would sit, to apply the principles of goodwill. Against this policy, the only criticism was levelled by Felix. He could have agreed, he said, if he had not noticed that Lord Settlem and nearly all landowners, were thoroughly satisfied with their existing goodwill, and averse to any changes in their education that might foster an increase of it. If, he asked, landowners were so full of goodwill, and so satisfied that they could not be improved in that matter, why had they not already done what was now proposed, and settled the land question? He himself believed that the land question, like any other, was only capable of settlement through improvement in the spirit of all concerned. But he found it a little difficult to credit Lord Settlement and the rest of the landowners with sincerity in the matter, so long as they were unconscious of any need for their own improvement. According to him, they wanted it both ways, and so far as he could see, they meant to have it. His use of the word sincere in connection with Lord Settlement was at once pounced on. He could not know Lord Settlem, one of the most sincere of men. Felix freely admitted that he did not, and hastened to explain that he did not question the uh, parliamentary sincerity of Lord Settlement and his followers. He only ventured to doubt whether they realised the hold that human nature had on them. His experience, he said, of the houses where they had been bred, and the seminaries where they had been trained, had convinced him that there was still a conspiracy on foot to blind Lord Settlement and those others concerning all this and since they were themselves part of the conspiracy, there was very little danger of their unmasking it. At this juncture, Felix was felt to have exceeded the limit of fair criticism, and only that toleration towards literary men of a certain reputation in country houses, as persons brought there to say clever and irresponsible things, prevented people from taking him seriously. The third section of the guests, unquestionably more static than the others, confined themselves to pointing out that Though the land question was undoubtedly serious, nothing whatever would result from placing any further impositions upon landowners. For, after all, what was land? Simply capital invested in a certain way, and very poorly at that. And what was capital? Simply a means of causing wages to be paid. Whether they were paid to men who looked after birds and dogs, loaded your guns, beat your coverts, or drove you to the chute, or paid to men who ploughed and fertilised the land, what did it matter? To dictate to a man to whom he was to pay wages was in the last degree un-English. Everybody knew the fate which had come, or was coming, upon capital. It was being driven out of the country by leaps and bounds, though to be sure it still perversely persisted in yielding every year a larger revenue by way of income tax. And it would be dastardly to take advantage of land just because it was the only sort of capital which could not fly the country in times of needs. Stanley himself Though, as became a host, he spoke little and argued not at all, was distinctly of this faction, and Clara sometimes felt uneasy, lest her efforts to focus at Beckett all interest in the land question should not quite succeed in outweighing the passivity of her husband's attitude. But, knowing that it is bad policy to raise the whip too soon, she trusted to her genius to bring him with one run at the finish, as they say, and was content to wait. There was universal sympathy with the Mallorings, if a model landlord like Mallory had trouble with his people, who, who should be immune? Arson? It was the last word. Felix, who secretly shared Nedda's horror of the insensate cruelty of flames, listened nevertheless to the jubilation that they caught the fellow with profound disturbance. For the memory of the big labourer seated against the wall, his eyes haunting round his cell, quarrelled fiercely with his natural abhorrence of any kind of violence and his equally natural dislike of what brought anxiety into his own life, and the life almost as precious of his little daughter. Scarcely a word of the evening's conversation, but gave him in high degree the feeling, how glib all this is, how far from reality! 
How fatted up with shell after shell of comfort and security! What do these people know, what do they realise, of the pressure and beat of raw life that lies behind? What do even I, who have seen this prisoner, know? For us it's as simple as killing a rat that eats our corn, or a flea that sucks our blood. Arson? Destructive brute! Lock him up! And something in Felix said, For order, for security, this may be necessary. But something also said, Our smug attitude is odious. He watched his little daughter closely, and several times marked the colour rush up in her face, and once could have sworn he saw tears in her eyes. If the temper of this talk were trying to him, hardened at a hundred dinner tables what must it be to a young and ardent creature? And he was relieved to find, on getting to the drawing-room, that she slipped behind the piano and was chatting quietly with her Uncle John. As to whether this or that man liked her, Nedda perhaps was not more ignorant than other women, and she noted a certain warmth and twinkle in Uncle John's eyes the other evening, a certain rather jolly tendency to look at her when he should have been looking at the person to whom he was talking, so that she felt toward him a trustful kindliness, not altogether unmingled with the sense that he was in that office which controls the destinies of those who get into trouble. The motives, even of statesmen, they say, are mixed, how much more so, then, of girls in love. Tucked away behind a steinway, which instinct told her was not for use, she looked up under her lashes at her uncle's still military figure, and said softly, "'It's awfully good of you to come too, Uncle John.' And John, gazing down at that round, dark head, and those slim, pretty white shoulders, answered, "'Not at all. Very glad to get a breath of fresh air.' And he stealthily tightened his white waistcoat, a right neglected of late, the garment seemed to him at the moment unnecessarily loose. "'You have so much experience, Uncle. Do you think violent rebellion is ever justifiable?' "'I do not.' Ned aside. "'I'm glad you think that,' she murmured, "'because I don't think it is either. I do so want you to like Derrick, Uncle John, because it's a secret from nearly everyone. He and I are engaged.' John jerked his head up a little, as though he had received a slight blow. The news was not palatable. He kept his form, however, and answered, "'Oh, really? Ah!' Nedda said still more softly, "'Please don't judge him by the other night. He wasn't very nice then, I know.' John cleared his throat. Instinct warned her that he agreed, and she said rather sadly, "'You see, we're both awfully young. It must be splendid to have experience.' Over John's face, with its double line between the brows, its double line in the thin cheeks, its single firm line of mouth beneath a grey moustache, there passed a little grimace. "'There's to being young,' he said. "'That'll change for the better, only too fast.' What was it in this girl that reminded him of that one with whom he had lived but two years, and mourned fifteen? Was it her youth? Was it that quick way of lifting her eyes and looking at him with such clear directness? Or the way her hair grew? Or what?' "'Do you like the people here, Uncle John?' The question caught John, as it were, between wind and water. Indeed, all her queries seemed to be trying to incite him to those wide efforts of mind which bring into use the philosophic nerve, and it was long since he had generalised afresh about either things or people, having fallen for many years past into the habit of reaching his opinions down out of some pigeonhole or other. To generalise was a youthful practice that one took off as one takes certain garments off babies when they come to years of discretion. But since he seemed to be in for it, he answered rather shortly, "'Not at all.' Netta sighed again. "'Nor do I. They make me ashamed of myself.' John, whose dislike of the bigwigs was that of the dogged worker of this life for the dogged talkers, wrinkled his brows. "'How's that?' They make me feel as if I were part of something heavy, sitting on something else, and all the time talking about how to make things lighter for the thing it's sitting on. A vague recollection of somebody, some writer, a dangerous one, having said something of this sort, flitted through John. Do you think England is done for, Uncle? I mean, about the land? In spite of his conviction that the, the country was in a bad way, John was deeply, intimately shocked by that simple little question. Done for? Never. Whatever might be happening underneath, there must be no confession of that. No, the country would keep its form. 
The country would breathe through its nose, even if it did lose the race. It must never know, or let others know, even if it were beaten. And he said, What on earth put that into your head? Only that it seems funny if we're getting richer and richer, and all the time farther and farther away from the life that everyone agrees is the best for health and happiness. Father put it into my head, making me look at the little towny people in Transhams this afternoon. I know I mean to begin at once to learn about farm work. You? This pretty young thing with the dark head and the pale, slim shoulders. Farm work? Women were certainly getting queer. In his department he had almost daily evidence of that. I should have thought art was more in your line. Linda looked up at him, and he was touched by that look, so straight and young. It's this. I don't believe Derrick will be able to stay in England. When you feel very strongly about things, it must be awfully difficult to. In bewilderment, John answered, Why, I should have said this was the country of all others for movements and social work and, and cranks. He paused. Yes, but those are all for curing the skin, and I suppose we're really dying of heart disease, aren't we? Derrick feels that anyway, and you see, he's not a bit wise, not even patient, so I expect he'll have to go. I mean to be ready anyway. And Nedda got up. Only, if he does something rash, don't let them hurt him, Uncle John, if you can help it. John felt her soft fingers squeezing his almost desperately, as if her emotions had for the moment got out of hand. And he was moved, though he knew that the squeeze expressed feeling for his nephew, not for himself. When she slid away out of the big room, all friendliness seemed to go out with her, and very soon after he himself slipped away to the smoking-room. There he was alone, and, lighting a cigar, because he still had on his long-tailed coat which did not go with that pipe he would so much have preferred, he stepped out of the French window into the warm, dark night. He walked slowly, in his evening pumps, up a thin path between columbines and peonies, late tulips, forget-me-nots, and pansies peering up in the dark with queer monkey faces. He had a love for flowers, rather starved for a long time past, and strangely liked to see them, not in the set and orderly masses that should seemingly have gone with his character, but in wilder beds, where one never knew what flower was coming next. Once or twice he stopped and bent down, ascertaining what kind it was, living its little life down there, then passed on in that mood of stammering thought which besets men of middle age who walk at night, a mood caught between memory of aspirations spun and over, and vision of aspirations that refused to take shape. Why should they any more? What was the use? And turning down another path, he came on something rather taller than himself, that glowed in the darkness as though a great moon or some white round body had floated to within a few feet of the earth. Approaching, he saw it for what it was, a little magnolia tree in the full of its white blossoms. Those clustering flower stars, printed before him on the dark coat of the night, produced in John more feeling than should have been caused by a mere magnolia tree, and he smoked somewhat furiously. Beauty, seeking whom it should upset, seemed like a girl to stretch out arms and say, I am here. And with a pang at heart and a long ash on his cigar, between lips that quivered oddly, John turned on his heel and retraced his footsteps to the smoking-room. It was still deserted. Taking up a review, he opened it at an article on The Land, and fixing his eye on the first page, did not read it, but thought, A child! What folly! Engage! <laughs> to that young... Why, they're babes! What is it about her that reminds me... Reminds me... What is it? Lucky fellow, Felix, to have her for daughter. Engaged! Little thing's got her troubles before her. Wish I had. By George, yes, wish I had. And with careful fingers he brushed off the ash that had fallen on his lapel. The little thing who had her troubles before her, sitting in her bedroom window, had watched his white front and the glowing point of his cigar passing down there in the dark, and though she did not know that they belonged to him, had thought, "'There's someone nice, anyway, who likes being out instead of in that stuffy drawing-room, playing bridge and talking, talking.' Then she felt ashamed of her uncharitableness. After all, it was wrong to think of them like that. They did it for rest, after all their hard work. And she? She did not work at all. 
If any Aunt Kirsty would let her stay at Joyfield's and teach her all that Sheila knew. And lighting her candles, she opened her diary to write. Life, she wrote, is like looking at the night. One never knows what's coming, only suspects. As in the darkness, you suspect what trees are what, and try to see whether you are coming to the edge of anything. A moth had just flown into my candle before I could stop it. Has it gone quite out of the world? If so, why should it be so different for us? The same great something makes all life and death, all light and dark, all love and hate. Then why one fate for one living thing and the opposite for another? But suppose there is nothing after death. Would it make me say I'd rather not live? It would only make me delight more in life of every kind. Only human beings brood and are discontented and trouble about future life. While Derrick and I were sitting in that field this morning, a bumblebee flew to the bank and tucked its head into the grass and went to sleep, just tired out with flying and working at its flowers. It simply snoozed its head down and went off. We ought to live every minute to the utmost, and when we are tired out, tuck in our heads and sleep. If any Derrick is not brooding over that poor man... Poor man, all alone in the dark, with months of misery before him. Poor soul. Oh, I am sorry for all the unhappiness of people. I can't bear to think of it. I, I simply can't. And, dropping her pen, Nedda went again to her window and leaned out. So sweet the air smelled that it made her ache with delight to breathe it in. Each leaf that lived out there, each flower, each blade of grass, were sworn to conspiracy of perfume. And she thought... They must all love each other. It all goes together so beautifully. Then, mingled with the incense of the night, she caught the savour of wood smoke. It seemed to make the whole scent even more delicious, but she thought bewildered. Smoke, cruel fire, burning the wood that once grew leaves like those. Oh, it is so mixed! It was a thought others have had before her. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 24 To see for himself how it fared with the big labourer at the hands of preliminary justice, Felix went into Transham with Stanley the following morning. John having departed early for town, the brothers had not further exchanged sentiments on the subject of what Stanley called the kick-up at Joyfield's and just as night will sometimes disperse the brooding moods of nature, so it had brought to all three the feeling, haven't we made too much of this? Haven't we been a little extravagant? And aren't we rather bored with the whole subject? Arson was arson. A man in prison, more or less, was a man in prison, more or less. This was especially Stanley's view, and he took the opportunity to say to Felix, Look here, old man, the thing is, of course, to see it in proportion. It was with this intention, therefore, that Felix entered the building where the justice of that neighbourhood was customarily dispensed. It was a species of small hall, somewhat resembling a chapel, with distempered walls, a platform, and benches for the public, rather well filled that morning, testimony to the stir the little affair had made. Felix, familiar with the appearance of London police courts, noted the efforts that had been made to create resemblance to those models of administration. The justices of the peace, hastily convoked and four in number, sat on the platform, with a semicircular backing of high grey screens and a green baize barrier in front of them, so that their legs and feet were quite invisible. In this way had been preserved the really essential feature of all human justice, at whose feet it is well known one must not look. Their faces, on the contrary, were entirely exposed to view, and presented that pleasing variety of type and unanimity of expression peculiar to men keeping an open mind. Below them, with his face towards the public, was placed a grey-bearded man at a table, also covered with green baize, that emblem of authority. And, to the side, at right angles, raised into the air, sat a little terrier of a man, with gingery wired hair, obviously the more articulate soul of these proceedings. As Felix sat down to worship, he noticed Mr. Pogram at the green baize table, and he received from the little man a nod and the faintest whiff of lavender and gutta-percha. The next moment he caught sight of Derrick and Sheila, 
screwed sideways against one of the distempered walls, looking with their frowning faces for all the world like two young devils just turned out of hell. They did not greet him, and Felix set to work to study the visages of justice. They impressed him, on the whole, more favourably than he had expected. The one to his extreme left, with a grey whiskered face, was like a large and sleepy cat of mature age, who moved not, except to write a word now and then on the paper before him, or to hand back a document. Next to him, a man of middle age, with bald forehead and dark intelligent eyes, seemed conscious now and again of the body of the court, and Felix thought, "'You've not been a magistrate long.' The chairman, who sat next, with the moustache of a heavy dragoon and grey hair parted in the middle, seemed, on the other hand, oblivious of the public, never once looking at them, and speaking so that they could not hear him. And Felix thought, "'You've been a magistrate too long.' Between him and the terrier man, the last of the four wrote diligently below a clean red face with clipped white moustache and little peaked beard. And Felix thought, "'Retired navel.' Then he saw that they were bringing in tryst. The big labourer advanced between two constables, his broad, unshaven face held high, and his lowering eyes, through which his strange and tragical soul seemed looking, turned this way and that. Felix, who no more than anyone else could keep his gaze off the trapped creature, felt again all the sensations of the previous afternoon. "'Guilty or not guilty?' As if repeating something learned by heart, Trist answered, "'Not guilty, sir.' and his big hands at his sides kept clenching and unclenching. The witnesses, four in number, began now to give their testimony. A sergeant of police recounted how he had been first summoned to the scene of burning, and afterward arrested Trist. Sir Gerald's agent described the eviction and threats uttered by the evicted man. Two persons, a stonebreaker and a tramp, narrated that they had seen him going in the direction of the Rick and Barn at five o'clock, and coming away from there from at five-fifteen. Punctuated by the barking of the terrier clerk, all this took time, during which there passed through Felix many thoughts. Here was a man who had done a wicked, because an antisocial, act, the sort of act no sane person could defend, an act so barbarous, stupid, and unnatural, that the very beasts of the field would turn noses away from it. How was it, then, that he himself could not feel him sensed? Was it that, in habitually delving into the motives of men's actions, he had lost the power of dissociating what a man did from what he was, had come to see him with his thoughts, deeds and omissions as a coherent growth. And he looked at Trist. The big labourer was staring with all his soul at Derrick, and suddenly he saw his nephew stand up, tilt his dark head back against the wall, and open his mouth to speak. In sheer alarm, Felix touched Mr. Pogram on the arm. The little square man had already turned. He looked at that moment extremely like a frog. "'Gentlemen, I wish to say—' "'Who are you? Sit down!' It was the chairman, speaking for the first time in a voice that could be heard. "'I wish to say that he is not responsible. I—' "'Silence! Silence, sir! Sit down!' Felix saw his nephew waver, and Sheila pulling at his sleeve. Then, to his infinite relief, the boy sat down. His sallow face was red, his thin lips compressed to a white line. And slowly, under the eyes of the whole court, he grew deadly pale. Distracted by fear that the boy might make another scene, Felix followed the proceedings vaguely. They were over soon enough. Trist committed, defence reserved, bail refused. All as Mr. Pogram had predicted. Derrick and Sheila had vanished, and in the street outside, idle at this hour of a working day, were only the cars of the four magistrates, two or three little knots of those who had been in the court talking of the case, and in the very centre of the street an old, dark-whiskered man, lame and leaning on a stick. "'Very nearly being awkward,' said the voice of Mr. Pogram in his ear. "'I say, do you think no hand himself, surely no real hand himself?' Felix shook his head violently. If the thought had once or twice occurred to him, he repudiated it with all his force when shaped by another's mouth, on such a mouth so wide and rubbery. "'No, no, strange boy, extravagant sense of humour. Too sensitive, that's all.' "'Quite so,' murmured Mr. Pogram soothingly. "'These young people—' We live in a queer age, Mr. Freeland. All sorts of ideas about nowadays. Young men like that, better in the army. Safe in the army. No ideas there. What happens now? said Felix. Wait, said Mr. Pogram. Nothing else for it. Wait. 
three months, twenty thumbs, bad system, rotten. And suppose in the end he's proved innocent. Mr. Program shook his little round head, whose ears were very red. Ah, he said, often say to my wife, wish I weren't a humanitarian. Heart of India rubber, excellent thing, greatest blessing. Well, good morning. Anything you want to say at any time, let me know. And exhaling an overpowering whiff of gutta percha, he grasped Felix's hand and passed into a house on the door of which was printed in brazen letters, April Pogram, James Collett, Solicitors, Agents. On leaving the little humanitarian, Felix drifted back towards the court. The cars were gone, the groups dispersed. Alone, leaning on his stick, the old dark-whiskered man stood like a jackdaw with a broken wing. Yearning at that moment for human intercourse, Felix went up to him. "'Fine day,' he said. "'Yes, sir, it is fine enough.' And they stood silent, side by side. The gulf, fixed by class and habit between soul and human soul, yawned before Felix as it had never before. Stirred and troubled, he longed to open his heart to this old, ragged, dark-eyed, whiskered creature with the game leg, who looks as if he had passed through all the thorns and thickets of hard and primitive existence. He longed that the old fellow should lay bare to him his heart, and for the life of him he could not think of any mortal words which might bridge the unreal gulf between them. At last he said, uh, "'You a native here?' "'No, sir, from over more than way. Let me here with my darter, or into my leg. Her husband works in this here factory.' "'And I'm from London,' Felix said. "'Thart you were. Fine place, London, they say.' Felix shook his head. "'Not so fine as this Worcestershire of yours.' The old man turned his quick, dark gaze. Ah, he said, people would be a bit nervy like in towns nowadays. The country would be a good place for a healthy man, too. I don't want no better place than the country. Never could abide being shut in. There aren't so many like you, judging by the towns. The old man smiled. That smile was the reverse of a bitter tonic coated with sweet stuff to make it palatable. Tis the one of her life takes em, he said. Not a many like me. There's not so many as can't do without the smell of the earth. With these here newspapers, it isn't taught nowadays. The boys and girls, they goes to school, and tis all in favour of the towns there. I can't work no more. I'm as good as gone myself. But I feel sometimes I'll have to go back. I don't like the streets, and I guess tis worse than London. Oh, well, perhaps, said Felix, there are more of us like you than you think. Again the old man turned his dark, quick glance. Well, and I wouldn't say no to that, neither. I've seen em terrible homesick. Tis certain sure there's lots would never go if wasn't so mortal hard on the land. Tisn't a bare living after that. And they're put upon, right and left, they're put upon. Tis only a man here and there that has something in him too strong. I wouldn't never have stayed in the country if twasn't that I couldn't stand the town life. It was like some breeze of cattle. You take em and put em out of their country, and you have to take em and put em back again. Only some breeds, though. Others, they don't mind where they go. Well, I've seen the country pass in my time, as you might say. We used to see three men. You only see one now. Are they ever going back onto the land? They talk about it. I read my newspaper regular. Some places I see they're making unions. That ain't no good. Why? The old man smiled again. Why? Think of it. The land's different to anything else. That's why. Different work, different hours, four men's work today and one's tomorrow. Work land with the unions, same as they've got in this here factory, with their eight hours and they do this and don't do that. No. You've got no weather in factories and such like. On the land, tis a matter of weather. On the land, I must be ready for anything at any time. You can't work it no other way. To the longer God's coming into it, and no use pulling this way and that. Union says to me, you mustn't work after hours. <laughs> I've had to set up all night with ship and cattle hundreds of times and no extra for it. Does not that way they'll do any good to keep people on the land? Oh, no. How, then? Well, you want new laws, of course, to prevent farmers and landowners taking their advantage. You want laws to build new cottages. But mainly, it is a case of hands together. Can't be no other, land's so ticklish. If it isn't hands together, it is nothing. I had a master once that was never content so long as we wasn't content. That farm was better work than any in the parish. 
Yes, but the difficulty is to get masters that can see the other side. A man doesn't care much to look at home. The old man's dark eyes twinkled. No, when he does, tis generally to say, Lord, aren't I right, and aren't they wrong, just? That's powerful customary. It is, said Felix. God bless us all. Ah, you may well say that, sir, and we want it too. A bit more wages wouldn't come amiss neither. And a bit more freedom. Tis a man's liberty and prizes as well as money. Did you hear about this arson case? The old man cast a glance this way and that before he answered in a lower voice. They say he was put out of his cottage. I've seen men put out for voting liberal. I've seen them put out for free thinking. All sorts of things I've seen them put out for. Does that makes the bad blood? A man wants to call his soul his own when all's said and done, and he can't, not in the old country, unless he's got the dibs. And yet you never thought of emigrating? Thought of it? Ah, thought of it hundreds of times. But somehow I couldn't never bring myself to the scratch of not seeing the beacon any more. I can just see it from here, you know. But not so many like me, getting fewer every day. Yes, murmured Felix, that I believe. Does I am made piece of goods, the land. You have to be fond of it, same as if your missus and your children. These poor pitiful fellows are working in this factory, making these here colonial ploughs. Union's all right for them. Tis all mechanical. But a man on the land, he's got to put the land first, whether it is his own or someone else's, or you'll never do no good. Might as well go for a postman any day. I'm keeping of you, though, with all my tattle. In truth, Felix had looked at the old man, for the accursed question had begun to worry him. Ought he or ought he not to give the lame old fellow something? Would it hurt his feelings? Why could he not say simply, Friend, I'm better off than you. Help me not to feel so unfairly favoured. Perhaps he might risk it. And, diving into his trousers' pockets, he watched the old man's eyes. If they followed his hand, he would risk it. But they did not. Withdrawing his hand, he said, Have a cigar. The old fellow's dark face twinkled. I don't know, he said, as I ever smoked one. But I have a darn old try. Take the lot, said Felix, and shuffled into the other's pocket the contents of his cigar case. If you get through one, you'll want the rest. They're pretty good. Ah, said the old man. Didn't wonder neither. Good-bye. I hope your leg will soon be better. Thank ye, sir. Good-bye. Thank ye. Looking back from the turning, Felix saw him still standing there in the middle of the empty street. Having undertaken to meet his mother, who was returning this afternoon to Beckett, he had still two hours to put away, and passing Mr. Pogram's house, he turned into a path across a clover field and sat down on a stile. He had many thoughts sitting at the foot of this little town, which his great-grandfather had brought about. And chiefly he thought of the old man he had been talking to, sent there, as it seemed to him, by Providence, to afford a prototype for his The Last of the Labourers. Wondering that the old fellow should talk of loving the land, whereon he must have toiled for sixty years or so, at a number of shillings per week, that would certainly not buy the cigars he had shovelled into that ragged pocket. Wonderful. And yet a marvellous sweet thing, when all was said, this land. Changing its sheen and texture, the feel of its air, its very scent, from day to day. This land, with myriad offspring of flowers and flying folk, the majestic and untiring march of seasons, Spring and its wistful ecstasy of saplings and its yearning wild wind-loosened heart, gleam and song, blossom and cloud, and the swift white rain, each upturned leaf so little and so glad to flutter, each wood and field so full of peeping things. Summer, ha, huh, summer, when on the solemn old trees the long days shone and lingered, and the glory of the meadows and the murmur of life and the scent of flowers bewildered tranquillity, till surcharge of warmth and beauty brooded into dark passion and broke. And autumn, in meadow haze down on the fields and woods, smears of gold already on the beaches, smears of crimson on the roans, the apple trees still burdened, and a flax-blue sky well now merging with the misty air, the cattle browsing in the lingering golden stillness, not a breath to fan the blue smoke of the weed fires, and in the fields no one moving, who would disturb such mellow peace? And winter, the long spaces, the long dark, and yet, 
And yet what delicate loveliness of twig tracery, what blur of rose and brown and purple caught in the bare boughs and in the early sunset sky! What sharp, dark flights of birds in the grey-white firmament! Who cared what season held in its arms this land that had bred them all? Not wonderful that into the veins of those who nursed it, tending, watching its perpetual fertility, should be distilled a love so deep and subtle that they could not bear to leave it, to abandon its hills and greenness and bird songs, and all the impress of their forefathers throughout the ages. Like so many of his fellows, cultured moderns, alien to the larger forms of patriotism, that rich liquor brood of maps and figures, commercial profit and high cockalorum, which served so perfectly to swell smaller heads. Felix had a love of his native land, resembling love for a woman, a kind of sensuous chivalry, a passion based on her charm, on her tranquillity, on the part she had to draw him into her embrace, to make him feel that he had come from her, from her alone, and into her alone was going back. And this green parcel of his native land, from which the half of his blood came, and that the dearest half, had a potency over his spirit that he might well be ashamed of in days when the true Briton was a town-bred creature with a foot of fancy in all four corners of the globe. There was ever to him a special flavour about the elm-girt fields, the flowery coppices of this country of the old Mortons, a special fascination in its full white-clouded skies, its grass-edged roads, its pied and creamy cattle, and the blue-green loom of the Malvern Hills. If God walked anywhere for him, it was surely here. Sentiment. Without sentiment, without that love, each for his own corner, the land, was lost indeed. Not if all Beckett blew trumpets till kingdom came would the land be reformed, if they lost sight of that. To fortify men in love for their motherland, to see that insecurity, grinding poverty, interference, petty tyranny, could no longer undermine that love, this was to be, surely must be, done. Monotony? Was that cry true? What work now performed by humble men was less monotonous than work on the land? What work was even a tenth part so varied? Never quite the same from day to day. Now weeding, now hay, now roots, now hedging. Now corn with sowing, reaping, threshing, stacking, thatching. The care of beasts and their companionship sheep-dipping, shearing, wood-gathering, apple-picking, cider-making, fashioning and tarring gates, whitewashing walls, carting, trenching. Never, never two days quite the same. Monotony. The poor devils in factories, in shops, in mines. Poor devils driving buses, punching tickets, cleaning roads, baking, cooking, sewing, typing. Stokers, machine-tenders, bricklayers, dockers, clerks. That great company from towns might well cry out, monotony. True they got their holidays, true they had more social life, a point that might well be raised at Beckett. Holidays and social life for men on the soil. But, and suddenly Thedic thought of the long, long holiday that was before the labourer tryst. Twiddle his thumbs, in the words of the little humanitarian, twiddle his thumbs in a space twelve feet by seven. No sky to see, no grass to smell, no beast to bear him company, no anything. For what resources in himself had this poor creature? No anything but to sit with tragic eyes fixed on the wall before him for eighty days and eighty nights before they tried him. And then, not till then, would his punishment for that moment's blind revenge for grievous wrong begin. What on this earth of God's was more disproportioned and wickedly extravagant, more crassly stupid, than the arrangements of his most perfect creature, man. What a devil was man, who could get rise to such sublime heights of love and heroism! What a ferocious brute, the most ferocious and cold-blooded brute that lived! Of all creatures most to be stampeded by fear into a callous torturer. Fear, thought Felix, fear, not momentary panic such as makes our brother animals do foolish things. Conscious, calculating fear, paralyzing the reason of our minds and the generosity of our hearts. A detestable thing Trist has done, a hateful act, but his punishment will be twentyfold as hateful. 
and, unable to sit and think of it, Felix rose and walked on through the fields. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 25 He was duly at Trancham Station in time for the London train, and, after a minute consecrated to looking in the wrong direction, he saw his mother already on the platform with her bag, an air cushion, and a beautifully neat roll. Travelling third, he thought. Why would she do these things? Slightly flushed, she kissed Felix with an air of abstraction. "'How good of you to meet me, darling!' Felix pointed in silence to the crowded carriage from which she had emerged. Frances Freeland looked a little rueful. "'It would have been delightful,' she said. "'There was a dear baby there, and, of course, I couldn't have the window down, so it was rather hot.' Felix, who could just see the dear baby, said dryly, "'So that's how you go about, is it? Have you had any lunch?' Francis Freeland put her hand under his arm. "'Now don't fuss, darling. Here's sixpence for the porter. There's only one trunk. It's got a violet label. Do you know them? They're so useful. You see them at once. I must get you some.' "'Let me take those things. You won't want this cushion. I'll let the air out.' "'I'm afraid you won't be able, dear. It's quite the best screw I've ever come across. A splendid thing. I can't get it undone.' "'Ah,' said Felix, "'and now we may as well go out to the car.' He was conscious of a slight stoppage in his mother's footsteps, and rather a convulsive squeeze of her hand on his arm. Looking at her face, he discovered it occupied with a process whose secret he could not penetrate, a kind of disarray of her features, rapidly and severely checked, and capped with a resolute smile. They had already reached the station exit, where Stanley's car was snorting. Francis Freeland looked at it, then, mounting rather hastily, sat compressing her lips. When they were off, Felix said, "'Would you like to stop at the church and have a look at the brasses to your grandfather and the rest of them?' His mother, who had slipped her hand under his arm again, answered, "'No, dear, I've seen them. The church is not at all beautiful. I liked the old church of Becket so much better. It is such a pity your great-grandfather was not buried there.' She had never quite got over the lack of niceness about those ploughs. Going, as was the habit of Stanley's car, at considerable speed, Felix was not at first certain whether the peculiar little squeezes his arm was getting were due to the bounds of the creature under them, or to some cause more closely connected with his mother, and it was not till they shaved a cart at the turning of the Beckett drive that it suddenly dawned on him that she was in terror. He discovered it in looking round just as she drew her smile over a spasm of her face and throat, and leaning out of the car he said, "'Drive very slowly, Batter. I want to look at the trees.' A little sigh rewarded him. Since she had said nothing, he said nothing, and Clara's words in the hall seemed to him singularly tactless. "'Oh, I meant to have reminded you, Felix, to send the car back and take a fly. I thought you knew that mother's terrified of motors.' And at his mother's answer, "'Oh, no, I quite enjoyed it, dear,' he thought. "'Bless her heart, she is a stoic.' Whether or not to tell her of the kick-up at Joyfield's exercised his mind. The question was intricate for she had not yet been informed that Nedda and Derrick were engaged, and Felix did not feel at liberty to forestall the young people. That was their business. On the other hand, she would certainly glean from Clara a garbled understanding of the recent events at Joyfield's, if she were not first told of them by himself. And he decided to tell her, with a natural trepidation of one who, living among principles and theories, never quite knew what those, for whom each fact is unrelated to anything else under the moon, were going to think. Francis Freeland, he knew well, kept facts and theories especially unrelated, or rather modified her facts to suit her theories, instead of, like Felix, her theories to suit her facts. For example, her instinctive admiration for church and state, her instinctive theory that they rested on gentility and people who were nice, was never for a moment shaken when she saw a half-starved baby of the slums. Her heart would impel her to pity and feed the poor little baby if she could, but to correlate the creature with millions of other such babies, and those millions with the church and state, would not occur to her. And if Felix made an attempt to correlate them for her, she would look at him and think, "'Dear boy, how good he is! I do wish he wouldn't let that line come in his forehead. It does so spoil it!' And she would say, 
"'Yes, darling, I know it's very sad. Only I'm not clever.' And if a Liberal government chanced to be in power, would add, "'Of course I do think this government is dreadful. I must show you a sermon of the dear Bishop of Wallham. I cut it out of the Daily Mystery. He puts things so well. He always has such nice ideas.' and Felix, getting up, would walk a little and sit down again too suddenly. Then, as if entreating him to look over her want of cleverness, she would put out a hand that, for all its whiteness, had never been idle, and smooth his forehead. It had sometimes touched him horribly to see with what despair she made attempts to follow him in his correlating efforts, and with what relief she heard him cease enough to let her say, "'Yes, dear, only I must show you this new kind of expanding cork. "'It's simply splendid. It bottles up everything.' "'And after staring at her just a moment, he would acquit her of irony. "'Very often after these occasions he had thought, and sometimes said, "'Mother, you're the best conservative I ever met.' "'She would glance at him, then, with a special loving doubtfulness, "'at a loss as to whether or no he had designed to compliment to her.' When he had given her half an hour to rest, he made his way to the blue corridor, where a certain room was always kept for her, who never occupied it long enough at a time to get tired of it. She was lying on a sofa in a loose grey cashmere gown. The windows were open, and the light breeze just moved in the folds of the chintz curtains, and stirred perfume from a bowl of pinks, her favourite flowers. There was no bed in this bedroom, which in all respects differed from any other in Clara's house, as though the spirit of another age and temper had marched in and dispossessed the owner. Felix had a sensation that one was by no means all body here. On the contrary, there was not the trace of the body anywhere, as if someone had decided that the body was not quite nice. No bed, no washstand, no chest of drawers, no wardrobe, no mirror, not even a jar of Clara's special potpourri. And Felix said, "'This can't be your bedroom, mother.' Francis Freeland answered, with a touch of deprecating quizzicality. "'Oh, yes, darling, I must show you my arrangements.' And she rose. "'This,' she said, "'you see, goes under there, and that under here, and that again goes under this. Then they all go under that, and then I pull this. It's lovely.' "'But why?' said Felix. "'Oh, but don't you see, it's so nice, nobody can tell, and it doesn't give any trouble.' "'And when you go to bed?' "'Oh, I just pop my clothes into this and open that, and there I am. It's simply splendid.' "'I see,' said Felix. "'Do you think I might sit down, or shall I go through?' Frances Frieden loved him with her eyes, and said, "'Naughty boy!' And Felix sat down on what appeared to be a window-seat. "'Well,' he said with slight uneasiness, for she was hovering, "'I think you're wonderful.' Frances Frieden put away an impeachment that she evidently felt to be too soft. "'Oh, but it's all so simple, darling.' And Felix saw that she had something in her hand and mind. "'This is my little electric brush. It'll do wonders with your hair. While you sit there, I'll just try it.' A clicking and a whirring had begun to occur close to his ear, and something darted like a gadfly at his scalp. "'I came to tell you something serious, mother.' "'Yes, darling. It'll be simply lovely to hear it. And you mustn't mind this, because it really is a first-rate thing, quite new.' "'Now how is it,' thought Felix, "'that anyone who loves the new as she does, when it's made of matter, "'would not even look at it when it's made of mine?' "'And while the little machine buzzed about his head, "'he proceeded to detail to her the facts of the state of things "'that existed at Joyfields. "'When he had finished, she said, "'Now, darling, bend down a little.' "'Felix bent down, "'and the little machine began severely tweaking the hairs on the nape of his neck. "'He sat up again rather suddenly.' Francis Freeland was contemplating the little machine. "'How very provoking! It's never done that before.' "'Quite so,' Felix murmured. "'But what about Joyfield?' "'Oh, my dear, it is such a pity that they don't get on with those Mallorings. I do think it's sad they weren't brought up to go to church.' Felix stared, not knowing whether to be glad or sorry that this recital had not roused within her the faintest suspicion of disaster. How he envied her that single-minded power of not seeing further than was absolutely needful. And suddenly he thought, she really is wonderful. With her love of church, how it must hurt her that we none of us go, not even John. And yet she never says a word. There really is width about her, a power of accepting the inevitable. Never was woman more determined to make the best of a bad job. It's a great quality. And he heard her say, 
"'Now, darling, if I give you this, you must promise me to use it every morning. "'You'll find you'll soon have a splendid crop of little young hares.' "'I know,' he said gloomily, "'but they won't come to anything. "'Age has got my head, mother, just as it's got the lands. "'Oh, nonsense! You must go on with it, that's all.' "'Felix turned, so that he could look at her. "'She was moving round the room now, "'meticulously adjusting the framed photographs of her family "'that were the only decoration of the walls.' How formal, chiselled, and delicate her face, yet how almost fanatically decisive! How frail and light her figure, yet how indomitably active! And the memory assailed of him of how, four years ago, she defeated double pneumonia without having a doctor, simply by lying on her back. She leaves trouble, he thought, until it's under her nose, then simply tells it that it isn't there. There's something very English about that. She was chasing a blue bottle now with a little fan made of wire, and coming close to Felix said, "'Have you seen these, darling? You've only to hit the fly, and it kills him at once.' "'But do you ever hit the fly?' "'Oh, yes,' and she waved the fan at the blue bottle, which avoided it without seeming difficulty. "'I can't bear hurting them, but I don't like flies. There!' The blue bottle flew out of the window behind Felix, and in at the one that was not behind him. He rose. "'You ought to rest before tea, mother.' He felt her searching him with her eyes, as if trying desperately to find something she might bestow upon or do for him. "'Would you like this wire?' With the feeling that he was defrauding love, he turned and fled. She would never rest while he was there, and yet there was that in her face which made him feel a brute to go. Passing out of the house, sunk in its Monday hush, no vestige of a bigwig left, Felix came to that new-walled mound where the old house of the Mortons had been burned by soldiers from Tewkesbury and Gloucester, as said the old chronicles dear to the heart of Clara. And on the wall he sat down. Above, in the uncut grass, he could see the burning blue of a peacock's breast where the heraldic bird stood digesting grain in the repose of perfect breeding, and below him gardeners were busy with the gooseberries. Gardeners and the gooseberries of the great, he thought, such is the future of our land. And he watched them. How methodically they went to work! How patient and well done for they looked! After all, was it not the ideal future? Gardeners, gooseberries, and the great? Each of the three content in that station of life into which— What more could a country want? Gardeners, gooseberries, and the great. The phrase had a sudden hypnotic value. Why trouble? Why fuss? Gardeners, gooseberries, and the great. A perfect land. A land dedicated to the weekend. Gardeners, go— And suddenly he saw that he was not alone. Half hidden by the angle of the wall, on the stone of the foundations, carefully preserved and nearly embedded in the nettles which Clara had allowed to grow because they added age to the appearance, was sitting a bigwig. One of the Settlenham faction, he had impressed Felix alike by his reticence, the steady sincerity of his grey eyes, a countenance, but that beneath the simple and delicate urbanity had still in it something of the best type of schoolboy. "'How comes he to have stayed?' he mused. "'I thought they always fed and scattered.' And having received an answer to his salutation, he moved across and said, "'I imagined you'd gone.' "'I've been having a look around. It's very jolly here. My affections are in the north, but I suppose this is pretty well the heart of England.' "'Near the big song,' Felix answered. There'll never be anything more English than Shakespeare when all's said and done. And he took a steady, sidelong squint at his companion. This is another of the types I've been looking for, he reflected. The peculiar, don't-quite-touch-me accent of the aristocrat, and of those who would be, had almost left this particular one, as though he secretly aspired to rise superior, and only employed it in the nervousness of his first greetings. Yes, thought Felix. He's just about the very best we can do among those who sit upon the land. I would wager there's not a better landlord nor a better fellow in all his class than this one. He chalks away superior to Mannering, if I know anything of faces. Would never have turned poor Trist out. If this exception were the rule. And yet, does he, can he, go quite far enough to meet the case? If not, what hope of regeneration from above? Would he give up his shooting? Could he give up feeling he's a leader? Would he give up his townhouse and collecting whatever it is he collects? 
Could he let himself sink down and merge till he was just unseen leaven of good fellowship and good will, working in the common bread? And, squinting at that sincere, clean, charming, almost fine face, he answered himself unwillingly, he could not. And suddenly he knew that he was face to face with the tremendous question which soon or late confronts all thinkers. Sitting beside him was the highest product of the present system. With its charm, humanity, courage, chivalry up to a point, its culture and its cleanliness, this decidedly rare flower at the end of a tall stalk, with dark and tortuous roots and rank foliage, was in a sense the sole justification of power wielded from above. And was it good enough? Was it quite good enough? Like so many other thinkers, Felix hesitated to reply. If only merit and the goods of this world could be finally divorced. If the reward of virtue were just men's love and an unconscious self-respect. If only to have nothing were the highest honour. And yet, to do away with this beside him and put in its place what? No kiss-be-quick change had a chance of producing anything better. To scrap the long growth of man and start afresh was but to say, since in the past the best that man has done has not been good enough, I have a perfect faith in him for the future. No, that was a creed for archangels and other extremists, safer to work on what he had. And he began, Next door to this estate, I'm told, there's ten thousand acres almost entirely grass and covered, owned by Lord Baltimore, who lives in Norfolk, London, Cannes, and anywhere else the whim takes him. He comes down here twice a year to shoot. The case is extremely common. Surely it spells paralysis. If land is to be owned at all in such great lumps, owners ought at least to live on the lumps and to pass very high examinations as practical farmers. They ought to be the life and soul, the, the radiating sun of their little universes, or else they ought to be cleared out. How expect keen farming to start from such an example? It really looks to me as if the game laws would have to go. And he redoubled his scrutiny of the bigwig's face. A little furrow in its brow had deepened visibly, but nodding, he said, The absentee landlord is a curse, of course. I am afraid I have a bit of one myself. And I am bound to say, though I am keen on shooting, if the game laws were abolished, it might do a lot. You wouldn't move in that direction, I suppose? The bigwig smiled, charming, rather whimsical than smile. Honestly, I'm not up to it. The spirit, you know, but the flesh. My line is housing and wages, of course. There it is, thought Felix. Up to a point they'll move, but not up to the point. It's all fiddling. One wouldn't give up his shooting, another wouldn't give up his power, a third won't give up her weekends, a fourth won't give up his freedom. Our interest in the thing is all flackadaisical, a kind of bun-fight of pet notions. There's no real steam. And abruptly changing the subject, he talked of pictures to the pleasant bigwig in the sleepy afternoon, of how this man could paint and that man couldn't. And in the uncut grass the peacock slowly moved, displaying his breast of burning blue. And below, the gardeners worked among the gooseberries. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 26 Nedda, borrowing the bicycle of Clara's maid, Sirrit, had been over to Joyfields, and only learned on her return of her grandmother's arrival. In her bath before dinner, there came to her one of those strategic thoughts that even such as are no longer quite children will sometimes conceive. She hurried desperately into her clothes, and, ready full twenty minutes before the gong was due to sound, made her way to her grandmother's room. Frances Freeland had just pulled this, and to her astonishment, that had not got in properly. She was looking at it somewhat severely when she heard Nedda's knock. Drawing a screen temporarily over the imperfection, she said, "'Come in!' The dear child looked charming in her white evening dress, with one red flower in her hair and while she kissed her she noted that the neck of her dress was just a little too open to be quite nice, and at once thought, "'I've got the very thing for that.' Going to a drawer that no one could have suspected of being there, 
she took from it a little diamond star. Getting delicate but firm hold of the Mechlin at the top of the frock, she popped it in so that the neck was covered at least an inch higher, and said, "'Now, Ducky, you're to keep that as a little present. You've no idea how perfectly it suits you just like this.' And having satisfied for the moment her sense of niceness and that continual itch to part with everything she had, she surveyed her granddaughter, lighted up by that red flower, and said, "'How sweet you look!' Nedda, looking down past cheeks, coloured by pleasure at the new little star on a neck rather browned by her day in the sun, murmured, "'Oh, Granny, it's much too lovely. You mustn't give it to me.' There were moments that Frances Freeland loved best in life, and with the untruthfulness in which she only indulged when she gave things away, or otherwise benefited her neighbours with or without their will, she added, "'It's quite wasted. I never wear it myself.' And, seeing Nedda's smile, for the girl recollected perfectly having admired it during dinner at Uncle John's and at Beckett herself. She said decisively, "'So that's that,' and settled her down on the sofa. But just as she was thinking, "'I have the very thing for the dear child's sunburn,' Nedda said, "'Granny dear, I've been meaning to tell you. Derrick and I are engaged.' For the moment Frances Freeland could do nothing but tremulously interlace her fingers. "'Oh, but darling,' she said very gravely, "'have you thought?' "'I think of nothing else, Granny. "'But has he thought?' "'Nedda nodded. "'Frances Freeland sat staring straight before her. "'Nedda and Derrick. "'Derrick and Nedda. "'The news was almost unintelligible. "'Those two were still for her "'barely more than little creatures "'to be tucked up at night. "'Engaged? "'Marriage?' between those who were both as near to her almost as her own children had been. The effort was for the moment quite too much for her, and a sort of pain disturbed her heart. Then the crowning principle of her existence came a little to her aid. No use in making a fuss. Must put the best face on it, whether it were going to come to anything or not. And she said, "'Well, darling, I don't know, I'm sure. I dare say it's very lovely for you. But do you think you've seen enough of him?' Nedda gave her a swift look, then dropped her lashes so that her eyes seemed closed. Snuggling up, she said, "'No, Granny, I do wish I could see more. If only I could go and stay with them a little.' And as she planted that dart of suggestion, the gong sounded. In Frances Freeland, lying awake till two, as was her habit, the suggestion grew. To this growth not only her custom of putting the best face on things, but her incurable desire to make others happy— and an instinctive sympathy with love affairs, all contributed. Moreover, Felix had said something about Derrick's having been concerned in something rash. If darling Nedda were there, it would occupy his mind and help to make him careful. Never dilatory in forming resolutions, she had decided to take the girl over with her on the morrow. Kirstine had a dear little spare room, and Nedda should take her bag. It would be a nice surprise for them all. Accordingly, next morning, not wanting to give any trouble, she sent Thomas down to the Red Lamb, where they had a comfortable fly with a very steady, respectable driver, and ordered it to come at half-past two. Then, without saying anything to Clara, she told Nedda to be ready to pop in her bag, trusting to her powers of explaining everything to everybody without letting anybody know anything. Little difficulties of this sort never bunkered her. She was essentially a woman of action and on the drive to Joyfield's she stifled the girls, quavering with, "'It's all right, darling, it'll be very nice for them.' She was perhaps the only person in the world who was not just a little bit afraid of Kirstine. Indeed, she was constitutionally unable to be afraid of anything, except motor-cars, and, of course, earwigs, and even them one must put up with. Her critical sense told her that this woman in blue was just like anybody else. Besides, her father had been the colonel of a Highland regiment— it was quite nice, and one must put the best face on her. In this way, pointing out the beauty of each feature of the scenery, and not permitting herself or Nedda to think about the bag, they drove until they came to Joyfield's. Kirstine alone was in, and having sent Nedda into the orchard to look for her uncle, Frances Freeland came at once to the point. It was so important, she thought, that darling Nedda should see more of dear Derrick, they were very young, and if she could stay for a few weeks, they would both know their minds so much better. She made her bring her bag, because she knew dear Kirstine would agree with her, and it would be so nice for them all. 
Felix had told her about that poor man who had done this dreadful thing, and she thought that if Neda were here it would be a distraction. She was a very good child, and quite useful in the house. And while she was speaking, she watched Gerstine and thought, "'She is very handsome, and altogether ladylike. Only it is such a pity she wears that blue thing in her hair. It makes her so conspicuous.' And rather unexpectedly she said, "'Do you know, dear, I believe I know the very thing to keep your hair from getting loose. It's such lovely hair, and this is quite a new thing, and doesn't show at all, invented by a very nice hairdresser in Worcester. It's simplicity itself. Do let me show you.' Quickly going over, she removed the kingfisher blue fillet, and making certain passes with her fingers through the hair, murmured, "'It's so beautifully fine. It seems such a pity not to show it all, dear. Now look at yourself.' and from the recesses of her pocket she produced a little mirror. "'I'm sure Todd will simply love it like that. It'll be such a nice change for him.' Kirstine, with just a faint wrinkling of her lips and eyebrows, waited till she had finished. Then she said, "'Yes, mother dear, I'm sure he will,' and replaced the fillet. A patient, half-sad, half-quizzical smile visited Francis Freeland's lips, as who should say, "'Yes, I know you think that I'm a fuss-box, but it really is a pity that you wear it so, darling.' At sight of that smile, Kirstine got up and kissed her gravely on the forehead. When Netta came back from a fruitless search for Todd, her bag was already in the little spare bedroom, and Francis Freeland gone. The girl had never yet been alone with her aunt, for whom she had a fervent admiration not unmixed with awe. She idealised her, of course, thinking of her as one might think of a picture or statue, a symbolic figure standing for liberty and justice and the redress of wrong. Her never-varying garb of blue assisted the girl's fancy, for blue was always the colour of ideals and aspiration. Was not blue sky the nearest one could get to heaven? Were not blue violets the flowers of spring? Then, too, Kirsty was a woman with whom it would be quite impossible to gossip or small-talk, with her one could but simply and directly say what one felt, and only that over things which really mattered. And this seemed to Nedda so splendid that it sufficed in itself to prevent the girl from saying anything whatever. She longed to all the same, feeling that to be closer to her aunt meant to be closer to Derrick. Yet, with all, she knew that her own nature was very different. This, perhaps, egged her on, and made her aunt seem all the more exciting. She waited breathless, till Kirstein said, "'Yes, you and Derrick must know each other better. The worst kind of prison in the world is a mistaken marriage.' Nedda nodded fervently. "'It must be. But I think one knows, Aunt Kirstein. She felt as if she were being searched right down to the soul before the answer came. "'Perhaps. I knew myself. I've seen others who did. A few. I think you might.' Nedda flushed from sheer joy. I could never go on if I didn't love. I feel I couldn't, even if I'd started. With another long look through narrowing eyes, Kirstine answered, Yes, you would want truth. But after marriage, truth is an unhappy thing, Nedda, if you have made a mistake. It must be dreadful, awful. So don't make a mistake, my dear, and don't let him. Nedda answered solemnly, I won't. Oh, I won't. Kirstine had turned away to the window, and Edda heard her say quietly to herself, "'Liberty is a glorious feast.' Trembling all over with the desire to express what was in her, Nedda stammered, "'I, I would never keep anything that wanted to be free. Never, never. I, I, I would never try to make anyone do what they didn't want to do.' She saw her aunt smile, and wondered whether she had said anything exceptionally foolish. But it was not foolish, surely not, to say what one really felt. Some day, Nedda, all the world will say that with you. Until then, we'll fight those who won't say it. Have you got everything in your room you want? Let's come and see. To pass from Beckett to Joyfields was really a singular experience. At Beckett you were certainly supposed to do exactly what you liked, but the tyranny of meals, baths, scents, and other accompaniments of the all-body regime so annihilated every impulse to do anything but just obey it. At Joyfields, bodily existence was a kind of perpetual skirmish, a sort of grudged accompaniment to a state of soul. You might be alone in the house at any meal-time. You might or might not have water in your jug. 
And as to baths, you had to go out to a little whitewashed shed at the back, with a brick floor, where you pumped on yourself, prepared to shout out, "Hello, I'm here, in case anyone else came wanting to do the same. The conditions were, in fact, almost perfect for seeing more of one another. Nobody asked where you were going, with whom going, or how going. You might be away by day or night without exciting curiosity or comment. And yet you were conscious of a certain something always there, holding the house together, some principle of life, or perhaps just a woman in blue. There too was that strangest of all phenomena in an English home, no game ever played, outdoors or in. The next fortnight, while the grass was ripening, was a wonderful time for Nedda, given up to her single passion, of seeing more of him who so completely occupied her heart. She was at peace now with Sheila, whose virility forbade that she should dispute pride of place with this soft and truthful guest, so evidently immersed in rapture. Besides, Nedda had that quality of getting on well with her own sex, finding those women who, though tenacious, are not possessive, who, though humble, are secretly very self-respecting, who, though they do not easily say much about it, put all their eggs in one basket. Above all, who disengage, no matter what their age, a candid but subtle charm. But that fortnight was even more wonderful for Derrick, caught between two passions, both so fervid. For though the passion of his revolt against the Mannerings did not pull against his passion for Nedda, they both tugged at him. And this had one curious psychological effect. It made his love for Nedda more actual, less of an idealization. Now that she was close to him, under the same roof, he felt the full allurement of her innocent warmth. He would have been cold-blooded indeed if he had not taken fire, and his pride always checking the expression of his feelings, they glowed ever hotter underneath. Yet, over those sunshiny days, there hung a shadow, as of something kept back, not shared between them, a kind of waiting menace. Netta learned of Kirstine and Sheila all the useful things she could. The evenings she passed with Derrick, those long evenings of late May and early June, this year so warm and golden. They walked generally in the direction of the hills. A favourite spot was a wood of larches, whose green shoots had not yet quite ceased to smell of lemons. Tall, slender things, those trees, whose stems and dried, lured branch growth were grey, almost sooty, up to the feathery green of the tops, that swayed and creaked faintly in a wind, with a sighing of their branches like the sound of the sea. From the shelter of those highland trees, rather strange in such a countryside, they too could peer forth at the last sunlight gold-powdering the fringed branches, at the sunset flush dying the sky above the beacon, watch light slowly folding grey wings above the hayfields and the elms, mark the squirrels scurry along and the pigeons' evening flight. A stream ran there at the edge, and beech-trees grew beside it. In the tawny dappled sand-bed of that clear water, and the grey-green dappled trunks of those beeches with their great sinuous long-muscled roots, was that something which man can never tame or garden out of the land? The strength of unconquerable fertility, the remote deep life in nature's heart. Men and women had their spans of existence, these trees seemed as if there for ever. From generation to generation lovers might come, and, looking on this strength and beauty, feel in their veins the sap of the world. Here the labourer and his master, hearing the wind in the branches and the water murmuring down, might for a brief minute grasp the land's unchangeable wild majesty. And on the far side of that little stream was a field of moon-coloured flowers that have for Nedda a strange fascination. Once the boy jumped across and brought her back a handkerchief full. They were of two kinds, close to the water's edge, the marsh orchis, and further back, a small marguerite. Out of this they made a crown of the alternate flowers and a girdle for her waist. That was an evening of rare beauty, and warm enough already for an early chafer to go blooming in the dusk. An evening when they wandered with their arms round each other a long time, silent, stopping to listen to an owl, stopping to point out each star coming so shyly up in the grey violet of the sky. And that was the evening when they had a strange little quarrel, sudden as a white squall on a blue sea, or the tiff of two birds shooting up in a swift spar of attack, and then, 
all over. Would he come tomorrow to see her milking? He could not. Why? He could not. He would be out. Ah! He never told her where he went. He never let her come with him among the labourers, like Sheila. I can't. I'm pledged not. Then you don't trust me. Of course I trust you. But a promise is a promise. You oughtn't to ask me, Nedda. No, but I would never have promised to keep anything from you. You don't understand. Oh, yes, I do. Love doesn't mean the same to you that it does to me. How do you know what it means to me? I couldn't have a secret from you. Then you don't count honour? Honour only binds oneself. What do you mean by that? I include you. You don't include me in yourself. That's all. I think you're very unjust. I was obliged to promise it doesn't only concern myself. Then, silent, motionless, a yard apart, they looked fiercely at each other, their hearts stiff and sore, and in their brains no glimmer of perception of anything but tragedy. What more tragic than to have to come out of an elysium of warm arms round each other to this sudden hostility? And the owl went on hooting, and the larches smelled sweet, and all around was the same soft dusk wherein the flowers in her hair and round her waist gleamed white. But for Nedda the world had suddenly collapsed. Tears rushed into her eyes. She shook her head and turned away, hiding them passionately. A full minute passed, each straining to make no sound and catch the faintest sound from the other, till in her breathing there was a little clutch. His fingers came stealing round, touched her cheeks, and were wetted. His arm suddenly squeezed all breath out of her, his lips fastened on hers. She answered those lips with her own, desperately, bending her head back, shutting her wet eyes. And the owl hooted, and the white flowers fell into the dusk off her hair and waist. After that they walked once more in laced, avoiding with what perfect care any allusion to the sudden tragedy giving themselves up to the bewildering ecstasy that had started throbbing in their blood with that kiss, longing only not to spoil it. And through the sheltering larchwood their figures moved from edge to edge, like two little souls in paradise, unwilling to come forth. After that evening, love had a poignancy it had not quite had before, at once deeper, sweeter, tinged for both of them with the rich darkness of passion, and with discovery that love does not mean a perfect merger of one within another. For both felt themselves in right over that little quarrel. The boy, that he could not, must not, resign what was not his to resign. Feeling dimly, without being quite able to shape the thought even to himself, that a man has a life of action into which a woman cannot always enter, with which she cannot always be identified. The girl, feeling that she did not want any life into which she did not enter, that it was hard that he should want to exclude her from anything. For all that, she did not try again to move him, to let her into the secret of his plans of revolt and revenge, and disdained completely to find them out from Sheila or her aunt. And the grass went on ripening. Many and varied as the breeds of men or the trees of the forest were the stalks that made up that greenish jungle with the waving, form-coloured surface of rye-grass and brome-grass of timothy, plantain and yarrow, of bent grass and quake grass, foxtail and the green-hearted trefoil, of dandelion, dock, musk thistle and sweet-scented vernal. On the 10th of June, Todd began cutting his three fields, the whole family with Nedda and the three tryst children working like slaves. Old Gaunt, who looked to the harvests to clothe him for the year, came to do his share of raking, and any other who could find some evening hours to spare. The whole was cut and carried in three days of glorious weather. The lovers were too tired the last evening of hay harvest to go rambling, and sat in the orchard watching the moon slide up through the coppice behind the church. They sat on Todd's log, deliciously weary, in the scent of the new-mown hay, while moths flitted grey among the blue darkness of the leaves, and the whitened trunks of the apple-trees gleamed ghostly. It was very warm, a night of whispering air, opening all hearts. And Derrick said, "'You'll know to-morrow, Nedda.' A flutter of fear overtook her. What would she know? End of chapter 26 
Chapter 27 of The Freelands by John Galsworthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 27. On the 13th of June, Sir Gerald Mallorine, returning home to dinner from the House of Commons, found on his hall table, enclosed in a letter from his agent, the following paper. We, the undersigned labourers on Sir Gerald Mallorine's estate, beg respectfully to inform him that we consider it unjust that any labourer should be evicted from his cottage for any reason connected with private life or social or political convictions. And we respectfully demand that, before a labourer receives notice to quit for any such reason, the case shall be submitted to all his fellow labourers on the estate, and that in the future he shall only receive such notice if a majority of his fellow labourers record their votes in favour of the notice being given. In the event of this demand being refused, we regretfully decline to take any hand in getting in the hay on Sir Gerald Mallorings' estate. Then followed ninety-three signatures, or signs of the cross, with names printed after them. The agent's letter which enclosed this document mentioned that the hay was already ripe for cutting, that everything had been done to induce the men to withdraw the demand without success, and that the farmers were very much upset. The thing had been sprung on them, the agent having no notion that anything of the sort was on foot. It had been very secretly, very cleverly managed, and in the agent's opinion was due to Mr. Freeland's family. He awaited Sir Gerald's instructions. Working double tides with luck and good weather, the farmers and their families might perhaps save half of the hay. Mannering read this letter twice, and the enclosure three times, and crammed them deep down into his pocket. It was pre-eminently one of those moments which bring out the qualities of Norman blood. And the first thing he did was to look at the barometer. It was going slowly down. After a month of first-class weather, he would not do that without some sinister intention. An old glass, he believed in it implicitly. He tapped, and it sank further. He stood there frowning. Should he consult his wife? General friendliness said, yes. A Norman instinct of chivalry, and perhaps the deeper Norman instinct that, when it came to the point, women were too violent, said no. He went upstairs three at a time, and came down too. And all through dinner he sat thinking it over, and talking as if nothing had happened, so that he hardly spoke. Three quarters of the hay at stake if it rained soon. A big loss to the farmers, a further reduction in rents already far too low. Should he grin and bear it, and by doing nothing show these fellows that he could afford to despise their cowardly device? For it was cowardly to let his grass get ripe and play at this low trick. But if he left things unfought this time, they would try it on again with the corn. Not that there was much of that on the estate of a man who only believed in corn as a policy. Should he make the farmers sack the lot and get in other labour? But where? Agricultural labourers were made, not born and it took a deuce of a lot of making at that. Should he suspend wages till they withdrew their demand? That might do, but he would still lose the hay. The hay! After all, anybody pretty well could make hay. It was the least skilled of all farm work, so long as the farmers were there to drive the machines and direct. Why not act vigorously? And his jaw set so suddenly on a piece of salmon that he bit his tongue. The action served to harden a growing purpose. So do small events influence great. Suspend those fellows' wages, get down strike-breakers, save the hay. And if there were a row, well, let there be a row. The constabulary would have to act. It was characteristic of his really Norman spirit that the notion of agreeing to the demand, or even considering whether it were just, never once came into his mind. He was one of those, comprising nowadays nearly all his class, together with their press, who habitually referred to his country as a democratic power, a champion of democracy, but did not at present suspect the meaning of the word, nor, to say truth, was it likely they ever would. Nothing, however, made him more miserable than indecision. And so, now that he was on the point of deciding, and the decision promised vigorous consequences, he felt almost elated. Closing his jaws once more too firmly, this time on lamb, he bit his tongue again. It was impossible to confess what he had done, for two of his children were there, expected to eat with that well-bred detachment which precludes such happenings. And he rose from dinner with his mind made up. 
instead of going back to the House of Commons, he went straight to a strike-breaking agency. No grass should grow under the feet of his decision. Thence he sought the one post office still open, dispatched a long telegram to his agent, another to the chief constable of Worcestershire, and feeling he had done all he could for the moment, returned to the house where they were debating the rural housing question. He sat there, paying only moderate attention to a subject on which he was acknowledged an authority. Tomorrow, in all probability, the papers would have got hold of the affair. How he loathed people poking their noses into his concerns! And suddenly he was assailed, very deep down, by a feeling with which in his firmness he had not reckoned, a sort of remorse that he was going to let a lot of loafing blackguards down into his land to toss about his grass and swill their beastly beer above it. And all the real love he had for his fields and coverts, all the fastidiousness of an English gentleman, and, to do him justice, the qualms of a conscience telling him that he owed better things than this to those born on his estate, assaulted him in force. He sat back in his seat, driving his long legs hard against the pew in front. His thick, wavy, still brown hair was beautifully parted above the square brow that frowned over deep-set eyes and a perfectly straight nose. Now and again he bit into a side of his straw-coloured moustache, or raised a hand and twisted the other side. Without doubt, one of the handsomest and perhaps the most Norman-looking man in the whole house. There was a feeling among those round him that he was thinking deeply. And so he was. But he had decided, and he was not a man who went back on his decisions. Morning brought even worse sensations. Those ruffians that he had ordered down, the farmers would never consent to put them up. They would have to camp. Camp on his land? It was then that for two seconds the thought flashed through him. Ah! Oh, I ought to have considered whether I could agree to that demand. Gone in another flash. If there was one thing a man could not tolerate, it was dictation, out of the question. But perhaps he had been a little hasty about strike-breakers. Was there not still time to save the situation from that, if he caught the first train? The personal touch was everything. If he put it to the men on the spot, with these strike-breakers up his sleeve, surely they must listen. After all, they were his own people. And suddenly he was overcome with amazement that they should have taken such a step. What had got into them? Spiritless enough, as a rule, in all conscience, the sort of fellows who hadn't steam even to join the miniature rifle range that he had given them and visions of them, as he was accustomed to pass them in the lanes, slouching along with their straw bags, their hoes, and their shamefaced greetings, passed before him. Yes, it was all that fellow Freeland's family. The men had been put up to it, put up to it. The very wording of their demand showed that. Very bitterly he thought of the unneighbourly conduct of that woman and her cubs. It was impossible to keep it from his wife. And so he told her. Rather to his surprise, she had no scruples about the strike-breakers. Of course the hay must be saved, and the labourers be taught a lesson. All the unpleasantness he and she had gone through over Trist and that gaunt girl must go for nothing. It must never be said or thought that the Freeland woman and her children had scored over them. If the lesson were once driven home, they would have no further trouble. He admired her firmness, though with a certain impatience. Women never quite looked ahead, never quite realised all the consequences of anything. And he thought, "'By George, I had no idea she was so hard, but then she always felt more strongly about Trist and that gaunt girl than I did.' In the hall the glass was still going down. He caught the 9.15, wiring to his agent to meet him at the station, and to the impresario of the strike-breakers to hold up their departure until he telegraphed. The three-mile drive up from the station, fully half of which was through his own land, put him in possession of all the agent had to tell. Nasty spirit abroad, men dumb as fishes. The farmers, puzzled and angry, had begun cutting as best they could. Not a man had budged. He'd seen young Mr. and Miss Freeland going about. The thing had been worked very cleverly. He had suspected nothing, utterly unlike the labourers as he knew them. They had no real grievance either. Yes, they were going on with all their other work, milking, horses and that. It was only the hay they wouldn't touch. The demand was certainly a very funny one, very funny, never heard of anything like it. Might it almost to security of tenure. The Trist affair, no doubt, had done it. Mannering cut him short. Till they've withdrawn this demand, Simmons, I can't discuss that or anything. 
the agent coughed behind his hand. Naturally, only perhaps there might be a way of wording it that would satisfy them. Never do to really let them have such decisions in their hands, of course. They were just passing Todd's. The cottage wore its usual air of empowered peace, and for the life of him Mallory could not restrain a gesture of annoyance. On reaching home he sent gardeners and grooms in all directions with word that he would be glad to meet the men at four o'clock on the home farm. Much thought and interviews with several of the farmers, who all but one, a shaky fellow at best, were for giving the labourers a sharp lesson, occupied the interval. Though he had refused to admit the notion that the men could be chicaned, as his agent had implied, he certainly did wonder a little whether a certain measure of security might not be in some way be guaranteed, which would still leave him and the farmers a free hand. But the more he meditated on the whole episode, the more he perceived how intimately it interfered with the fundamental policy of all good landowners, of knowing what was good for their people, better than those people knew themselves. As four o'clock approached, he walked down to the home farm. The sky was lightly overcast, and a rather chill, draughty, rustling wind had risen. Resolved to handle the men with the personal touch, he had discouraged his agent and the farmers from coming to the conference, and passed the gate with the braced-up feeling of one who goes to an encounter. In that very spick-and-span farmyard, ducks were swimming leisurely on the greenish pond, white pigeons strutting and preening on the eaves of the barn, and his keen eye noticed that some tiles were out of order up there. Four o'clock. Ah, here was a fellow coming and instinctively he crisped his hands that were buried in his pockets, and ran over to himself his opening words. Then, with a sensation of disgust, he saw that the advancing labourer was that incorrigible land-lawyer, Gaunt. The short, square man with the ruffled head and the little bright grey eyes saluted, uttered an afternoon, Sir Gerald, in his teasing voice, and stood still. His face wore the jeering twinkle that had disconcerted so many political meetings. Two lean fellows, rather alike, with lined faces and bitten, drooped moustaches, were the next to come through the yard gate. They halted behind Gaunt, touching their forelocks, shuffling a little, and looking sidelong at each other. A mannering waited. Five past four. Ten past. Then he said, "'Do you mind telling the others that I'm here?' Gaunt answered, "'If so be as you were waiting for the meeting, I fancy how you've got it, Sir Gerald.' A wave of anger surged up in Mannering, dyeing his face brick-red. So he'd come all this way with the best intentions to be treated like this, to meet this land lawyer, who he could see was only here to sharpen his tongue, and those two scarecrow-looking chaps who had come to testify, no doubt, to his discomfiture. And he said sharply, "'So that's the best you could do to meet me, is it?' Gaunt answered imperturbably, "'I think it is, Sir Gerald. Then you've mistaken your man.' "'I don't think so, Sir Gerald.' Without another look, Mallering passed the three by, and walked back to the house. In the hall was the agent, whose face clearly showed that he had foreseen this defeat. Mallering did not wait for him to speak. "'Make arrangements. The strike-breakers will be down by noon to-morrow. I shall go through with it now, Simmons, if I have to clear the whole lot out. You'd better go in and see that they're ready to send police if there's any nonsense. I'll be down again in a day or two and without waiting for reply, he passed into his study. There, while the car was being got ready, he stood in the window, very sore, thinking of what he had meant to do, thinking of his good intentions, thinking of what was coming to the country, when a man could not even get his labourers to come and hear what he had to say. And a sense of injustice, of anger, of bewilderment, harrowed his very soul. End of chapter 27